The Big Story. You think, you think because I'm an old man I can't hold my own? Well, I'll, I'll show you. Don't, don't hit me there again. I, no, no, don't. Do Detroit, Michigan. From the pages of the free press, the story of a sneaking suspicion that became a dead certainty. Detroit, Michigan. The story as it actually happened, Kenneth McCormick's story, as he lived it. You've seen it before, Ken McCormick, of the Detroit Free Press. In 20 years of reporting, you've seen it lots of times. But somehow, you've never gotten used to the look of murder, especially violent murder. The shattered glass, the shambles of tables and chairs, the twisted body, always the same. And now, on this Sunday morning in the suburb of Highland Park... As you stand in the living room of a shabby bungalow, now you're seeing it all over again. What a mess. Mind showing me your press card? Oh, here you are. Detroit Free Press. Name is Ken McCormick. I'm Captain Walsh, Highland Park Detective Bureau. How do you do? McCormick, huh? You the guy that got the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago? Oh, you have a good memory, Captain. What's the dead man's name? Radway, George F. Radway, age 69, worked in a candy factory. Looks like he took quite a beating. What did I have? Broken ribs. Probably punctured his lungs. Death occurred around midnight last night, reported early this morning. Anything else you want to know? Well, I'd like to get an interview with his family. Well, you can't. He hasn't got any. One of the neighbors found his body. I see. What do you think the motive was? Robbery. What else? Look at the joint. Someone sure took it apart, but uh, this bungalow, Captain, the furnishings, the way it's kept, what I, what I mean, it, it doesn't look like the old guy had much to be robbed well, of. Somebody must have thought he had. What about all these muddy tracks on the floor? Who knows? Anyone could have made them. Even Radway himself. Ah, I hate this kind of case. You know why? Why? Because the motive's too broad, too impersonal. Robbery. Any one of 5,000 bums or hoodlums could have bust in, beaten up the occupant, ransacked the joint, and cleared out. I hate this kind of a case. Who was the neighbor, Captain? You know, the one who found the body? Oh, Mrs. Florence Kemper. She and her husband were good friends of Radway. The house is on the next street, back to back with this one. You can see a corner of it through the trees. Well, I think I'll go over and talk to her. Well, you're wasting your time. We already got her stuff. Well, at least I can get her picture. Yeah. You know, that's what I envy about you newspaper guys. You take a picture, you write a little copy, and as far as you're concerned, that's the end of it. I don't know, Captain. Sometimes it's just the beginning. You wait for Frank Harmon, your photographer, to take his shots of the murder scene. And then the two of you start out for Mrs. Kemper's. You take a shortcut that leads through the back lots from Radway's bungalow. And you've only gone about 50 yards when you see it. Frank, look over here alongside the path. Now, you see that? Yeah, I see it. So what? Now, look at the color. Grayish tan. What do you expect from a patch of mud? Magenta? Well, don't you remember those tracks in the bungalow? Unless I'm colorblind, this stuff matches perfectly. Say... You're right. And look there, right in the middle of it. Yeah. Looks like maybe part of a footprint. You go on to the neighbor's house. And a few minutes later, you and Frank Harmon are sitting in the neat little kitchen, talking with Mrs. Kemper as she peels potatoes for Sunday dinner. You try not to notice the little tremble in her hands. You see, my... My husband and I knew the Radways for years. Ever since his wife died, George, that's Mr. Radway, took most of his meals with us. Just like one of the family. That's why it was such a shock when... We understand, Mrs. Kemper. That's how I came to go over there this morning. Went to call him to breakfast. Didn't he used to come over of his own accord? Mostly, yes, Mr. Harmon, but this morning we were up earlier than usual. Mr. Kemper couldn't sleep. Is your husband around now? Maybe we could talk to him. No. No, Harold's at the 11 o'clock church service. 
Besides, he... He wasn't there with me at the bungalow when I... Oh, you were alone then? Yes. Knocked on the back door. Wasn't any answer. Then I looked through the window and... Right away I knew something terrible had happened. I could see the place all topsy-turvy and... And Mr. Radway lying there. Oh, twisted up. And then you came back here and you phoned the police? Yes. Mrs. Kemper, would you mind if I took a few pictures of you, you know, just sitting here in your kitchen, sort of? Why, I guess I wouldn't mind if you need them. Fine, just hold it like that, peeling the potatoes. Lawrence, have you got... Who are these men? What are they doing here? It's all right, Harold. Uh, we're from the Detroit Free Press, Mr. Kemper. We just want I to... I uh... know what you want. Who asked you in here, anyway? You got no regard for people's feelings? Taking pictures, asking questions. It's all right, Harold. They don't mean any harm. It's all your fault to begin with. I told you, Florence. I told you we shouldn't have reported it. But we had to. I found the body. Someone else would have found it. Someone else could have made the report. But no, you wouldn't listen. Now it's just like I said. Police and reporters swarming all over. I don't mind so much, Harold. Kind of, kind of relieves me to talk to him. Maybe you'd feel better, too. If I you... don't want to talk to nobody. My best friend just died. I got some feelings. Even if you went. I only thought... I, uh... I'm sorry, Mrs. Kemper. Yeah, we didn't intend Please to... excuse him. He... He didn't mean it. He... He doesn't know what he's saying. Too broken up. Yeah, sure, we... We understand The two of you leave. Frank goes back to the office with his pictures. And as Captain Walt said, that's the end of it. But somehow, Kenneth McCormick, you don't want to drop this story. Not yet. So just for the record, you decide to check with the rest of Radway's neighbors. Well, now I've come to think of it, there was someone looked mighty suspicious, a stranger. Hung around the neighborhood all Saturday afternoon. I should hope to say I did see him. Why, he even came here. Pretended he was a window washer. But I knew it was funny. He was wearing a good brown suit. That's right, a brown suit. Dark hair, medium height, and a pretty heavy build. Was trying to get in that bungalow in the worst way. Come back three or four times before it was dark. Thanks, McCormick, but we already know about this window washer. The dragnet's been out for two hours now. You really think he did it, Captain? I'll bet on it. He's our man, all right, if we can find him. With my luck, that's a question. The suspect's description is fairly complete. But you wonder if perhaps Mrs. Kempis saw him, too and could supply a few more details. So once again, you visit the little frame house. This time, Harold Kemper stays in the room. He doesn't say much until his wife starts to answer your question about the stranger. I know, Mr. McCormick. I don't remember. Yes. Yes, there was someone. I saw him. You did, Mr. Kemper? Yes. It was late Saturday night. I... I was standing near the back window here, and I happened to look over to George's place. He, uh, he had the kitchen light on, and I could see this guy on the back porch. Why, Harold, you never mentioned that to me. Well, I, I was too upset, that's all. I didn't think of it. What did this man look like, Mr. Kemper? Could you see? Well, he was, uh, he was kind of tall and thin, wearing a lumber jacket. But the window washer wore a brown suit. He wasn't tall, and he wasn't thin. Why, Harold, that's important. How could you forget a thing like that? You should have told the police first off. They didn't ask me. Besides, like I said, it slipped my mind. While the Kempers are talking, you move casually to the back window and look out. And it's just as you thought. Harold Kemper couldn't possibly have seen anyone on Radway's porch because from this window, the bungalow is completely obscured by trees. 
Then one of those little fateful accidents happens. The pencil you've been holding in your hand drops and rolls under the Davenport. You kneel to retrieve it, and there before your eyes is something which, in the breath of an instant, contracts your vague conjectures to a steel-hard core of suspicion. This is Cy Harris, returning into your narrator and the big story of Kenneth McCormick as he lived it and wrote it. You, Kenneth McCormick, of the Detroit Free Press, are kneeling by the Davenport in the Kemper's living room, and a wild surmise is beating inside you. For under that Davenport, obviously kicked there in an attempt to conceal them, are several broken clouds of grayish tan clay. You straighten up with the realization that somehow you've got to get a sample of that clay, a sample you can match with the tracks in a dead man's bungalow. But with the campers here in this room, it's out of the question. You'll have to get rid of them, if only for a moment. So you take a long chance. You turn to Harold Kemper and you begin asking questions about Radway, about the man in the lumber jacket. Question after question until finally... Listen, mister, I, I told you all I know. Are you sure, Mr. Kemper? You forgot about the man on the porch until tonight. Now, maybe there's something else He's that you... He's right, uh... Harold. Perhaps... No. I... No, there's nothing else. Besides, I, I can't stand here talking all night. I got work to do. I got to fix the car. The car? But there's nothing... It's lo- the gas line. What do you know about them things? <sighs> I'm so worried about my husband, Mr. McCormick. He's taken this thing awful bad. Now we have to go to the morgue tomorrow night at 9 o'clock and identify George's body. Harold hasn't seen him dead yet. I don't know what he'll do. It'd be kind of tough for him, I guess. Uh, Mrs. Kemper, could I, uh, could I trouble you for a glass of water? Why, certainly. That's no trouble. Just sit right there and I'll get it from the kitchen. You cross quickly to the Davenport, reach under, grab some of the clay, drop it in your pocket, and are just getting up when... Drop your pencil again, mister. Uh, yes, uh, fix your car already? I came back for a wrench. Oh. Well, uh, I'll be leaving now, Mr. Kemper. Uh, tell your wife to never mind about that drink of water. I, I don't feel thirsty anymore. Your way out in left field, McCormick. This Kemper was Radway's best friend. I know that, All Captain, right, but... so you found some clay in his house last night. What does that prove? Look at the samples. Now, here's some from Kemper's. Some from the murder scene and some from the mud patch along the path. And they're all identical. That grayish you tan can't color is... things that way, McCormick. Oh. No. You need a thorough detailed lab analysis. I'll send the stuff in, but it doesn't make any difference anyway, because even if it is the same... Kemper could have made those tracks at some other time. Then why did he kick the pieces under his sofa? Why did he try to hide them? Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe his wife just brushed them out of the way. Oh, nuts. His wife is as neat as a pin. She'd clean the dirt up. She wouldn't push it under the furniture. And another thing, if Kemper was such a good friend, why wouldn't he have gone to the bungalow and tried to help Radway after his wife came back and told what she'd seen? Unless he already knew the old man was dead. You can't tell about things like that. Maybe the guy gets sick at the sight of blood. A lot of people do. Yeah, sure. Kemper's a respectable citizen. I'm not going to pull him in on your hunch and leave myself open to a charge of false arrest. No, sir. Oh, well, I just thought you... We got a lead now. We know the motive was robbery and we know why. There was a rumor all over the neighborhood that Radway kept money in his house. You can bet that window washer heard it, too. As soon as we roust him, the case will be in the bag. <laughs> Even to yourself, you have to admit that Kemper would probably not have killed his friend just to rob him. Then your theory gets another body blow. In Radway's house, under an ironing board cover, Walch's men find $400. That seems to clinch the robbery motive. And then comes the rabbit punch. The same day, Monday, in the late afternoon, the window washer is found. You're there in Walch's office when they bring him in. His name is John Bruno, and his story is pitifully weak. 
You admit you were in the neighborhood. You admit that. I know, Captain. That's right. I was, but... And you admit going to Radway's house. I... I went to all the houses. But you went back to that house three times. I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. Oh, don't lie. The neighbors saw you. Now, why'd you go back there for, Bruno? Why? I don't know. I I, I guess because nobody was home the first time. So I don't know. Well, where'd you go after it got dark? Where were you that night? That night? Well, I uh, went back to my room. That's all. Back to the rooming house. Can you prove it? Can you prove you stayed there all night? I don't know. I didn't see no one. I live alone. You... You gotta take my word, mister. Honest, I, I didn't go back to the bungalow. I didn't kill no one. Honest, you gotta take my word. You look at that bewildered, frightened man in the brown suit, and you know one thing. John Bruno is innocent. His story is weak. He has no alibi, no witnesses. But how many innocent people do? Then it strikes you there's one angle you haven't yet tried. Kemper's movements on the night of a crime. Well, every Saturday, a lot of the men in the neighborhood sneak off to some tavern or other. It's terrible. I wouldn't let my husband do it. Yeah, yeah, it's a beer garden on Six Mile Road. Uh, Kemper and Radway usually went out there together. Oh, I ain't seen them there last Saturday, all right. Both of them pretty drunk, so I give them a wide berth. Is that it? Is that the answer? You wish you could be sure. Then you remember something. At nine o'clock tonight, the Kempers will be at the morgue to identify the body. You check your watch. You can make it. Maybe, maybe if you're there when Harold Kemper has to look at his dead friend, maybe you'll see something. You grab a cab, and at one minute of nine, you walk into the medical examiner's office at the city morgue. Mrs. Kemper is there, but she's alone. Where's your husband? Where is he, Mrs. Kemper? He decided not to come in. The last minute he thought it'd be too much for him. He's waiting for me out on the street corner. Just as well, I guess. All right, if it's cat and mouse, I can play that game, too. Enjoying the view, Mr. Kemper? Huh? Oh. Better than the one inside, isn't it? What do you want, mister? Well, I just thought I'd tell you how the case is coming. You were his best friend. I figured you'd like to know. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Well, have they, uh, they found anything yet? Oh, they know who the murderer is. They do? Yeah, they're just making sure of their evidence. They found a patch of mud in the back lot, you know, with a footprint in it. And now they're checking with the tracks in the bungalow. As soon as the lab tests come through, they'll probably make the arrest. Well, that, uh... That don't seem like much to go on. Oh, they have other evidence, too. Plenty of it. Well, Mr. McCormick, I see you found my husband, after all. Yes, we've been having a little talk. Uh, how about you, Mrs. Kemper? All finished inside? Yes. Yes, I made the identification all right. And Harold, you know, I'm sure it won't be long before they catch the man who did it. Oh, how could you know? Because I saw something. And I'm sure the police saw it, too. What do you mean? Well... On George's throat, there were three or four fingerprints, just as plain as could be. And the joke of it, the grim, grim joke of it, is that Mrs. Kemper has made a mistake. What she saw were not fingerprints which can be traced, but finger marks which cannot. Only Harold Kemper, in the white heat of his fear, is far beyond figuring that out. His face gives you the answer. Now you know. This man is a murderer. More than that, he's a murderer chased by the phantom of his own fear. He's ripe for the plucking. If you can just get Captain Waltz to stretch out a hand. But I told you my story, Captain. I told you a million times. Never mind, Bruno. Tell me again. What's the use? I'm only going to say the same thing. I didn't do it, so what's the use? All right, Sergeant. Take him out. Yes, sir. What's the matter, Captain? You can't crack him? No, he'll crack. When? Six months from now, out of sheer exhaustion? Look, Bruno was innocent. You know that. And Kemper is guilty. You, you just won't admit it. I've got enough complications with that. I told around. you what I found out about Kemper. I showed you the motive. 
Captain, the lab report is here on those three samples of clay. Well, what's the gist of it, Sergeant? They're all identical, sir. Hmm. Captain, how much proof do you want? I don't know. If you don't want to pull him in, at least go out to his house now and question him. The guy will break. I know he will. He's on the thin edge of nothing. But it's late. It's after midnight. What is it you really don't like, Captain? The lateness of the hour or junking your pet theory? Ah, come on, let's go. Don't pull in the driveway, Sergeant. Just park out front. Mm, yes, sir. All right, Sergeant. You wait here. Come on, McCormick. Oh, evening, Mrs. Kepper. Hello, Captain. I wonder if I could see your husband for a minute. I'm sorry. He isn't here. He's gone out. Do you know when he'll be back? No, I don't. Could we come in for a minute? Yes, of course, Mr. McCormick. Coming. Kind of late to go out, isn't it? Uh, do you know where your husband's gone? He, he didn't tell me. Is there any message you want to leave? Mrs. Kemper, you've been crying, haven't you? Is it anything to do with... No. Uh... No, it's just... No, I... You'd better tell us everything, Mrs. Kemper. We'll find out anyway. You see, we... We know what your husband's done. Yes. Yes. He did it. He killed George. How long have you known this? He, he just told me about an hour ago. When we came back from the morgue, he was all sick like. That finally told me. Said he and George got into a fight that night over over who was to buy more beer. <laughs> Harold gets into terrible rages and he beat the old man up. Then when he saw he was dead, he upset everything to make it look like a robbery. Well, where is he now? I don't know. <laughs> he was terribly afraid. He knew you'd be coming after him. <laughs> Go on, Mrs. Kemper. He said, he said they're not going to put me in no prison. Then he rushed out to the garage to get the car. Well, he won't get far. Where's your car? Hey, wait a minute, Captain. The car is here. What? I saw it in the garage as we came up the walk. Hmm. Sergeant Jansky. Yes, sir? Turn your spotlight on that garage, then come with me. We're going in after Kemper. Wait up, Captain. I want to be on this. You better stand clear. Come out of that garage, Kemper. You don't stand a chance. All right, we're coming in. Jansky, you go in on the other side of the car. I'll take this side. Yes. Kemper? He's not on this side, Captain. He's not here either. Wait a minute. Huh? Look over there, sir. In that corner, just off the floor. Harold! Harold, are you there, Harold? Oh, Carmi, don't let her in here. Mrs. Kemper, don't. Don't go in there. You'll only... Don't let me alone. Let me alone. Harold, where are you? Harold, are you... Now we read you that telegram from Kenneth McCormick of the Detroit Free Press. Not out of remorse, but out of pure fear, the killer in tonight's big story hanged himself with a piece of clothesline. His wife's story brought the instant release of the window washer and closed the case. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service... The voice of information and education. And now, 
Here is Larry Haynes as Mickey Spillane's Bat Hammer Guy. <laughs> You don't mind walking down a dark, lonely street with a guy, but when he stays behind you in the shadows all the way, that's where you draw the line. Why he's picked you to tell, you can't guess. So when the footsteps behind are close enough, you slam on your brakes and wheel around. For a second, you think you see him, but it's only the wind playing kickball with yesterday's headlines. You start ambling again. As you head for the corner, you keep close to the warehouse wall. Steps stay behind you like an evil echo. And then when you turn the corner, you're sliding close to the building and wait to make your play. Oh, all right, little Sir Echo. My arm. I'll break it off if you try to keep wrestling. All right, all right. All right, up against the wall. What do you want from me? You put the question right out of my mouth. Uh, I don't like being tailed, and I like it even less when I don't know why. I... I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, I may be bouncing your head off the wall a couple of times. I'll help you understand. Oh, wait, please. Oh, I detect a note of understanding in your voice now. All right. All right, I was following you. Why? I needed protection. Why? It's the truth. You were the only person around, so I thought if I stayed close to you, nothing would happen. Nothing like what? Look, I can't stay here. He'll get me if we do. Who? The one who got the assignment. Okay, Mr. Bones, I give up. What assignment? This isn't a minstrel show, and I'm not crazy. I'm talking about the man who was assigned to kill me. You look into the little guy's pasty face and you can see he's not kidding. He's as scared as a seven-year-old lost in a graveyard at night. In your kind of business, you develop a sixth sense. And it's telling you right now that you and the little guy are a target that are a blindfold pacifist couldn't miss. You take him to a diner down the street. After you order a couple of cups of java, he tells you his name is Pete Morrison. And the counterman slides the coffee in front of him. He huddles over it like it's the last cup of soup in a snowbound igloo. Well, I'm chilled to the bone, Mr. Hammond. All right, drink your coffee, Morrison. I wish I was home in bed. If you stayed there in the first place, maybe there wouldn't be anybody gunning for you. Go ahead, have some more coffee. No, I can't. I, I had enough. Thanks. Why is this guy hunting for you, Martin? I'd rather not talk about it now. Okay, I'll talk to you about it when we get home. Where do you live? Look, I don't want to bother you anymore. Thanks for... What's the matter? That man. Hmm? Over there, looking in the window. He's the one? Yeah, I'm sure. He's coming in. All right. Reach over for that pepper shaker. Yeah, but I... Do what I tell you. Hurry up. Now take this paper napkin. Unscrew the cap of the shaker. Pour the pepper into the napkin. Go ahead. Now keep the napkin in your hand. Look. He came in, I told you he would. If he tries anything, toss the pepper in his face and then get out of here fast. I'll take care of the rest. Where'll I go? Oh. My place. 867 East 75th Street, apartment 3B. Here are the keys. You got the address? Yes. 867 East 75th Street. I don't know how to thank I'll think of a way. I'll... Hey, wait a minute. What? The guy who just came in, I've seen him around. You have? You bet I have. He's a plain clothesman on this street. Now, come on, Morrison. What's the idea? I'm afraid the idea is this. What? Morrison flings the pepper in your face. Your eyeballs feel like they've been skinned, salted, and put on a frying pan to burn. The counterman and the cops help you get your sight back, but when you have it, what you don't see makes you want to turn in your head for new parts. Morrison is gone. And you're the prize sucker in a game that nobody but him seems to know how to play. After you shake off the cops' questions, you head for home to bathe your smarting eyes. You get the pass key from the super. When you walk in, you find the place lit up like a Hollywood drugstore grand opening. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Hammond. And all the lights in your brain flash on when you see Morrison sitting in your easy chair. Honest, I'm sorry about what happened. Oh, you've no idea how sorry you're going to be. Look, I had to do what I did. Oh, sure, sure. And I'm going to have to do what I'm going to do to you. Oh, please. Let, let me explain. All right, you got all of three seconds. You really did help save my life. You can forget that stuff. Since when a cop hiring themselves out as gunsels. Believe me, I had to get away from there. Oh, sure, I believe you. I didn't have to come here and tell you this. Why do you think I did? Well, you tell me, Morrison. Because I feel you're the one person I can trust. Uh-uh. That's not good enough. You're too full of tricks. I'm sorry if that pepper hurt your eyes. Yeah. 
They hurt me more from seeing you here. I just had to get away in a hurry. And the only way was to make a stir in that diner. You had to get away from whom? The one who was assigned to kill me. Oh, we're back to that routine. I'm telling you the truth. You still haven't told me who had the assignment. I don't know who he is. I just know what he looks like. And he was in that diner. Now, now, don't tell me about that cop. I didn't mean the cop. He was already in the diner when we got there. He was sitting in the booth just behind us. Okay, so why did he get the assignment? I don't know. Who gave it to him? I don't know. Maybe you mean you're not telling. Well, I... I can't tell you. That's more like it. Maybe later I'll tell, tell you the whole story. Maybe later it'll be too late. I'll just have to take that chance. All right, so you won't tell me. I can't help myself. Maybe you'll tell somebody else. Who are you calling? Somebody who can help you help yourself. Hello, uh, let me have Captain Chambers in the massage. Tell him it's my police into this. All right, why not? Please, hang up. I can't hear a word you're saying. You've got to put that phone down. That is a bet. You've been very nice to me, but I'm warning. Relax. You'll last much longer this way. I'm sorry, Mr. Hammer, but you asked for this? Oh. Hello, Mike. Hello. Hello, Mike. Yes? Hey, that's not Mike. No, sir. Who are you? Mr. Hammer can't come to the phone. What's this about? Where's Hammer? He can't speak to you. Why not? He can't speak to you because he's either unconscious or dead. You're neither unconscious nor dead. You've been expecting the crush of Mars, and so when it comes, you roll with it like a kid tumbling over in a playpen. You've decided to go along with Morrison's game to find out what the score adds up to. After he takes off, you spring to life and start tailing. He leads you downtown to the village and finally ducks into an old, broken-down apartment building. You get inside fast enough to see him take the stairs to the clip and knock on the door at the top of the flight. That door closes behind him and start up for that apartment. You're putting your foot on the last step when... Where do you think you're going? The big load of lard with the gravel voice steps out from the shadows and roadblocks you with a pair of hairy leaf hooks that look like they've just been taken out of the smoke room. You know what? What? I don't like you. You're in my way. People I don't like get me mad. Well, be my guest. Be my analyst. He'll cure that. And when I get mad, I get physical. So? So? What? When I get physical, I throw things downstairs. Things like you. <laughs> if I go down, I'm having a guest. Why not? You know what? I don't like you either. I'm not getting physical. You rush down to the landing where the gorilla lies twisted like a soggy pretzel that's been floating in beer too long. You pull a mean-looking rod out of a shoulder holster. The trigger is scratched where it's been shaved for fast action. You break open the gun and empty it of the snub-nosed slugs. Then you shove it back in the holster and go back to that apartment. The nameplate on the door says Pete and Lenore Russo. Well, now at least you know Morrison's real name. You keep your finger jammed into the doorbell, but you get no results from that. You try the door, no results from that either. It's different with a back door that leads into the kitchen. The apartment is as empty as the feeling in the pit of your stomach. You plop into a living room chair and light a smoke. And just as you're settling back for a few black thoughts, the front door opens. Who are you? What are you doing here? She's a slight whisper of a woman, plain as a farmer's Sunday suit, and there's a sad prayer in her eyes. What do you want? Why are you here in my apartment? Where's Pete? Who? You know who, your husband. I haven't seen him. I followed him here. I don't know where he is. But you do know who he's running from. Why don't you leave him alone? He wouldn't let me alone. He was in a spot and I was around at the time. He asked me for help. You're Mike Hammer? That's right. He told me about you. We owe you thanks. Now, never mind the thanks. I'll take an explanation instead. I can't explain. I don't know myself. Well, try anyway. I can't understand any of it, Mr. Hammer. Pete never harmed anyone before. All our life was any decent, quiet people. And now this... It's like a nightmare. Pete couldn't have done what they said he did. Maybe you want to believe that. He met him. He's kind and gentle. He never touched guns. He was held up twice driving his cab and never lifted a finger. 
He had to make the money good to the company, too. Mm. Well, he could have gotten mixed up with the wrong people. It happens. Guy can go through his whole life playing it straight, and one day a fast idea hits him. Not my husband. I only know what I see. And the people who so I saw was running from the kind of thing you don't get if you keep your nose clean. I told you I didn't know anything about that. Look, there was a guy outside when I came up the stairs. You could tell the kind of business he was in by the gun he carried. What do you mean? The polite word for him is assassin. Petey? Yeah, Petey. And if I don't find Hello. him before that consul does, you'd better think of buying a few black dresses. <laughs> Lenore Russo doesn't have anything else for you besides tears, so you leave her pouring them into a wet handkerchief and go back down to your car. Just as you're about to open the door, you see that someone's sitting behind the wheel. The last report on you was you were either dead or unconscious. Pat Chambers watches you get in beside him like you're the prize exhibit in the snake farm. What's a gag? Gag? Look, what are you doing here? I was just about to ask you the same question. For me? Well, I'm sitting here talking to a guy named Pat Chambers. How about you? You're as funny as a last meal on execution night. I want straight answers from you, and right now. Oh, now, Pat, that isn't very friendly talk. I don't feel friendly. If I know you at all, you're mixed up in a deal that can get you in a lot of trouble. Official trouble. Are you talking about Pete Russo? I'm talking about Pete Russo. I want to find him. So do I. The line forms right behind me. And I intend to find him before he does any more harm. Oh, now, Pat, what kind of harm can a mild guy like that do? You sound like you don't read the paper. Now, look, Pat, all I know is that somebody's after him. He used me for protection and then got away before I had a chance to find out what it's all about. So that's all you know, that somebody's after him. Right. And you don't know who it is. Got any ideas? <laughs> you're breaking me up. Big joke. Listen, Mike, if you're serious about I this... I wouldn't kid you, Pat. What's the story about this guy? You sure you're not trying to pull a bluff? Now, come on. What's it all about? Remember Johnny Farrell? Uh, how could anybody forget that two-bit gangster? He's a three-time loser. One more strike and he's out for life. Yeah, you picked him up on a manslaughter rap a couple of weeks ago. I thought that was it. It was until a murder gun was brought in, and guess who showed up with it? Not Pete Russo. None else. And with an airtight story about how he shot the guy with it during a fight. Mm-hmm. And that got Jenny Farrow off the hook. Should have made him a bosom buddy. What'd they give him? Three to five years, and you thought Russo was running from some killer. I don't get it. Well, if you're serious about this, I have news for you. Yesterday, Pete Russo escaped from custody. And the people he's running away from are the police. You tell Pat everything you know, and he finally lets you go after he wants you to lay off. You've got nothing on your mind but a merry-go-round full of spinning questions. So you go up to your place to sit around and try to think them through. You're batting a big fat zero when the phone call comes. I'm calling for Pete. Hammer. He decided that he wants to see you. You want to hang the phone back up in Lenore Russo's face, but the sight of her ringing the tears from the handkerchief keeps you from doing it. We decided we can trust you, Mr. Hammer. You're the only friend we have. What does he want to see me about? I don't know. It's something he won't even tell me. Where do I meet him? He'll meet you at your apartment in exactly two hours. You want to call Pat Chambers and tell him about it, but the big holes in the story need filling out. So you decide to see Russo alone first. The two hours can be an awful long wait so you go down to a nearby bar to break up the monotony. Just when you get comfortably settled, you smell her perfume cutting into the liquor you're raising to your lips. Mm. You think it's safe. I bet you don't go for thrills. She's an invitation to a dream in blue from her clinging sheath of a dress to her sleepy, smiling eyes. You can put it back on. What? Your hat. Then the stool next to you will be empty so I can sit down. Well, nothing would make that boy stool happy. Thanks. I um, hope you don't mind my talking to you. You like this? Why not? You're my idea of company. Well, that's very good. Art. Can I buy you a drink? I have one, thanks. Have another. On me. Oh, would you hand me my bag? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'll take a rain check on your offer if you don't mind. I like men with strong attitudes. But this is an occasion, so why not celebrate? Oh, your birthday. <laughs> we women like to forget our birthdays. Let's say the occasion is just for it. The first time we've met. My name's Rita. What's yours? My camera. What about that drink? Ah, uh, sorry. I gotta meet somebody in a few minutes. Oh, I'm jealous. It's a man. You know when? You're very hard to resist. Well, then you buy me a drink. Sorry. I thought you said I was hard to resist. Not that hard. You know what's in my purse? An invitation for you. 
Okay, let's have it. Not here. That is unless I have to. Meaning? It's a gun. And when I squeeze the trigger with my finger, there's hardly any resistance at all. shows you this day, Mr. Kitty. So you take her invitation and she leads you out of the bar and into the car. She directs you to the other side of town and into a room that's furnished in the best of taste. The best, uh, that is, except for the occupant. Thanks, Rita. You don't have to be told your host's name. You've seen Johnny Farrow's face before smeared across plenty of newspapers. He found me very hard to resist. Sit down, Hammer. You're going to be here for quite a while. What do you want with me, Farrow? You know what? I don't like you. Oh, neither did one of your boys. He's got good taste. I'd like to give you a taste of my fist in your face like I gave him. A tough boy, Johnny. I could tell the way he took his drink. Shut up. Don't be a boor. I said shut up. I like you, Mike. We ought to have that drink someday. If he lives that long. Oh, now, look, if you brought me here to witness a family squabble, I've got other important things to do. You want that drink? What I have for him, he won't be able to drink. What do you want from me? I want to know what your angle is, Hammer. Now, who's got angles? I'm not interested in any angles. How about curves? Mike? In just one second, Rita. In just one little second. Take it easy, Farrow. Save your fight with your girlfriend for later when I'm not around, huh? All right, Hammer. I'm more interested in working on you right now anyway. Save your energy. Tell me what I'm supposed to know, and I'll be glad to talk it over with you. You talk. I'll listen. Well? Look, I told you, I don't know why you got me up here. Think a little harder. It'll come to you. You can't squeeze blood out of a stone. Oh, you're not a stone. And I know a few squeeze plays that could make a jackass sing. You thought of a donkey serenade? How about it, Hammer? One way or the other. Your phone is ringing. This kind of information I can live without. Keep him covered, Rita. Of course I will. Yeah. You did? What? When? Go. I'll be in touch. Well, how do you like that? The suspense is killing me. Who was it? Rita, why did you bring this guy up here? Mm. The hammer, there must have been some mistake. I can think of a couple that kept you out of a cage. Rita's a foolish girl. I send her out for a pack of smokes and she comes back with a guy like you. I should be jealous. I don't get it. Full of wings, this doll. Rita, I got no reason to discuss anything with Mr. But hammer. But you told me to... Full of wings, up to her eyeballs. Uh, she drinks, you know. Now listen, Johnny. You mean I'm free to go? As free as the birds, Mr. Hammer. Just as free as the little bird. You're curious about the phone call that made Farrow's attitude change so completely. But you're not taking time to find out what it is. The two hours are up and you want to get to your place to meet Pete Russo. When you get there, you see that Pete got to his appointment early enough. Just in time, in fact, to wind up dead on your floor. You call Pat Chambers and tell him where he can end his search. He wants you to stick around, but you've got important business. The kind of business you can only settle with Johnny Farrow. First, you've got a few places to go to. And what you find out makes all the crazy pieces of the jigsaw puzzle come together like... like the broken rock at the bottom of a mountain slide. And when they do, it's even crazier than when they were apart. You try Farrow's apartment, but nobody's there. Your luck is just as bad every place else. And the bad luck holds until you see her again. Sitting at the end of the bar where she first met you. Lucky I came back here, Mike. I'm beginning to like you. I was looking for you. Now that you found me. How about that celebration? Do you want to buy me that drink? A big celebration. Just you and me. Uh, what's there to celebrate this time? Hmm. You got any ideas? The kind I had you can't print. Well, then whisper them to me. You can't whisper about murder, Rita. It screams all over. For me, honey, you're strictly murder. I'm talking about the real thing. It can be the real thing with us. Even if it's for a little while, my uh, You don't seem to know what I'm talking about. You can't fool little Rita. You can't resist me. Oh, what gives you that idea? Oh, it takes courage to go up against Johnny Farrell for a woman. Real courage. Lots of guys try to... How'd they make up? Lots of guys. Now, I could have my pick. Why'd you settle for a bum like Farrell? He gives me everything I want. And you don't care how he gets it. Could you give me everything I want, Mike? Everything that's coming to you. And give me a drink. So we can celebrate. Not here. You're going to take me to Johnny Farrow. Why him? He bores me. Come on, let's go, Rita. You know where he lives. I took you up there, remember? He's not there. 
But I've got a pretty good idea where he is, and that's where we're going. Where, Mike? Your place, Rita. Uh Uh-huh. No sale. Remember what you said about me not being able to resist you? Well... Well, this time the tables are turned. That uh, bulge in my coat pocket is a gun. And uh, the trigger squeezes just as easily as yours. All the way up to her apartment, she keeps looking at you with her sleepy eyes like you're the first date she ever had. But your business with Sparrow comes first. So when she lets you in the door, you're disappointed to see that the place is dark. She uh, switches on a light and smiles at you again. You see? Johnny isn't here. She sits on the edge of the couch with plenty of room for you. We're all alone. And you know what, Mike? I like it. Oh, Farrell will be back. I can wait. You don't have to wait long, Emma. Oh. And put your gun down before you turn it on. Okay, Emma. Where is it on? Are you looking for me? Oh, I'm just the advance guard. There's an army of lookers behind me. I can't imagine why. Get to the point. What do you want to see me about? So he gave you everything you want, Rita. You no know, fight, boys. The neighbors are unfriendly. Oh, if they knew you kept snakes like this rattler up here, they'd be unfriendlier. A bullet in your windpipe could cut that kind of talk off real fast. Sure, then you couldn't find out what I found out about you, Farrell. I can postpone the shot. Go ahead. Oh, Mike, be a good boy and hand me my purse. My nose is tired. Hey, you pick a lousy time to make up. Come on, Hammer. I'm running out of patience. And you're running out of luck, too, Farrell. Meaning? Meaning Pete Russo. He never killed that guy. He confessed. Should I tell you why? That's what I'm waiting for. The cops had you for that shooting. The cops had me wrong. Yeah, but you couldn't afford another trip upstate. It would have been your fourth offense. It would have been life for you. So Pete Russo took the rap for you, right? Okay, you're right. It was an easy way for him to pick up 15 grand. It was a good deal for Russo. Yeah, but you had another deal, didn't you, Farrow? You got him out of custody. You couldn't trust him. He might have changed his mind in a year or two and talk. So you helped him escape so you could kill him. Kill him? Yeah, that's right, Rita. But you don't care how Farrow makes his money. You don't care about anything as long as you keep sitting pretty. I didn't know Russo was dead. That's what you meant by murder. Murder. But it wasn't hard for your boyfriend. Nothing is too hard when you've got to protect yourself. Yeah, but the protection gets more and more expensive as you go along. How much do you have? Oh, I wasn't thinking of a price. I was. The price is cheap. Just one lead slug. Johnny. You can wait outside, Rita. No. Okay, then stay and watch. I'm staying. But I'm not watching. <laughs> All right, I'll take that gun, Farrell. No. It's a pleasure taking advantage of a wounded guy like you, Farrell. No. Now get back there. No. I couldn't let him do it, Mike. Rita, so help me. You're my kind of guy. Oh, thanks, baby, but I'm still a little particular. No dice for nothing, Rita. You're vicious for nothing. Think that funny, Farrell? Listen to this. I checked with a doctor who took care of Russo. Nobody but he knew why a guy with a sweet wife would be willing to go to jail. You were worried about him changing his mind and talking in a year or so, huh? Well, he didn't have a year to last. What? The doctor didn't even give him six months. Six months? That's right, Farrell. Go ahead and laugh about that. Mystery is my hobby. Today's story took place last fall. Paul Arno, the lifelong friend of mine, called me on the phone to report a murder. At the moment, Paul was unaware that only a few hours previously, his wife, Brenda, had had an unexpected caller. Yes? Hello, Pop. Now, don't tell me you're the great Paul Arno. I beg your pardon? Look here, you can't come bursting in this way. Who are you, anyway? I asked you first, Pop. Who are you? I'm Robert. Mr. Arnold Butler. But... <laughs> well, what do you know? Toots did all right for herself. Toots? Sure, Toots. You mean you never heard of Toots? No, naturally not. There's no one here but that. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Whoa. Toots would like... Toots. Well, I'll be a cross-eyed lizard. Say, if you ain't... Tony, pretty... please. Huh? What's the matter? Tony, we're not alone. Oh. Oh. Oh, I, I get it. <laughs> It's Nib there, I tell your old man. If this person is annoying you, Mrs. Arnold, No, no, I... no, it, it's quite all right, Robert. You may go. But, madam... You may go, Robert. Very well, madam. Well, what do you know? Could you have done that like a lady? Yes, sir, you've done it just like a lady. I am a lady, Tony. Huh? 
<laughs> a lady, eh? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Let's take it easy. <laughs> this is Tony Irwin you're talking to. Remember? When did you get off, Tony? Oh. So that's it, huh? I got you worried, eh, baby? Oh, oh no, You're no, thinking no, that I'm sore because I come home and find you married to this panty waist. Uh... And why should you be sore, Tony? That's what I was saying to the boys just this morning. The boys? Yeah. Some of the boys said, uh, Tony, you ought to be sore at foot, they said. But why, Tony, why? That's what I told them. Why? I says... How did Toots know that I was going to get sprung after only doing it a couple of years? Tony, please. Double cross? Uh huh. No, sir. I laughed at him. Why I said Toots wouldn't double cross nobody. I didn't double cross you, Tony. Sure, 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 you didn't. That's what I'm saying, baby. You wouldn't double cross nobody. Glad you feel that way, Tony. You bet. <laughs> baby, I'm proud of you. <laughs> you got class. I, uh, always figured you'd make the grade if you. Got the break. Yes, Tony? I ain't like some guys. Some of them boys... <laughs> you know what they wanted me to do? What? <laughs> Take that Chuck Pizarro, for instance. <laughs> now, there's a character. Well, what did Chuck say? Why, he says, look, Tony, don't be a dope. Toots is in a chip, he says. Look, he says, she used to be your girl, didn't she? Okay, do one up and clip her for a few hundred bucks. <laughs> She'll never miss it, he says. And what did you say, Tony? Nothing doing, I told him. Stop me. I ain't that kind of a guy, see? Thank you, Tony. I ain't that kind of a guy, I says, who'd stool on a friend. Not even if she, uh, did double-cross me. Tony, I didn't. So what if Toots would pay off to keep me from telling about the weekend we spent together? Tony, that's not so. <laughs> sure, 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 it ain't. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, this Paul Arnold don't know it ain't so. What do you mean? Well, it's like this, baby. Suppose this Paul Arnold was told you used to be a birdie, you dancer. Oh, Tony, you wouldn't. Suppose he got to know about you and Jerry the Duke in that nightclub raid. Oh, Tony, please. Suppose he told and was told about you and me and I showed him some pictures. Paul wouldn't believe you. He'd throw you out of the house. The way I figure it, baby, Arnold could check them things. He'd find they were true. Then, when I mentioned about that weekend... Stop it, Tony, stop it. <laughs> What's the matter, baby? What do you want, Tony? What? Me? <laughs> not a thing, baby, not a thing. Yes, you do. What is it? Baby, you got me all wrong. You know, I wouldn't put the bite on you for nothing. Of course, since it's uh, getting along towards Christmas. Oh, I see. Very well, Tony, I'll give you a Christmas present. Ah, swell, baby. Swell. Wait. The safe is over here behind these curtains. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. No, you don't. I'll just go along, too, huh? Maybe you got some ideas about uh, telephoning. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> this is a kind of a cute idea, ain't it? Go back where you were, Tony. I'll not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of a cute idea. Big heavy curtains hanging on the wall, just like there wasn't this little alcove behind them. If you think I'm going to open this safe with you watching me, you're crazy. Yeah, kind of cozy too. Just big enough for us two. Tony. Tony, don't look at me like Come that. here. Tony, you just keep your hands off Come me. here, come here. <laughs> just us two. Oh, like no. I used to be, huh? Come here. Take it easy, baby. Take it easy. Maybe we can make another deal. What's that? There's someone... Hey, who turned off the lights? <laughs> Drake speaking. Hello, Bart. This is Paul Arnold. Paul Arnold. Well, well, Paul. It's good to hear your voice. How are you? Right now, I'm not so good, Bart. Hmm? There's a dead man lying in my living room with a bullet through his heart. What? Yeah, he was murdered. Murdered? How do you know? Well, my wife was standing beside him, and my butler was standing in the doorway and saw it. My sister was in the hall and heard of him. And by the way, there's a guy here named Danton who's accused practically everyone of making it happen. Danton? Not Inspector Noah Danton. That's the guy. Know him? <laughs> yes, yeah, slightly. Tell the inspector, Paul, that you talked to me and I'm uh, on my way out. And don't worry about him. Uh, the old boy's bark is worse than his bite. Hello, Bart. Hello, Inspector. Come on in. Thank you. I'm waiting for you. You got my message, huh? No, Inspector. What message? What message? 
Didn't the babe call you? What babe? Arnold's sister. I was busy and I asked her to get in touch with you. I thought she did. I'm sorry, Inspector. I haven't heard a female voice in a matter of hours, Whistler. Oh, no? Then how'd you know about this murder? How do you happen to be here? Paul Arnold called me. Arnold? Why, that... Hey, what's he think he's getting away with? Hello, Mark. Glad to see you. I'm glad to see you, Paul. It's been a long time. More than a year. I've been in the service, you know. Yes, I certainly do know. <laughs> Wasn't I at your going-away party? <laughs> what a time. Uh, pardon me for interrupting. You two gents don't happen to know each other, do you? Paul and I are old friends, Inspector. We've known each other for years. We were roommates in college, Inspector. Well, isn't that sweet? Unless somebody thinks up some excuses mighty fast, somebody's going to be cellmates in Sing Sing. Now, look... Always the man of duty, eh, Inspector? By the way, have you identified the corpse? Sure, it was a punk named Tony Irwin. He was doing a stretch for Grand Larson and got let off for good behavior. I see. And what was Tony Irwin doing here? Well, obviously, his motive was robbery. His body was found lying near the wall safe. Yeah, and there was a gun lying beside him with one bullet discharged. Look, Bart. Come over here. Yes, Inspector. Better come along, Paul. Yes, I think I'd better. Your friend, the Inspector, has ideas. (laughs) And I can guarantee you'll have a lot more before we get much farther in this case. Yes, Inspector? You see these port tiers hanging against the wall? Yes, yes, I see. Looks like decorations, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yes, they do. Okay, now I swing them out like this on that plane they're hung on, and what do you see? Well, well, a dead man on the floor, a gun beside him, and a small safe fitted into a sort of an alcove. That's right. Now, when I got here a couple hours ago, things looked exactly as they do now. Well, and what have you been doing for the past two hours, Inspector? What have I been doing? I've been lining up the suspects. I've been waiting for you. I've been looking for... All right, Inspector. All right. Now, who are your suspects? Well, Mrs. Arnold admits being right here when it happened. Now, just a minute, Inspector. Brenda didn't do this. You can't say... Keep your shirt on, Bob. I didn't say she did it. I only said she was a suspect. How did Brenda happen to be here, Paul? Well, she came into the room and saw a movement behind the curtain and decided to investigate. Mm-hmm. What happened? This Tony, whatever his name is, was tinkering with a safe. Just as Brenda looked behind the curtain, the lights went out. There was a shot. Brenda screamed and ran out of the room. That's her story. Now, look here, Dan. Never mind, Paul. The inspector sounds much worse than he means to. Oh, is that so? Inspector, now, have you checked the fingerprints on the guns? That's being done now. Mm, how about the safe? What about the safe? Well, uh, if Mrs. Arnold were telling the truth, as you seem to doubt, Inspector, Tony's prints would be on the safe. Huh. That's right, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, I'll have the boys check. Good. And uh, tell me, who are your other suspects? Roberts, the butler, for one. Why? He claims he heard Mrs. Arnold talking with someone in here. Just as he opened the door, the lights went off. Roberts says he saw someone standing near the door to the hall across the room. Then the shot came. Mm-hmm. Did Robert see where the shots came from? Yep. He says the guy that was standing near the other door fired it. But he didn't recognize the other party. No. He only got a glimpse. Inspector, why do you suspect Robert? Because he must have been lying. That gun right there is the one that killed Erwin. Oh, you're sure of that, Inspector? Sure, I'm sure. You know, I don't make idle statements, Bart. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Whom else do you suspect? Arnold's sister, Agatha. Oh, that's ridiculous. Aggie's so scared of firearms, she won't even look at one. Yeah? And why didn't she call Drake when I asked her to? I'll tell you why, bub. She's a guilty party, and she knew that if Drake got on the job, he'd prove she was guilty. Inspector, let's not make idle statements, remember? Paul, it looks to me as though you're the only one that's in the clear in this case. Yes, and I'm sure I wouldn't be if I hadn't happened to be on a plane coming back from Boston at the time the murder was committed. Oh. That checks. I called the airport. A Paul Arnold left on the plane that took off from Boston at 6.30 p.m. He couldn't have gotten here before 9 o'clock, and the murder took place at 7.30 p.m. Well, thanks for that much, anyhow. Don't mention it, Bub. We always aim to please. And stop calling me Bub. Bart, it seems to me your friend the inspector is determined to make a complicated plot out of a purely simple case. Yeah, well, Bart, it seems to me that your friend Bub Arnold is talking out of turn. What's simple about it, Bub? Well, anyone with any sense wouldn't ask. This man Irwin is the next convict. Send up for larceny. Obviously, he came here with the idea of robbing my safe. Okay, so then what happened? We already know what happened. Someone shot him. See what I mean, Bart? Everybody wants to get into the act. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. The inspector is right. Sorry. Why Tony Irwin this here is unimportant. Somebody murdered him. It's the inspector's job to find out who. Okay, I guess you're right. The only thing that we're sure of is that you are not the guilty party because you were on that plane. Well, Brenda isn't guilty either. I appreciate how you feel, Paul, but still the inspector... I beg your pardon, sir. Yes, Robert, what is it? Uh, there's a Mr. Harrison on the phone, sir. He'd like to talk to you. Harrison? I don't know any Harrison. What's he want? Well, he said something about a ticket. A... T- oh, oh, yes. <sighs> of course. I, I'll talk to him, Robert. Very good, sir. He'll pick up the extension. And no, I'll... I'll take it in the library. Very 
Good. Excuse me, Bart. I'll be back in a minute. Take your time, Paul. No hurry. Harris, May doesn't know him. Inspector, what are you doing? I'm listening in on that conversation over this extension telephone. Inspector, gentlemen, don't do that sort of thing. I'm not a gentleman. I'm a cop. Well, at least keep your hand over the mouthpiece. I've got my hand over the mouthpiece. Ah. Something interesting, Inspector? Yeah, something very interesting. Well, I'll be... Well, Inspector. But how good a friend of yours is this Paul Arnold? Why, the best. I've known him for years. Think he's on the up and up, eh? Yes, yes, I gamble on That's too bad. Why? Bart, I hate to tell you this. Arnold wasn't on the plane. What do you mean, he wasn't on the plane? That guy Harrison that Arnold was talking to, he used the plane ticket that Arnold bought. He just called to thank Arnold. But Paul Arnold was here in New York at the time Tony Irwin was murdered. <laughs> Because I think it'll be death for both of us. Oh, then, then you stop loving me. Oh, no, Paul. Well, what else am I to think? Well, I'm not very proud of my past, Paul. Among other things, I... I was a dancer in a burlesque show. And you're ashamed of it. Oh, no, no, I'm not ashamed. I, I did nothing to be ashamed then of. Then why? Because... Because I met you, Paul. Because I fell in love with you. Because... Because I wanted so desperately to have you love me. And I knew that that Paul Darnell could only fall in love with a lady. He did. What? I said, Paul Arnold did fall in love with a lady. I'm You're that lady. I'm trying to be kind. You're pitying me. I can't stand pity. Nor me. I. No, no, look, Brenda, listen to me. I've known for the last three months about, well, about your past. You, you've known? Yes, yeah, sure. Tony Irwin called on me. He told me all about you, even threatened blackmail. And you didn't believe him? Well, I found that everything he told me was true. But why didn't you tell me? Paul? Why should I worry the girl I love with something that was completely unimportant? Oh, Paul. Oh, there, there, you poor kid. Kiss me, Paul. Hold me, Paul. Oh, darling, what a fool I've been. No such thing. I should have warned you. Irwin waited until things quieted down, then tried his blackmailing stunt on you. That's why I didn't go to Boston. I was worried. You... You didn't go to Boston. No, at the last minute I had a hunch. I gave my ticket to a man named Harrison at the airport. In fact, he just called me on the phone to thank me. Then, then you were here when... When, when Irwin was shot? Yes. Yeah. I came in the back way just as the shot was fired. But you didn't... Shoot sure, Irwin? <laughs> no, darling, I didn't get the chance. Someone beat me to it. Paul, listen to me. Does Barton Drake know that you weren't on the plane? No, why? Then you've got to tell him, Paul. If he finds out that you were lying... Nonsense. Might... Let Bart have his fun. But it isn't only Drake, Paul. It's, it's Inspector Danson. Oh, Paul, can't you understand how important this is? Drake's clever. He might prove that... that you Brenda, didn't... you don't think that I... <laughs> oh, darling. <laughs> Come here to me. Listen, Bart's my best friend. Don't worry about him. And even if I did kill Tony Irwin, I've got the best alibi in the world. <laughs> But hmm? when are you going to give up and admit that your friend Arnold is the guy we want? Why should I, Inspector? Why should I, he asked. Because all the evidence we've uncovered points to his guilt, that's why. What evidence, Inspector? What evidence? Now, look, Bart, I'm a patient man. You know that. Yes. All Arnold had a motive. He wasn't on that plane and... And we're keeping that knowledge to ourselves, Inspector. I don't want Paul ever to suspect that we broke his alibi. Oh, you don't? This isn't a game, you know, Bart. Just because the guy's a good friend. What other evidence we've the point to Paul's guilt, Inspector? His sister knows we were he, he was here, for one thing. Mm -hmm. I just talked to her. She admits that that's why she didn't do as I asked and call you. Because she thought that Paul had shot Irwin? Hmm? Sure. She didn't want to see her own brother go to the chair. Oh, Inspector, that's weak. Very weak. Oh, yeah? Well, there's the gun lying beside the court. From which the fingerprints have been carefully wiped. So far, you haven't mentioned anything that would stand up in court. Okay, okay, okay. How about the fact that no fingerprints were found on the safe? Mm, yes, that proves that Mrs. Arnold was lying, doesn't it? 
Mrs. Uh, said she stepped around the curtain and saw Irwin tinkering with the safe. Yeah. But if you'd just let me talk to... You want to see me, sir? Yes, Robert. Will you ask Mr. and Mrs. Arnold to step down here, please? Yes. Thank you. Now, Inspector, what was it that you were about to say? I was going to say if you'd just let me talk to Arnold, I... <laughs> you'd sweat it out of me, Inspector. Well, how are you going to find out if a man is guilty if you don't ask him any questions? Well, you'll get your chance to ask questions in a very few minutes, Inspector. I will? Mm-hmm. As soon as Paul and Bender get here, I'm going to have the crime reenacted. That ought to be fun. I can hardly wait. Now, let's not be sarcastic, Inspector. Why not only... Hello, Paul. Bender. Come in, please. Bart, uh, Brenda and I have just had a little talk. There's something we want to tell you. I'm sorry, Paul, but that'll have to wait. There's something more important to do. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If the guy wants to talk, let him. It's really quite important, Mr. King. I'm sure it is, Bender, but it'll still have to wait. Inspector... Will you ask Roberts to step in here, please? Now, listen, Barlow. And, Inspector, will you also ask Paul's sister, Agatha, to stand in the doorway to the dining room? That's where she claimed she was when the shot was fired, wasn't it? Sure, but... Fine. Hurry along, Inspector. We'll have everything ready by the time you get back. Okay, okay. Only I'm more used to giving orders than taking them. <laughs> now, Brenda, if you'll stand over there near the curtains in the exact spot where you were when the lights went out. I will. Only if you'll listen to what Paul has to say. I'm sorry. What Paul has to say, we'll have to wait. Now, wait a minute, Bart. This may change your whole outlook on the situation. I'm sorry. That's impossible, too, Paul. Listen, I appeal to you. If Brenda won't cooperate... He'll I... cooperate if he wants a dog on rude. I'm sorry. There are times when a man in my position has to appear rude. Not to my wife, you don't. Whose wife it is? Doesn't matter. It does in this case. Now, listen. All Bart. right, Robbie. Inside. Now, now, just a minute, Inspector Denton. Pipe down, Gramp, and do as you're told. Denton, take your hands off, Robert. He's done nothing. Well, now, what's happened to the big, happy family I left a few minutes ago? Never mind the wife, cracks, chum. But I thought you were a friend of mine. Friendship ceases where murder's involved, Paul. Now listen to me, all of you. You're going to do as I say, or Inspector Danton will take the three of you down to headquarters and lock you up. Now you're talking my language, Bart, old boy. Uh, so this is when I get when I ask a friend to help me out. Oh, so what's the use, Paul? If this is the kind of person Bart and Drake is, and what we have to say won't matter anymore. Brenda, now. you're 100% right. All right, all right. If it's going to make you any happier, what do you want us to do? Thank you, Paul. Brenda, will you uh, stand over near the curtains, please? Yes, all right. This is where I was when the shot was fired. Fine. And where was Irwin standing? Directly in front of the safe. Hmm. How were the curtains arranged? Well, they, they were halfway open. About like this. Thank you. Stay there, please. Now, Robert, if you'll just stand uh, here in front of this door. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes? It, it wasn't near this door that I was standing when I saw the shot fired. It was over there near the library door. Yes, I remember your thing. So, however, if you don't mind, I prefer that you stand here. Now, look here, Bart. If you think that Robert had anything to do with Irwin's killing, you're crazy. He's been with me for years. We'll go into that later, Paul. Inspector, where's Paul's sister, Agatha? She's out in our hall near the dining room door. Bored. But look here, sir. If it were Miss Agatha, I mean, the dining room door is right behind where I'm standing. I, I mean... Well, what do you mean, Robert? Are you implying that Agatha mur murdered Tony Irwin? Oh, no, sir. Of course not. Then keep quiet. Say, everyone's getting mad at everyone, aren't they? Mm. Paul, will you go over and stand near the doors of the library, please? Okay. So now I'm standing here. What am I supposed to do? Look over towards the curtains. Can you see Brenda standing behind them? Sure, I can. They're half open. Excellent. All right, Robert. Tony Irwin was supposedly standing in front of the safe, farther back in behind the curtains, when you stepped into the room. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. Now, Robert, I want you to raise your hand as though you had a gun in it. Point it in the manner you claim to have seen the figure point it and fire. Yes, sir. Uh, the figure was standing here. He aimed deliberately. Good heavens. Well, Robert. You... You tricked me. The guy he has got a gun in his hand. Hey, don't turn off the light. Well, I can say he's coming at you. <laughs> Where's he going, Inspector? Through this door. Come on. Right. Let go of me. It's Agatha. He's holding her in front of him. Stand back or I'll shoot. All right. Look out, Inspector. You'll hit the girl. Help me, brother. All right, Robert. You got one chance. That does it. <laughs> you blundering idiot. You hit Agatha. No, I didn't. I hit Robert. Nice work, Inspector. Come on. Agatha. Agatha, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Robert's dead? Yeah, he's dead, lady. Inspector Denton never misses. <laughs> Knew all the 
time that it was Robert. How about it? No, no, I, uh, I only suspected. The thing that puzzled me is the fact that he had no particular motive. But he did have a motive, Mr. Drake. Oh? Robert knew that Carl and I were happy. He apparently overheard my conversation with Tony Irwin and realized that our happiness was being jeopardized. Robert has been in our family for years. He was just being loyal. You know, I, I wish somehow we could repay the debt. Well, I think Robert would feel repaid if he knew how things had turned out. Yes, I, I suppose you're right. Oh, Carl. Oh, no, no, darling. Can I say something? Yes, of course you can, Inspector. All I want to know is, how did you know that Roberts was it? Well, well, that's a fair enough question, Inspector. Robert said he glimpsed a figure standing in the doorway that led to the hall. He said he saw that figure take deliberate aim and fire. I get it. Anyone standing in the doorway leading to the hall couldn't see the two people standing behind the curtain. Ah, that's right, Inspector. Robert, standing in the doorway of the library, could see them plainly. So he assumed that the figure could see them, too. Uh-huh. And uh, how did you know that... Uh, this figure just didn't fire blindly and hit Tony Irwin by mistake. Oh, Inspector, I'm ashamed of you. Because if he had, there would have been a bullet hole in the curtain. Now, wouldn't there? Yeah. <laughs> and there wasn't, was there? No, no, there wasn't. By the way, Paul, what was it that you and Brenda were so anxious to tell me a little while ago? Oh, I, well, but it, it really doesn't matter now. Well, no, it, it isn't important at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's... It had something to do with my alibi. Bart, it would kill you if you knew. It would, eh? Hey? Uh, Bart, shall we tell him? Absolutely not, Inspector. I told you I'd like Paul to think that... I don't mean that. No? What do you mean? Tell him, you know what? Huh? Maybe they won't think they were so gall darn smart after all. Oh, I see what you mean, Inspector, yes. Paul, whenever you think of how you put one over on Bart and Drake, just remember that mystery is my hobby. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the Mole Mystery Theater, the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight's mystery, entitled Close Shave, was written by Frederick Matho and stars the beautiful motion picture and stage actress K.T. Stevens in the role of Ellen Thomas. Now, most of us lead fairly tranquil lives, but some of you listeners may have narrowly escaped disaster and will understand the fear and terror experienced by Ellen Thomas when she finds herself helpless in the face of death. In a few moments, you'll hear the story of Ellen's close shave. But now, Dan Seymour. And friends, we want to hear about your close shave, too. Because the story of your closest shave, your narrowest escape, may win Mole's great new contest, may win you a $3,500 vacation. Later in the program, we'll bring you the full details of Mole's contest, My Closest Shave. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, and Act One of tonight's Mole Mystery, Close Shave, starring K.T. Stevens as Ellen Thomas. Hello, Larry. Hello, Ricky. Is Ellen home? My darling roommate should be here any minute. Come on in. Oh, thanks. Ellen's boss is away on her vacation. I guess that's why she's late. Ellen's running Mead and Company's payroll department herself these days. Yeah, she's done swell with a new job. Say, uh, you remember old Mr. Bruno at the barbershop? The one who gave Ellen that job as a manicurist when she first came to New York? Yeah. Well, that's what I came to tell Ellen about. He died yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry, Larry. Ricky! I want to show you I found the most divine hat. Oh, hello, Larry. Hello, Ellen. Larry says that nice old Mr. Bruno died yesterday. Oh, I am sorry, Larry. Yeah, the funeral is tomorrow afternoon. I was thinking I could stop by for you and we could go together. Oh, I, I just couldn't make it tomorrow, Larry. I, I'm sorry. Oh. Y you send some flowers for me, will you, Larry? Yeah, sure. 
Sure. Ellen, I, uh, I don't suppose... I wondered if... Uh... Yes? Oh, I don't suppose you'd have dinner with me tonight. <sighs> Thanks, but I, I've got a date. Okay. Well, I better go. Bye, Ellen. Bye. So long, Larry. So long. Oh, Ricky, would you iron my blouse? I'm late Are now. Are you I'm... going out with Tony again? Yes. A little rough on Larry, aren't you? Well, I'm not obligated to Larry. Besides, he's just a barber. Oh, nice going. One year in the big city, and our little girl from Grand Rapids has already learned how to be a snob. Oh, now, Ricky, just because I prefer Tony to Larry doesn't mean oh, that I... Oh, sure, honey. Anthony Drexel Drake, fancy stuff. A baby graduating from manicure as to assistant cashier doesn't give you a diploma to hobnob with the social register. But you were the one who encouraged me to take that business course. That means I want you to get hurt by some rich playboy? Oh, honey, break it off. Don't see him. Call it off. I couldn't. Not tonight, anyway. Why not? Well, he's in trouble. Tony Drake in trouble? Mm -hmm. The bank's foreclosing on his polo ponies, maybe. Oh, he hasn't said anything, but something's wrong, I know. Now, Ricky, please help me get dressed. I'm so late now. Tony, you've ordered already. And all my favorites, too. Favorite foods for my favorite girl. <laughs> and for me, too, of course. The condemned man ate a hearty meal. Tony... Is something wrong? Oh, no, what could be wrong? Come on, have some more champagne. But you said... That I love you. Tony. Or did I ever say that? No, you... You never did. Well, I do, darling. I love you, too. Don't say it. But, Tony, I... Forget it. What's the matter? Nothing, only... Well, Ellen, I... I won't see you again after tonight. Oh, your family's forbidden you. My family. It's all right, I understand. I'm not good enough for you. Not good enough? Good Lord, honey, you, you, you've got it backwards. You're too good. I don't believe you. Your parents Baby, probably... Baby, Now, will you listen? Listen hard? Yes. I hadn't intended to tell you this, but... Darned if I let you go off believing a lot of nonsense. You're in some kind of trouble. Yes. Before I met you, there was a girl. Not a very nice girl. I'll skip the sordid details. I lost my head, and she knew how to make it pay off. Go on. I don't think you're going to like me anymore when you hear the rest. I took some diamonds from the wall safe at home. Stuff Dad had given Mother when they were married. I pawned them. You know, to, to pay her off. Well, tomorrow's their anniversary, and Mother always wears the diamonds then. They'll find out what I did, and that'll be the end of everything. What'll they do to you? Oh, Dad wouldn't send me to jail, but I'll be packed off somewhere. And I hate to think what this will mean to Mother. Well, couldn't you borrow the money somewhere? Look, darling, I've been a pretty respectable character since I met you. But my former reputation doesn't exactly enhance my credit rating. There's no one who can help. Well, it's always been my sister Stella. She used to bail me out of scrapes when I was too scared to tell Dad. Oh, and that's the irony of it. She was due tomorrow on the Queen Mary. I know she'd have helped me for Mother's sake, but... Oh, now the ship's delayed by storms and won't be in until Sunday. How much money do you need, Tony? Huh? Ten thousand oh, dollars. Gosh, that's a lot of money. Well, tonight's Friday. I, I could pay it back Sunday at the latest, as soon as I could see Stella. All I need is a loan for two days. Well, I can't get it. I tried everywhere. So there's nothing to do but face the music. Honey, I deserve it, but... If Mother... No, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll feel like a murderer. Tony. Yes? Tony, if you did have the money by tomorrow, you're sure you could repay it before Monday? Oh, by Sunday at the latest. I know Stella would help, but... Oh, anyhow, let's, let's make our last date fun. Let's dance. What do you say? Uh, no. No, wait, Tony. I'm in charge at my office now. I've got the whole week's receipts in the safe, and I... No. But our office is closed Saturday and Sunday. We'd put it back before Monday. You said yourself Ellen, that you... Ellen, I wouldn't think of you letting you do such a thing. Oh, but it wouldn't be stealing, Tony. We'd put it right back. 
please, Tony. Please let me help. Darling, I'll never forget you for this. <laughs> I got the money. Swell. I didn't meet a soul. Here. Thanks, darling. Come on, we'd better walk over to Third Avenue and get care. Tony. What's the matter? Someone's coming. Step back into the doorway. He's going into the building. Let's get... What's wrong? That man. He was one of the night watchmen. Think he saw us? He must have before he stepped back in the shadows. But wouldn't he say hello to you? Maybe he was suspicious. Would he find out the money's gone? No one could know until Monday morning. Then don't worry. I'll tell Stella Sunday and definitely have the money for you Sunday morning. Nothing will go wrong. Nothing can possibly go wrong. And believe me, darling, if it does, I'll take the blame. You know that. <laughs> Here's your drink, Tony. Oh, oh, thanks, Stella. You going to call her now? Yes, I think I'd better. She's probably pretty upset. I promised to call her this morning, you know. She's probably half out of her mind by now. Hello? Ellen, it's Tony. Oh, Tony, why didn't you call me this morning? I've been at the phone all day waiting for you. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, darling, but it being Sunday, Stella couldn't get the money around town, so we had to go up and see her husband in Stanford. Well, did you... Did you get it? <laughs> of course. Oh, thank heaven. Stella and I just got back. That's why I didn't call you until now. Oh, I understand, Tony. Though I've been so worried. Oh, sure, honey. Now, listen, I want to get the money back to you. Can you meet me right away? Yes. Where are you? Well, I've taken a room at the Harker Hotel. Oh? I thought it would be better if it, we weren't too ostentatious about all this. Oh. Don't ask for me at the desk. Just come right up to 802. All right, Tony. Stella's with me now, and she's dying to meet you, so hurry. <laughs> I'll be right over. Oh, Tony, your sister must be a wonderful girl. I don't know what we'd have done without her. Give her a kiss for me. <laughs> sure thing. Bye, darling. You heard what the lady said, honey. Mm -hmm. Give sister a great, big, brotherly kiss. <laughs> mm. Mm. <sighs> well, not exactly what I'd call brotherly. <laughs> I don't like that girl, Tony. After this, I don't think I'll let you make love to anybody but me, even for business. Stella, for ten grand, you'd let me make love <laughs> oh, to... Oh, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> sure was a lovely day for us, the day you spotted little Ellen working behind that cashier's window. By tomorrow, it'll be all over. It'll be in all the morning papers, real human interest story. Trusted employee dips into company funds, then gets panicky, can't face the music. So she gets herself a hotel room and takes an overdose of sleeping pills. <laughs> yes, just couldn't resist the temptation of easy money. Poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> Looks as if poor Ellen stands to lose her faith in Tony, her $10,000, and possibly her life. We'll continue with her story, Close Shave, in Act Two of tonight's Mole Mystery. But first, here's Dan Seymour, who wants to know the story of your closest shave. That's right, friends, because the story of your closest shave, your narrowest escape from peril, embarrassment, or failure, may win the grand prize in Mole's big new contest called My Closest Shave. A $3,500 vacation for yourself and your immediate family, or the cash if you prefer. Well, that's certainly a grand prize, Danny. Yes, Mr. Barnes, and that's only one of the prizes. The next five winners each get a new 1949 Ford sedan. The next ten winners get either an Emerson table model television set installed, or Emerson's new radio phonograph. Also, 25 cash prizes of $100 each, 
and 50 cash prizes of $50 each. How do you enter the contest, Dan? Get the printed contest rules and suggestions from your druggist. Then write the story of your closest shave in not more than 200 words. The originality of the story is what counts, not the literary quality. And the judge's decision will be final. Send your entry with the two end flaps bearing the name Mole from any Mole carton. Mail it to Mole, Post Office Box 49, New York 8, New York, with your own name and address. Uh huh. Send your entry to Mole, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Huh? Send as many entries as you wish, friends, including two Mole carton end flaps with each entry. Remember, there are $25,000 worth of wonderful prizes. 107 prizes in all, including trade prizes. Your close shave may be the big winner. So send your Mole contest entry soon. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, returning you to the Mystery Theater and Act Two of Close Shave, starring K.G. Stevens as Ellen Thomas. Darling, this is my sister Stella. The time she doesn't spend at the races, she spends listening to my troubles. <laughs> Stella, this is Ellen. How do you do? Hello. I hope I'm not intruding. Darling, no, I'm intruding. When Tony told me he was in love, I just had to see. And you are pretty. You're terribly pretty, and I'm glad for you both. Thank you. I'm very glad to meet you, too. Wherever Stella goes, so goes the bottle. Come well, on, let's all have to drink to celebrate your first meeting, huh? Oh, Tony, I don't oh, think I want... Oh, nonsense, dear. You've got nothing to worry about with me here. Go on, have one. Stella, Ellen has nothing to worry about anyhow. What you know of my past is just that, past. Ellen is my future. Here you are, darling. Drink. Ellen, I drink to your future, and to Tony as well. Any girl who can put that critter on the straightaway is a girl with lots of what it takes. <laughs> Here's how. <coughs> Darling, what happened? Went down the wrong way. It tastes so funny. <laughs> You're not used to Manhattan's, dear. You go like them, darling. Come on, let's sit down and chat a while, huh? Good idea. Here, Ellen, sit here. Comfortable. Thank you. I am a little tired. I didn't sleep any too well last night. You do seem a little drowsy, darling. Put your head back, Ellen, dear. Rest a bit. Yeah, that's better. Ellen, are you all right, dear? Oh, yes. Take a nap, dear. A nice, long nap. Ellen? Huh? Ellen, dear. Yes, Ellen. Tony. Ellen, dear. Goodbye, Ellen, dear. Oh, what? Cut it out, Stella. Don't you have any feelings at all? I do for you, darling. Oh, Tony. For you, I have lots of feelings. Hello? Lawrence Field, please. Speaking. Larry, this is Ricky, Ellen's roommate. Oh, yeah. Hello, Ricky. I'm worried about... Well, gee, why are you calling me? She made things pretty plain. We're the only real friend she's got, Larry. I just don't like that Tony Drake. And Ellen's acting queer all weekend. Wouldn't leave the house. She jumped like she'd been shot every time the phone rang. Then just a few minutes ago, she went out and wouldn't say where she was going. Said she didn't know if she would come back. There's something wrong, Larry, and I don't like it. Well, you know where this Tony Drake lives? Okay, Ricky. If it'll make you feel better, I'll go over to the university club and see if I can talk to this Tony Drake. Great, great. All she does is groan. She should have kicked in hours ago. She's coming to... Why don't you give her more? Shut up. How did I know? I gave her plenty. Well, give her some more now. Will you pipe down? I'm going to give her more. 
so as she comes out of it enough. Why wait? Pour it into her. Listen, Stella, you're a lovely doll, a wonderful partner, and I love you. But if you don't shut up, you too will go to sleep. People who are unconscious can't drink. Now let me handle this. Should have died. She's messing things up. Ellen. Hmm? Ellen, darling. I... Can you hear me? Ellen. Tony. Tony. I'm sick. So sick. Yes, yes, dear, I know. Here I am. Here, darling. Drink this. Uh-uh. It'll make you better. No, no drink. I'm sick, Tony. Sick. No drink. Drink this. I... It's to make you better. Drink it. I don't want Tony. Where's Ricky? Where's Ricky? How do I know? Drink this. Please, Ellen. Ellen, darling. It's your Tony. Ellen, darling, it's your Tony. Drink that, you little tramp. Oh, Tony. Tony, where am I? What, what's wrong? Tony, darling. Oh, darling, you, you little... Oh, Tony. Oh, die. Why don't you die? Stella, you dizzy, dumb... Yeah. Get away from it. Now oh, you've really fixed it, you green-eyed witch. Tell her so we can beat it. We've got the dough now. Are you nuts? We can't lay a finger on it. She's supposed to die from an overdose of sleeping pills. Yeah. You're killing me. Both of you, you're trying to... Oh, dear Lord, help me. Help. It worked, Tony. It worked. She's dead. Shut up. She's only passed out. We're right back where we started. Only now she's wise. It's got to be murder now. You and your big mouth. Coming out of it again. A lot of good that'll do if she won't drink the stuff. Oh, brother Stella, you sure foul this up. Maybe not. Look, Tony, did you take a room next door in her name? Sure. I figured after she died, we could take her in there and no one could trace her to us. No one here has ever seen me with her. All right. How about the window? What? She's loaded with sleeping pills. She wakes up. She's still scared of facing her boss on Monday. So she jumps out of the window. This is cleaning out for us. Stella, that's it. Her window's over this same court. Toss her out here, then fix the window in her room to look like she fell from there. It's good. Ricky. She's come out of it. You play along now. I've got an angle. Ellen. Hmm? Ellen, can you hear me? Yes. Ellen, listen. We decided not to go through with it. If you'll do just as I say, don't shout. Behave yourself. I will. I will, yes. Good. Now, first you need air. Got to have some air to keep come out of this. You've had an overdose of sleeping pills. Get her over here. I'll open the window and let the breezes in. Come on. Uh, Hang on a minute. Try to walk over. I can't. That'll wake you up. Yeah, that's it. Now. Move your arms. Get the blood going. Move. That's it. Breathe deeply. Breathe. That's it. Better? Yes. Yes, it's good. My head's clearing. What will you do to me? Will you let me go? Please, will you, Tony? Never mind for now. Just stay close to the window. Breathe deep. Uh, Feeling better now? Yes, a lot better. Okay, Tony. Right. Now, baby. What are you doing? No, please. Come on, off. Don't let her scream. Right. No, please. Okay, now, out she goes. that? Probably one of the hotel employees. Sit tight. Maybe they'll leave. This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of Close Shave, starring K.T. Stevens. Now a word from George Putnam. Every day, more and more people are discovering that to get real relief from the most common kind of dandruff, they must destroy the germ called Pity Rosporum ovale, which many outstanding authorities say is its cause. 
You see, merely washing or brushing away loose dandruff has no effect whatsoever on this germ. But one thing that does work is double dandruff. For double dandruff actually kills this germ on contact. Even in severe cases, results with double dandruff have been amazing. And the reason for double dandruff's astonishing effectiveness is a special ingredient, an active antiseptic so remarkably efficient many hospitals use it. In double dandruff, we call it Alzan. So stop trying to combat this dandruff with ineffective methods that actually are no better than plain water. They can't compare with double dandruff, for double dandruff destroys the cause. If you're not completely satisfied, you'll get your money back. Get double dandruff tomorrow. Assistant, whoever he is. Yeah. Look, Stella, you see who it is. Nellen. You see this? Yes. A gun. You better say the right things, do you understand? Well. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, Stella. Hello. Uh, hello. Mr. Tony. I'm Tony. Come in. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I wanted to... Ellen. Larry. Oh, friend of yours, darling? Yes. Well, Larry, what brings you here? Ricky was worried about you and called me. And I found out plenty. Listen, Ellen, this guy's a phony. I checked at the university club. This guy's not Anthony Drexel Drake. His name is Tony Sumac. He's the gym instructor at the club. You'd uh, better explain to him uh, about our marriage, darling. Oh, Larry, you should mind your own business. I know all about Tony and... I don't care. We're going to be married. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? As an old friend of Ellen's, you should be happy for her. I think she's a darling. I love her to death already. I see. Well, okay, that takes care of that. So long. Larry! Yeah? Will you do me a favor? What? I... I had a date. I want to call it off. And I'm too busy, as you can see, and... Bruno's waiting for me. Bruno? But how... Yes. Poor boy, he's waiting for me. Tell him I'm sorry. You understand, Larry? I... I'd rather not see him. Yeah, I... I understand. So yeah. long. You should have your head examined, Tony. Now what? Why'd you let him go? Don't you see? The suicide's out. When her body's found, he'll know about us. You sure right. The whole thing's shut. Look, let's just tie her up and get out of here. And leave her to shoot her mouth off later? But I won't say anything. If you'll just let... What? Get it, Stella. Yeah. Oh, forget something? Yeah, I guess you'd say I did. I uh, got to thinking I acted kind of sore and all. Look, uh, I'd like both of you to know Larry Fields is no sorehead. Oh, sure, we know that, don't we, Ellen? Yes, of course. Of course, Larry. I mean, uh, well, congratulations. I hope your marriage will be very happy. Let's shake on it, Tony. Why, you bet. Hard luck on you, but here's my hand on it. That's how things go. It sure is, Tony. Ow! Oh! My arm. Let go. Sure, I'll let you go. Ow! Sorry. In his pocket, a gun. Okay. I got it. You, sister, just stand still. I... You all right, Ellen? Yes. Okay, grab the phone and call the desk. Well, what'll I tell them? Tell them to get the police up here. Hello? Hello? This is room 802. Get the police up here. Hurry. Yes, 802. You sure you're okay, Ellen? Oh, I guess I am, but I was so frightened you weren't coming back. Well, I was so mad at you, I got halfway down the hall before I remembered Bruno was dead. That sure was a close shave. Larry, you'll never know how close. Murder, 
by experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist whose books have been published in 17 languages, have sold over 10 million copies, and who is author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist Frank Gruber. From the many thrillers he has read and enjoyed, Mr. Gruber has selected a tense and gripping story by George and Gertrude Fass. And now we present Larry Haynes in It's Luck That Counts. <laughs> When you're down on your luck, you can't expect things to break right. You see a dime lying on the street, you go to pick it up and get swiped by an auto. Or you snatch a bag from a rich-looking dame and all you find in it is six cents and a lipstick. You know what I mean. So when the bartender in this Pittsburgh dive told me to scram, I guess I should have listened. Now, now look, Crumb, keep your hooks out for free lunch. Quit bothering the customers. Nobody's going to buy you a drink. I'm not bothering anybody. Well, just you standing there bothers me. Just because I'm near the freight yards, every bindle stiff in the county thinks I run a club for hoboes or something. If I told you once, I told you a dozen times to shove off of it. Hey, what's going on? What are the cops coming here for? All right, folks. Stand right where you are. Hey, what is this? Keep your shirt on, Delaney. This is a raid. Commissioner's orders. Hey. You there. Come over here. I didn't do nothing. All right, search him, Parker. What for? What have I done? Never mind. Oh, but I... Hey, you. You in the brown suit. Get over there with the other one. And you there, Red. Go on, get over there. Hey, you. You're a new face. What's your name? Me? Yeah, you. Matthews, Dan Matthews. Where do you live? I'm, uh, I'm just passing through. Get over with the others, Matthews. But I haven't done anything. Kids! Now, here's the next one, Lieutenant. His name is Dan Matthews. Ah. Uh, all right, Dan. Now, here's your chance to come clean. Why did you kill him? Kill? I didn't kill anybody. I swear I did. Suppose I told you you were seen near the old lady's shack just about the time she was killed. What old lady? Sarah Grimes. Name's familiar, isn't it? No, I never heard of her. I never was near her. Where'd you hide the money, Danny? What money? The 75 grand you stole from the old lady after you killed her. 75 grand? Yeah. You think if I stole 75 G's, I'd be hanging around Delaney's bar, mooching a drink? I'm asking the questions, Matthews. Now, where were you Tuesday night between 8 o'clock and midnight? Well, if that's when it happened, that lets me out, Lieutenant. I was in Delaney's bar all that time. Ask him if you don't believe me, he'll tell you. Oh. All right, Matthews. If Delaney backs you up, that'll clear you. And you'll let me go? Oh, no, no. No matter what Delaney says, we're holding you for vagrancy. Vagrancy? Yeah. You're a big, good-looking guy, Matthews. Why haven't you got a job? Well, I... This city doesn't like bums, Matthews. Especially bums from out of town. We got enough of our own. Hey, Sergeant, take Matthews back to the cell and bring in the next... They all gave me the big double O when I got shoved back into the cell, but I just grinned at them and flopped onto a cot. They still had it coming. All of them were guys like me, all except one. He was about 40, big, and he wore a neat pinstripe suit. I could see he was really sweating under the cool front he was putting up. 
presently he came over to me. Hey, fella. Yeah? What are they looking for? Listen, they question you. What are they trying to find? I don't even know why they arrested me. You mean they just picked you up and pulled you in without telling you what for? Yes. I was just opening up my pool parlor when the cops came. Hold me up without a word. What for? Why? You know what they want? Yeah, sure I know. They're looking for a murderer. Murderer? Who was killed? Some old crow named of Grimes. Sarah Grimes? Yeah, you know her? Of course I know her. She was a friend of my old lady. Well, she's dead. Head smashed in, blood all over everything. According to the cops, she had 75,000 bucks hidden in that tumble-down shack of hers. Maybe more. 75,000? Yeah. Yeah, well, what am I to do with this? Why do you arrest me? Same reason they arrested me, to ask questions. Tell me. What, uh... What questions do they ask? Lots of questions, you know. Do, uh... Do they do anything else? What do you mean? They search you? Is that when you close? They didn't, but I decided to give the guy a ride. Yeah, sure. Sure, they go over you from head to foot. Examine your clothes under ultraviolet for blood stains, look into your cuts, your shoes, socks, everything. Why? Nothing. Nothing. Listen, Paula. Danny's the name, Danny Matthews. Danny, I'm Fred Bruno. You look like a nice guy. A guy I can trust. Sure, everybody can trust Danny. I, uh, I want you to do me a favor. I'll be glad to, only I'm not getting out of here, so I can't call you a lawyer. No, it's, it's not that. I, I'm a married man, see? Yeah, I see. But uh, sometimes I go to New York on business, you know. Yeah. I don't like to carry a lot of baggage with me, so I keep a bag in the city. A suitcase. I got my clothes in there. Uh -huh. You know. You know New York? Do I know New York? You know that check room in Times Square in the subway? Yeah, I know. I got the suitcase checked there. I, I got the baggage checked with me. Well, that's no crime. Yeah, but you see, it's like this. If they find that baggage check on me, they'll investigate, won't they? Yeah, they'll investigate. That's what I'm afraid of. I've uh, got a girlfriend in the city. My wife finds out about that, there's going to be trouble. So, you see, I don't want them to know. You understand? Yeah, sure, sure. I know just how you feel. Uh, they're not going to search you again. No, no, they're not. Would you? Sure, I'll hold it for you. Just give it here. I'll give you $10 for the pay rent. That's all I have on me. Thanks. I'm glad to do it for you. A good guy, Danny. You give it to me when I come back. Well, uh, maybe you're not coming back. Maybe they'll let you go. You needn't worry about that. I'll be around to pick it up. Okay. Whenever you want it, you can have it back again. That's fine. Here. Here it is. Take care of it. Oh, sure. You haven't a thing to worry about. Well, Fred Bruno didn't come back to the cell, so I knew the police didn't have enough on him to hold him. A couple of hours later, I was hauled into night court and was handed a 30-day stretch for vacancy. I hadn't been in a week when they told me I had a visitor. Fred Bruno. He didn't waste any time getting down to business. Where is it? Where's what? That baggage check. What baggage check? I don't know what you're talking about. Don't fool around with me, Matthews. I want... I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I warn you, Matthews. I want that check. If I don't get it, you're not going to like what happens to you. Maybe i better call the screw. You're threatening me. Maybe I'd better tell him you want a baggage check. Suppose they were to find that check, Bruno, and find the suitcase in your girl's picture and that your wife isn't going to like that. All right, Matthews. You're asking for it. And you're going to get it right in the neck. I knew then I had to do some planning. I wasn't letting that check slip through my fingers. Not when for the first time in my life my luck was beginning to change. I ain't dumb. I knew it was in that suitcase. It was the 75 G's Bruno got when he knocked off his old lady friend. I knew I had to get that baggage checked to a safe place. I got an envelope and a stamp and addressed it to Dan Andrews, care of General Delivery, New York. Then I got friendly with a stew who was in for ten days on a D and D charge. I gave him ten bucks to mail a letter for me when I got outside. I knew it was taking a chance, but what else could I do? 
Well, when my 30 days were up, I walked down the jailhouse steps expecting to find Fred Bruno waiting for me. He wasn't there. But that didn't mean he wasn't having me tailed. I walked down the street and then turned off toward the main highway out of town. As I hiked along, I kept thumbing cars. The fourth one slowed down and stopped. Would you like a lift? Oh, you bet. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. You going far? Uh, New York. You going that far? Oh, no. No, I'm not. Sorry. But I can take you about 20 miles on your way. Well, every little bit helps. Yes, I guess it does. She smiled at me. She was a luscious blonde with blue eyes that really set you back on your heels. She looked to be about 25. And there was class written all over her. I sat next to her smelling that wonderful perfume and cursing my clothes and the luck that made us meet like this. Um, uh, you're not scared? Picking up a guy like me, I'm not dressed so well. Should I be scared? Oh, no, no. Well, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I didn't look at your clothes when I stopped for you. I looked at your face. You looked honest, huh? Not only that. Oh. Say, I, uh... I sure wish you were going to New York. We could have a great time there. Could we? Well, you may think because I'm dressed like a tramp, I am a tramp. Broke, but that's where you're wrong. I've got lots of money waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I'll have it just as soon as I get to the city. Yes, sir, I've got a steak there waiting for me. A big steak. That's nice. Somebody die and leave your fortune? They might say that. <laughs> sure, you might say that. Well, I'm sorry I'm not going to New York. I'm on my way to my country place. I've got a little place near Gloucester. Oh? You, uh, stay there all alone? Most of the time. Isn't it lonely? Well, yes, it, uh... It might be a bit lonely. Yeah, well, uh... Look, I don't have to get to New York today. I could get in tomorrow or the day after. Are you angling for an invitation? Well, I just thought if you wanted company... I don't know. I don't know. Well, I guess you could come to lunch, maybe, and stay for a swim. I could. And yeah, that's swell. Yes, I think it is, too. And since we'll be spending the afternoon together, I guess we'd better get to know each other's names. I'm Alice. I'm Danny, Danny Matthews. Glad to know you, Danny. <laughs> You're not half as glad as I am, Alice. It took us about an hour to get to that summer place of ours. It was off all by itself in the woods. Right near it was an old quarry filled with sparkling cold water. I helped to lug a cart and the groceries from the car into the kitchen, and we stowed them away together and took the covers off the furniture. I could feel it building between us all the time. It's only 11 o'clock. Would you like to go for a swim now? The quarry's fine for swimming. Well, sure, only I don't have a suit. Oh, you can wear my brother's trunks. He's just about your size. I'll show you where you can change. Then I'll meet you in five minutes in front of the house. I was ready in three. When I waited for her on the porch, she came out in a white swimsuit. Now, when I saw her, I just about lost my breath. She was the dreamiest dame I ever laid eyes on. She smiled and I just gulped. Come along. We go down this path. Do you swim well? It's very, very deep. Oh, like a fish. Come on, let's get in. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah, this water's great. My goodness, you are a good swimmer. Well, oh, I was born near the East River. Can you dive? Oh, sure. Can you touch bottom? Oh, I, I don't know. How deep is it? 30 feet. Oh, wait till I get on this ledge. Now watch me. Oh. The water was so clear I could see the bottom coming up at me as I kicked myself down. I grabbed a handful of gravel and started up. Here's a present for you. Thanks. I can't do that. I've tried, but I never can get all the way down. Ah, oh, it's easy. Come on, stand here on this rock and catch your breath. Uh, oh, isn't the water wonderful? 
You're wonderful. You're nice, too. She turned to face me. I let my arms float around her and closed them. Then as she floated up close to me, her lips were soft and cool. And then suddenly the coolness was gone and she was warm and close. She looked at me for a long moment with those beautiful eyes and then she slipped away and swam to the other end of the quarry. I swam after her. We climbed onto the rocks and she sat down and pulled off a bathing cap. Alice, I... I... Oh, Danny. Alice, Danny. Alice, I know it's crazy just meeting you a couple of hours ago, but I'm nuts about you. You're very nice, Danny. You're so very nice. Now, listen, come to New York with me. I got a pile of dough there just waiting for me to pick it up. I, I know I'm talking like I'm out of my head, me without a cent in my pocket dressed in rags, and... Well, it's true. But we'll really start living, get married, Alice. You don't, you don't know what you do to me. Don't, Dan, don't. We've got to get back to the house now. Uh, no, no, Danny, please, not now. We went back to the house. I followed her inside into the living room. Somebody was standing there with a rod in his hand. Bruno. Don't move, Matthews. Don't move or I'll plug you. Uh, Danny. Danny, this is my husband. Oh, I get it. I get it now. Did you find it, Fred? No, it's not in his clothes. I took them apart. I haven't got it. Well, maybe he... Maybe he hid it in the bedroom. No, I looked everywhere. Talk, Matthews. Where is it? Talk or you'll be wishing you were dead. I haven't a thing to say. Brave, aren't you? Wait. Before I get through with you, you talk. Plenty. Save it. Give it to him, Danny. Give it to him and you can go. That's to you, gorgeous. Never mind that talk. Upstairs, Matthews. We went upstairs, and Bruno told her to tie me to a chair, and she did a good job, too. I was tied to that chair so tight I could hardly breathe. You go outside, Alice. Leave him to me. Yes, Fred. Danny, I'm sorry. Well, this is your last chance. Are you going to talk? Guys, oh... It's just the beginning. Really did a good job, too. When it was through, I knew I'd been shellacked by an expert, but I didn't talk. I knew I'd be signing my own death warrant by spilling. He wouldn't kill me as long as he thought it could get me to sing. I was alone in the room, still tied to the chair. Downstairs, I could hear the two of them moving around, talking. I had to get my hands free. I pulled and jerked until the blood came. Then I passed out. Must have been hours later when I came to. It was dark and the house was quiet. I tried again to loosen my wrists. And I finally got my right hand free. Free, but almost useless. I rested, flexing my fingers. An hour passed, maybe more. I was picking at the knot that tied my left hand when the door quietly opened. The room was as dark as the inside of a camera, but I knew who it was. I'd know the smell of that perfume anywhere. Danny. Danny, are you awake? Yes, I'm awake. He mustn't hear you whisper. What for? I've got nothing to say. Danny, he's going to kill you. I know it. So what? I don't want you to die. You wouldn't kid me, would you? I'm going to untie you and let you go. Thanks. I mean it. I do mean it. Just tell me where it is, that baggage check. Please, Danny. Your keeping it won't do you any good, believe me. Maybe not. Now, Danny, listen to me. Freddy killed that old woman, and he'll kill you, too. I don't want him to. No? No. Let him have the baggage check, Danny. And then we'll go away, you and I. I hate him. I hate him. He's a beast. You're not getting anywhere, baby. Oh, Danny. You think I want to get the money, don't you? You think I'm lying just to get the money? Well, I'll tell you something, Danny. There isn't any money in that suitcase. Where is it if not in a suitcase? I have it. You have it? Yes, I have. I took it out of the suitcase and, and put something else in. All right. All right, you have the money. Why didn't you take a powder with it? Because I can't get at it, that's why. You have it, but you can't get at it. That makes sense. Now listen. The night that Freddie killed her, he came here with the money. I didn't know he was going to kill her. You didn't, huh? No. I didn't know a thing about it until he showed me the money. 
He put it in the suitcase so he could drive down to New York and check it. Well, while he changed his clothes, I took the money out and put something else in. Yeah? What'd you do with the dough? After he left, I put the money in a big mason jar and dropped it in the quarry. The quarry? Yes. I was sure that I'd be able to dive down and get it up again. Well, I tried, but it was too deep for me. That's why I asked you if you could touch bottom, you see? So please, please tell Freddy where the check is. He'll go to get it, and while he's gone, we'll get the money and go away. It's quite a yarn. But it's true, Danny. Please, it's true. All the time she talked, I kept working on my left hand, pulling to free it. And finally, it slipped out of the rope. Oh, Danny, we can go out west. Some place where he'll never find us. Please. Please, you've got to believe me. Danny, I love you, too. If I didn't, I wouldn't tell you all this. I'd keep the money for myself, wouldn't I? How do I know you're not playing me for a sucker? Well, you've got to trust me. Please. Please, tell me where the baggage check is. Cut me free first. You don't trust me, do you? Sure, sure, I trust you. But I haven't got it on me, you know that. Where is it? In New York, in a safe place. Fine. I'll tell Freddy and he'll go for it. When he does pick up that suitcase, there'll be a surprise waiting for him. While he's gone... We'll get the mason jar from the bottom of the quarry and we'll be on our way west in the morning. Does he know you're in here now? Yes. Yes, I... I asked him to let me try talking to you. Danny, he, he thinks that I'm trying to fool you. But you wouldn't do that, would you, honey? Oh, Danny, can't I make you understand? I could feel the numbness leaving fingers on my left hand. Now I had both hands free and she was within my reach, lying a fool head off to get me to give up the 75 grand to give her and Freddy. Where is it, Danny? Come closer, Alice. All right. Kiss me. Just to show me you're leveling with me. She came close. Her lips pressed against mine. And then... Oh, I had one hand on that saw of flying red mouth of hers and the other on that saw. With all my strength, I held on. Pulling it down on my knees so her feet wouldn't kick the floor. Suddenly she was limp. But I didn't let go. Minutes went by. Finally, I took my hand off her mouth. She wasn't breathing anymore. She was dead. Slowly, I let her body down on the floor. Then I untied the knots that held me to the chair. I reached for her and carefully, with stiff fingers, I took off a jacket. The perfume she drenched it with came off in waves. Then I got up, holding the jacket ahead of me like a bullfighter's cape. I walked down the pitch black hall. Alice? Shh. Did he tell you? I stopped. He'd been waiting there all the time. The perfume on that jacket fooled him the way I thought it would. I was just a couple of feet from him. The next time he spoke, I jumped. Well, did he talk? No, Freddy, I didn't. <laughs> My first wild punch in the dark put him out. After that, he wasn't any more trouble than she was. There was a lot for me to do before daybreak. First, I got rid of both the bodies, tying weights to them and sinking them to the bottom of the quarry. Freddy had a fat wallet. I helped myself to that. Next, I changed into one of his suits that was in the house. I closed the place, locked it, and got into the car as the first streaks of light began to show in the east. By afternoon, I'd be in New York. When I reached New York, I got a shave and a haircut and had some lunch. Then I went down to the main post office. The letter was there. And at ten minutes, I was at the Times Square subway station with a baggage check in my hand. Here you are. One suitcase. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, V-131. Well, what are you waiting for? V-131. This was checked over 30 days ago. Oh, what of it? I'll pay the charges. We don't keep baggage up here. After 30 days, your suitcase is down in storage room B. Uh, this way, please. Yeah, sure, just lead the way. We took the stairs down to one of the cellars, walked along some dark halls, and then stopped in front of a locked door. It's in uh, one of the bins down this way. Uh, here we are. 
B-131. This it? That yeah, looks like it. Okay, take it. Right. Oh, uh, here, bud. This is for your trouble. Uh, no, no thanks. Come on, buy yourself a drink. No. I don't want it. All right, suit yourself. Let's go. As we walked back to the door, I wondered why the guy should refuse a tip. When we got to the door, I found out. He opened it and I walked out right into the arms of a big guy in a bronze suit. He grabbed my wrist and before I knew what was happening, he had a pair of bracelets. All right, Matthews, you're under arrest. Arrest? What for? For the murder of Sarah Grimes in Pittsville, Massachusetts. I didn't kill that old Save lady. Save it, brother. You can do all your talking down at headquarters. <laughs> For all the talking I did down at headquarters, there were a lot of things I couldn't explain away. Like, for instance, the bank books belonging to Sarah Grimes they found in the suitcase. My having the baggage check for the suitcase. One thing the cops didn't know, and that was what happened to the 75 grand which should have been in the suitcase. And wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't a dime in that suitcase. The cops told me that two days after old lady Grimes was knocked off, they got an anonymous letter telling them to look into the suitcase checked in Times Square under number B-131. The note said the man who'd call for that suitcase was the murderer of Sarah Grimes. So, now they're hanging me in half an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting the surprise that was meant for Fred Bruno. And when I think it all over, two things stand out. Down in that quarry, there's a mason jar with $75,000 in it. And down there, too, is a gorgeous blue-eyed dame with a rock tied around her neck. See what I mean by the brakes going against you? I could have had them both. Yep. I could have had them both. And so the curtain falls on It's Luck That Counts, which was chosen by guest expert Frank Gruber, whose latest mystery thriller is The Leather Duke. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you the story of four people trapped in a bus in a driving blizzard and faced with the realization that one of them is a murderer. Selected for your approval by Helen Riley. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. It's Luck That Counts was written by George and Gertrude Fass. In the cast were Larry Haynes, Miss Leslie Wood, Santos Ortega, Bill Smith, and Ed Latimer. Music is under the direction of Emerson Buckley and was composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Jack Farron speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Theater tonight presents host Vincent Price with a tale of mystery. What the hell are you putting us on? I am not, I swear. My fingers are barely touching the pointer. What sort of message? I don't know. Let's find out. Just be still and concentrate some more. The Ouija Spells Murder will begin after this message from your local station. This is Vincent Price. The nights are getting dark so early now. This is Ellie Sims' first thought as she locks up the bookstore, leaves the friendly lights of the shopping mall, 
and steps out into the dark, deserted city street to wait at the corner bus stop alone. Ellie sits down on the bench to wait. The bus should be coming along any moment. She smiles as she recalls a frivolous purchase made during her afternoon lunch break. A Ouija board. An old-fashioned parlor game. She imagines her grandmother once whiled away slow, sunny afternoons, sitting at a lace-curtained window with a friend, the Ouija board between them on their laps. Their hands poised delicately on the pointer as they asked it to spell out the answers to blushing questions. Tell me, Ouija, do I have a favorite bow? When we go to the band concert in the park next Sunday afternoon, will he hold my hand? They wait patiently until at last the pointer slides hesitantly across the board to spell out the desired answer. Yes. Ellie shivers suddenly in her winter coat. It's getting colder and darker. She wishes the bus would come along. There's a newspaper vending machine beside the bench. She could at least read a bit of the paper under the corner streetlight while she waits. She walks over to the machine, fishing a coin from her purse, drops it into the slot, and lifts the lid to take out the paper. Only then do her eyes focus on the bold black headlines splashed across its front page. Another body found. Seventh young woman victim of sidewalk slasher. Which brings us to as good a place as any to begin our story. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love, hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Ouija Spells Murder, by Shirley Gordon. Our stars, Louise Heath and Joan McCall. Hey, bud. A young woman sitting in a bus, riding through dimly lighted streets. She gets off at her stop, shivering in a sudden icy wind, and hurries home, clutching... A Ouija board. Is that you, Ellie? Me? You're a little late. I know. I must have missed my regular bus somehow. I had to wait almost a half hour for the next one. How grim. Grimmer than you think. The street's so dark and deserted outside of the mall, and there wasn't another soul around at the bus stop. <laughs> With all those terrible murders lately. <laughs> There's been another. It's all over the front page of the paper. Oh, dear. How awful. Well, no good dwelling on it. What do we have for dinner? Well, since you were late, I went ahead and combined our leftovers into a casserole. It's already in the oven, okay? Great. I'll do the salad. It's done. Marvelous. I think I'll miss my bus every night. Don't push your luck. Oh, what'd you buy? Open it and see. You sure? I bought it for us. Really? Oh, it's a new jigsaw puzzle. I hope it's easier than the last one. I nearly went blind. It's not a new jigsaw puzzle. A Ouija board? I've heard of them, but I don't think I've ever actually seen one before. I thought we might have some fun with it. How does it work? You just ask it questions and it spells out the answers. What kind of questions? I don't know. We'll find out. Well, let's give it a try right after dinner, shall we? Bill's going to drop over. He'll be intrigued. <laughs> Our 
grandmothers had more patience. We're too used to instant pictures on the TV screen. Hmm, maybe you're not asking it the right questions. I'm asking it, is my boss going to give me a raise? That's the right question as far as I'm concerned. It says to start out with simple yes or no question. A simple yes is all I'm asking for, Ouija. Yeah, but you have to give the pointer a little push in the right direction. But that would be cheating and it wouldn't be any fun. Oh, come on, Ellie. You don't really think that thing's going to start moving by itself. No, you? but... Well, I don't think you should know that you're pushing it. I think you have to keep concentrating hard until your subconscious starts pushing it. All right, then. I'll just sit here and quietly munch on my cheesecake and let you two concentrate on concentrating. Good. Come on, Anne. Close your eyes. And this time, let's really stay absolutely still and keep our minds focused completely on the point. But I have been concentrating as hard as I can. I am not. You must be. But I'm not. I swear. <laughs> Come on now. One of you has to be. I think it's starting to spell out something. F I N D. Fine. It's going to tell me to find a new job. There you are. It is your subconscious. You probably really want to quit your job and find a new one. I do not. My subconscious doesn't know what it's talking about. Be quiet, you two. Maybe we're getting a message of some sort. Oh, come on, Ellie. You're putting us on. I am not. I swear. My fingers are barely touching the pointer. What sort of message? I don't know. Let's find out. Just be still and concentrate some more. Making you move. I'm really not. T H E. Find the. I'll bite. Find the what? Be quiet, Bill. K I L L. Kill? C R. Killer. Find the killer. I was only asking it about my job. Hmm. Now, that's funny. What's funny? Oh, all the time you two have been fooling around with that thing, and I've been sitting here having my coffee and cheesecake, I, I haven't really been able to keep my eyes off the front page of this paper and thinking about those murders. Then it's your subconscious that was the strongest force in the room. And the Ouija board picked up on it. Well, let's face it. All of our subconsciouses are probably thinking the same thing. We're all wishing they'd find that killer. But it's uh, still kind of remarkable. The pointer began moving so fast I couldn't keep my fingers on it. I know. Me too. The power of the subconscious. I'm not going to knock that. Let's see if it'll spell anything else, okay? All right. But I think I'd better watch my thoughts. Let's all be quiet and concentrate. On what? The murders? I'm trying not to think about them. Concentrate on whatever message the board has for us. Do you have anything more to say to us, Ouija? Oh, Ellie, really? <laughs> Next thing you know is you'll bring home a crystal ball. Both of you. Luigi, do you have anything more to tell us? G O T. God, no, wait. It's moving back to O again. G O T O. Go to Bill. You don't look at my subconscious. What you do? See? L O U. No, no, it's it's changing the last letter to a V. C L O V E R. Clover. Go to Clover. What does that mean? I have the slightest. <laughs> How about the Clover Heights? A new housing track? What made you think of that? I don't know. It just popped into my head. It's the only clover around here that I know of. But why is it telling us to go there? You don't suppose that was the second part of the same message, do you? What do you mean? Put them together. Find the killer, go to clover. 
Why, you mean the murderer is in Clover Heights, and the only one who knows about him is your friend Ouija? Look, it wasn't my idea to play detective with this silly thing. Then let's not. Let's let's put it away and turn on the TV. Or we'll play a nice, friendly game of three-handed roaming, okay? Okay. Only... Only you're curious, right? Right. <laughs> so am I. So let's all jump in my car, drive over to Clover Heights, and find the killer. No. But let's at least see what else my friend Ouija has to say. Just for fun? Some fun. Well, you might say it beats curling up in bed with the latest Hardy Boys. <laughs> Especially considering Ann's cheesecake. Don't let him fool you, Ellie. He's just as curious as we are. I think so, too. Yes, but curiosity kills. Remember? and tell him our Ouija board says the killer is around there someplace and all we have to do is find him. Find the killer. Go to Clover. Get the police. That sounds like what we're supposed to do, all right. You have to tell us more than that, Ouija. Clover Heights is a big area. I mean, we don't really even know if Clover means Clover Heights. Yeah, Ouija. you got to stop being so vague. Where exactly are we supposed to find the killer? Oh, you thought we were kidding, but it, but it looks like it's going to answer you. This better be good. The point is moving so fast, but, but it isn't spilling out anything. He's very agitated. Oh, maybe I hurt its feelings. Sorry, Ouija, old boy. Hey, it's, it's starting to spill something now. S K O L. Skull. <laughs> Well, now we know what the Ouija is. A thirsty Scandinavian. And he has a point. Why don't I fix us all a nightcap? Wait, wait. It's, got, it's spelling something more. S-K-O. School again. Ouija wants a double. No, no, no. no. It's circle back to O again. It's S-K-O-O-L. School. Do you think it means S-C-H? School spelled phonetically? There's school in Clover Heights. Yep. Right smack in the middle of it. The school was there to begin with. They're building the housing development around it. Now, that's something I didn't even know. Neither did I. And um, I would also think that even my subconscious would know how to spell school. All right. Assuming that school, however you spell it, is some kind of, well, let's say, legitimate clue, what does it mean? That the killer is hiding out there? Maybe. I don't know. Let's see if the board is going to tell us anything more. Uh, I'd almost just assume it didn't. Put your hands back on the pointer, Anne. I can feel, I can feel it beginning oh. to move already. A L L E Y. Allie. Correct spelling this time. There's more. H-O-U-S. That's all? No E? But it must mean house. Phonetic spelling again. School. Alley. House. We can drive over and see. See what? If there's an alley with the school. And if there's a house by the alley. And if there is? Well, the board said we should get the police. Oh, man, now I know I need a drink. The paper says the police are desperate for clues. Yeah, I don't think they mean that desperate. But uh, we can't just ignore all this information. I doubt that what you have would be classified as information. But according to the paper, the police are even following up on every crank call they're getting. Now, that's a classification you might qualify under. Look, all I know is I'm much too stimulated right now to just go to bed and forget all this, so, well... Why don't we uh, take a drive over to Clover Heights and, and just look around? Uh, all right. I think you both could do with a little fresh air. And if we can find a cozy bar afterwards, I could still do with that drink. 
Well, for what it's worth, here we are. Clover Heights. <sighs> it's so dark. I guess they haven't got all the electricity in yet. Not here, where the newer houses are going in anyway. Should be plenty of light up by the school, though. I hope so. Anyway, we're just going to drive through for a quick look-see. If there's a cop around, he's liable to haul us in for trespassing. Better a cop around than a killer. There's the school. Drive around it. See if there's an alley. All right. But there really isn't any point. There is an alley. Looks like it goes all the way behind the school. You could call it a driveway. I'd call it an alley. A very dark alley. Drive through. Let's just see. We will get taken in for trespassing. So, what are we proving? We found the alley, and on one side there's a school, and on the other side, look, a house. School alley, house. Not one of us has ever been here before, and how do you explain it? Uh, coincidence. And let's get out of here. Yes, let's. <laughs> but how can you explain it? I can't. And whenever anything happens that I can't explain, I figure it's a good time to have a drink. Let's go find that cozy corner bar I promised myself. Uh, <laughs> it's good to be inside where it's warm, at least. Yeah, I'd say the only thing this whole little escapade proves is my faithful old dog devotion to the fair end. For which I thank you. Again. <laughs> You have to admit, Ellie, Bill's been a brick to go along all the way with our fun and games tonight, hasn't he? Yeah. Ellie, what's the matter? I think we ought to tell the police. But what would you tell them? That, that your Ouija board told you all this? All right. So they think I was some kind of weirdo. But they would still check out the house, just in case. Find the killer. Go to Clover. Get the police. That is what the Ouija told us to do. The Ouija didn't tell me to do anything. And if you two are really serious about bothering the police with all this nonsense, I'm afraid you'll have to count me out. What happened to my faithful old dog? He'll sit right here with his keg of brandy around his neck and wait for you. Okay. Then can we borrow your car? All right. But remember, I won't have any way to get over and bail you out. the police station. I noticed it on our way into the Clover Heights. <sighs> now that we're here, <laughs> I'm not sure I have the nerve. The worst they can do is take us for a couple of claims. I know, but the paper did say they were desperate for food. So without any beauty, right? Right. Oh, I'm still right behind you. What time is it getting to be? Going on midnight. A perfect time for a murder. Well, at least we'll be safe inside the police station. If the death sergeant doesn't kill us when we tell him why we're here. Yes, can I help you? Um, we've come about the murders. The ones that have been in the newspapers so much lately? The sidewalk slasher, you mean? Yes. Well, if it's protection you're concerned about, young ladies, I'd suggest first off that you not be out on the streets alone this time of night with what's been going on. Oh, we, we have someone with us, uh, that is, he's waiting for us. He didn't think we should bother you with this, but we thought uh, that we should. And it's something to do with the murders? Yes. Now, have your names, please. Our names? Uh, it's routine for my entry log. Oh, yes, of course. I'm Ellie Sims, and this is Ann Benson. And that's Ann with an E. Mm. Right. Now, just what is this information you have regarding the murders? I don't know if you'd call it information, exactly. Sergeant, do you know what a Ouija board is? A Ouija board? Yes. That's where our information came from. A Ouija board? I know. You're probably thinking we're a couple of cranks. But we aren't, really. You see, I bought this Ouija board only this afternoon, just for fun... And tonight after dinner, we were asking it some perfectly harmless questions. Like uh, whether or not my boss was going to give me a raise. When it suddenly started giving us messages about the murderer. What kind of messages? It said, uh, find the killer. And that's all? No. Mm -hmm. That was only the first message. Then it told us to go to Clover. Which we figured out meant Clover Heights. 
Uh, how did you figure that? Well, uh, it was the only clover we could think of. And besides, later it said there was a school and, and an alley behind it. And a house. Just this one house behind the alley. I see. Uh, the Ouija board also told us to uh, get the police. Mm, it did. Yes, it did. Anyway, we thought we should come and relate all of this to you, just in case it might mean something. We, we, we didn't want to bother you or anything. Well, that's what we're here for, miss. I think maybe you better wait in the next room for a minute. But that's really all we have to tell you. Well, and my friend is waiting for us. You see, uh, he, he let us borrow his car and... Uh, we won't keep you for long. Uh, right in here, please. Someone will be right with you. What do you suppose he wants us to wait for? I don't know. Do you think we ought to telephone Bill? On TV, they always allow you one phone call. Oh, Anne, we're not under arrest. I don't think. Miss Sims? Yes. Yeah. And Miss Benson? Yes. Yeah. I'm Detective Lieutenant Connors. The desk sergeant told me a story. If you don't mind, I'd like to have you repeat it. Uh, about the Ouija board. I understand that's how you say that you came by the information which you relayed to the officer outside. You mean you don't believe that what we told him is the truth? Oh, but it is, Lieutenant. We were just fooling around with this silly game. Now, and... just a moment, Miss Benson. First of all, where did you get this, uh, what do you call it? Ouija board, Lieutenant. It's a kind of an old-fashioned parlor game that used to be popular several years ago. Before television. Where'd you get this particular one that you were, uh, as you say, fooling around with? I bought it just this afternoon at a toy store and shopping mall where I work. Well, what kind of work do you do? I'm the assistant manager of a bookstore. But I don't see why that... And you, Miss Benson? Uh, I'm a secretary for an advertising firm. And you were asking this Ouija board a question about your job, right? How did you... Oh, I guess I must have mentioned that to the desk sergeant. Yes, uh, I was asking it if um, I was going to get a raise. Well, did it answer you? No, it uh, started giving us these other messages instead. What are the messages? Can you remember them exactly? Yes, of course. The first thing it said was, find the killer. And you assumed this meant the so-called sidewalk slasher. Well, what other killer could it mean, Lieutenant? Those awful murders have all we've been reading and hearing about lately. And I just brought a newspaper home with the story of the latest murder on the front page. Mm, okay. So then did you ask this Ouija board where you were supposed to find the killer? Mm, not exactly. We only asked if it had any further message. And it did. It spelled out, go to Clover. Just Clover, not Clover Heights? That's right. But Clover Heights was the only Clover we could think of. Mm. All right, uh, then what? The next message after that was, uh, get the police. Which brought you here? No, uh, I mean, not right away. That is, we thought it was all too vague. So we asked Ouija, I mean the Ouija board, to be more specific. About what? About where in Clover Heights the killer was to be found. And was Ouija specific at this point? Yes. Mm. That is, it spelled out three clues, you might say. Which were? School, alley, house. Uh, I see. Anything else? No. That's when we decided to drive over to Clover Heights just to see if there was a school with an alley near it and a house. And there was. So then we thought that maybe we should come here and report all of this in case it would be of any interest to you. I assure you, it's of interest to us, Miss Sims. It is? Yes, in fact, I'm going to ask you both to accompany me to the location you've described. But, uh, is that necessary? I mean, we didn't you think... You didn't it. think what, Miss Sims? That we were going to take your story seriously? We weren't sure, but I guess we didn't really think you'd take it this seriously. Well, after all, Lieutenant, uh, the Ouija board is just a game. But murder is not, Miss Benson... Vincent Price again, and here's the concluding act of The Ouija Spells Murder. Is this the house you were referring to? Yes, Lieutenant. That is, it's the only house beside the alley. So we thought that it must be the one. According to this information you received? Yes. Uh, 
You two wait here a minute. Oh, Kenneth. I'll be right back. Oh. Uh, I, I, I didn't even want to come anywhere near this alley again. Even escorted by a detective. Funny. When we drove through here with Bill, he kept saying he felt the presence of a policeman. Poor Bill. He, he's, he's going to be so worried about us. Whatever we're here for shouldn't take too long. What are we here for, do you suppose? To wait while Lieutenant Connors checks out that house, I guess. Do you think he doesn't believe us? About the Ouija board, I mean. I don't know. But he seems to be taking our information seriously. However he thinks we got it. Where did he go? I don't know. It's too dark to see. Oh, I wish he'd hurry up and come back. Oh, I think I hear him coming now. Are you sure it's him? Quick, lock your door just in case. I can't find the box. Neither can I. Oh, Lieutenant, it is you. Oh, it's so dark out there. We couldn't be sure. The house is vacant. I'm going to look around. You both better come with me. Yes. I don't want to sit out here in this alley any longer. Neither do I. But I don't much want to go inside that house either. This way. You don't have any choice. In here. Mm. Electricity is not to use my flashlight. This isn't one of those new houses, is it? Uh-uh. Built as a small caretaker house at the time of the, the school was put up. I wonder how long it's been empty. I'm not sure that it is. What do you mean? A sleeping bag rolled up in the corner over there. <gasps> Nothing more than that, just a bedroll. I suppose he's here, right now. Well, we'll find out soon enough. Hold on. Let me check out this closet. second, I thought it was someone standing. Oh, I felt worse than that. No labels, nothing in the pockets. Something off the second-hand rack at a Goodwill store, I guess. You two can wait here if you want. I'm going to check out the other rooms. No, thanks. We're speaking right to you, Lieutenant, if you don't mind. Especially since there's only your flashlight to see by. All right, come on, then. Perhaps. But maybe not harmless. Maybe not. He might come back here at any time. It's possible, with the coat and the bedroll still here, but more likely he's sleeping it off in a drunk tank someplace. But you are going to try and find him and question him, aren't you, Lieutenant? After all, he could very well be the killer, couldn't he? You mean just as your Ouija board indicated, right? I know it sounds unlikely to you, Lieutenant Connors, no, but... It doesn't sound unlikely to me at all. That is, the transit who's been shacked up in this house could be the killer. Then the Ouija board might be right. We have, in fact, had this man under surveillance for some time now. But I don't understand, Lieutenant. Then why did you bring us here just to conduct this pretense of an investigation? The existence of this suspect and this area of investigation haven't been mentioned in any newspaper account, Miss Sims. So what I'd like to hear from you right now is a reasonable explanation of how you secured your information. But we told you, Lieutenant. I said a reasonable explanation, Miss Benson. But what we told you is the truth, Lieutenant Connors, and I still don't understand why you brought us here to this house where a man who is a suspect is... Was a suspect, Miss Sims. At the time of the latest sidewalk slashing, we had our transient friend in actual custody on a minor charge. But what about the time of the other murders? He has alibis which appear to hold water. We now consider him in the clear. Then why were you interested in our story at all, Lieutenant? If it was old news to you, if you'd already checked out this house and everything. There are two other developments which have also been withheld from the newspapers, which make your coming into our precinct tonight with this story of yours seem something more than coincidence. What are those two developments, Lieutenant? The body of the Slash's latest victim. It was found right here 
in this alley. Oh. Oh. No. No wonder I have such an awful feeling about this place. Oh, Ted, can we get away from here, please? And the other development, Lieutenant Connors? There is the indication of a possible involvement in this case by a member of our own department. Oh, you mean... Lieutenant, are you saying that the killer might actually be a police officer? <laughs> you both appear to find it hard to believe that an officer of the law could be subject to the same human flaws as any other man. Yes, I, I suppose so. Oh, my God. Uh, tell God. me, uh... The latest murder victim found at this location, Cynthia Baker. Are you certain neither of you were acquainted with her? Yes, th that is, I wasn't. And I'm sure... I, I wasn't either, Lieutenant. She worked as a secretary to Miss Fence. Yes, yes, I read that in the paper. All of the victims, they were young women of approximately the same age as yourself. Yes, we know. Unwisely venturing out on the city streets at night alone... As you, too, did this evening. But we were only trying to... Assist the police in their bumbling attempts to solve these horrendous crimes. <laughs> yes, of course. Lieutenant Connors, you should remember that the death sergeant knows that you brought us here. That's right, Lieutenant. Yes. Of course. I'd better be getting you back to the station now. to go in for a minute. The sergeant will need you to sign his report. Then will we be free to leave, Lieutenant? I still don't buy your story of being brought here tonight by some kind of mumbo-jumbo. But I've no cause to detain you any further. Which way do we go? Uh, this way. Now that door over there leads from the underground garage into the station. Uh, lobby's right through that door at the end of the hall. I have to get back to do some work in my office. Thank you, Lieutenant. Good night. Good night. Oh, Ellie, let's get out of here as quickly as we can. <laughs> Connors just buzzed me from his office. Uh, you're to sign my report. Yes. And then I suggest you both get right home and in off the streets as soon as possible. Don't worry. We will. Good night, Sergeant. Now, take care now. <laughs> Ellie, uh, I could have sworn that Lieutenant Connors back in that house in the alley. He acted so strange. No. Do you think the killer could be a policeman? Let's just get in the car and get away from here. All right. <sighs> I never want anything to do with a Ouija board again. Oh, I hope my old faithful dog <laughs> gives enough fun as again. Don't move or scream, either of you. I have a knife poised at the back of one of your lovely necks. Oh, Lieutenant Connor. Oh, I'm so sorry. As a police officer, I should have cautioned you... Before getting into your car, particularly on a dark, lonely night, always make sure that no one is waiting for you in the back seat. Lieutenant, Stop the car, Miss Benson. And drive until I tell you to stop. Thank God it scared off the lieutenant. Ed, Ellie, are you all right? Oh, Bill, how did you get here? In that cab. We pulled up just as you were pulling away. And just in time for our headlights to catch the glint of that knife at your neck. It was chancy, but the quickest thing we could think of to do. Thank goodness it was. Bill, that man with the knife, he's a police officer. He got away. No. The cabbie brought him down with the best flying tackle I've ever seen. Oh, Bill, it's so lucky you came. How did you happen to come just at the right time? It was closing time. I got locked out of the bar. <laughs> I hope you 
you two have learned your lesson from this. No more messing around with the occult. Right? Right. I'm even going to give up my tarot cards and go back to solitaire. But it is amazing. The Ouija board actually directed us. First, to the house of a legitimate suspect and the alley where the latest victim was found. And then, to the killer himself. I just assumed the Ouija hadn't gone that far. I wonder. I wonder what? What the Ouija board would have to say now. Oh, I thought you said you were swearing off. Good night, folks. This is where I came in. Oh, stick around a few more minutes, Bill, and see what happens. We'll just give Ouija one more quick try. Come on, Anne. Well, all right. But I still think we may be tempting fate. Shh. Close your eyes and concentrate. It's moving already. Oh, man. Here we go again. What is it, Meiji? Do you have another message for us? C. C. L. 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 P. O-L-I-C. Police. Tell police. No. No more police tonight. Wait a minute, Bill. This might be important. Yes, yes. Maybe we'll need to borrow your car again. C-L-U-C. Blood. Blood. Phonetic spelling again, remember? Tell police blood O N on. Tell police blood on... I don't want to know. No more Ouija. to Sears Radio Theater. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. The Ouija Spells Murder was written by Shirley Gordon. Produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Stand by for crime. Chuck Morgan, KOP newscaster speaking. You know, there are a few of us who realize the tragedy of the displaced person. To appreciate just how tough it really is. Imagine yourself having to leave the place of your birth. Severing connections with all relatives and friends and being set down in a new and strange land where no one even speaks your language. It's not pleasant to think about, is it? Well, here in Los Angeles, we have our quota of DPs. It just happens that my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis, goes on frequent welfare kicks. Which is why when I arrived at my office last Wednesday morning, I was given some first-hand information about our local DPs. You're like 90% of the people in this town, Chuck Morgan. You just haven't a sense of responsibility. I haven't? Oh, by the way, that typewriter guy fixed my machine? Chuck, you aren't listening. Oh, sure I am, Grandma. Let's go ahead and talk. Yeah, seems to be running all right. I see A year ago, you made a hero out of yourself, raving about how we should bring the DPs over here and give them a new start in life. And now that we've got them here, you don't care that they're being blackmailed. You know, Glamour, sometimes... What do you mean, blackmailed? Just what I said. It's the most disgraceful thing that was ever done in the name of American democracy. There are five families of displaced persons living in a tenement house on Bulletin Street, and every one of them is paying so-called protection money to a gangster named Igor Petrov. Are you kidding? What's he protecting them against? Against harm being done to their relatives who are still behind the Iron Curtain? No. It's terrible. Those poor people don't understand. They think that Petrov actually has a pipeline to Joe Stalin. Not one of them makes more than a bare living wage, and to have to turn half of it over to a dirty... Half of it? Yes, half of it. And what's being done to stop such an outrage? Nothing. Because people like you... All right, wait a minute, Grandma. Let's take it easy. If such conditions exist, someone would have heard about it before. Now I haven't gone to the police. The police... Oh, Chuck, don't you know what the word police means to those people? What does it mean? It means beatings and being thrown into a concentration camp and being tortured. It means everything but what it should mean. Justice. Hmm. 
So this small-time gangster has got them coming and going, huh? He knows they won't go to the police, and he's got them scared into paying off to him or else. It's about the lousiest racket in the book. Hello, Patty. Come in. Hello, Chuck. Morning, Carol. Hi, Pappy. Say, Chuck, mm-hmm. you got anything hot for your first broadcast tonight? Because if you haven't, I have. Yeah? What's that? A murder. You see? Another routine murder. Pappy, look, Carol's come up with something that's really... There's burning. nothing routine about this murder. The victim's name is Jan Darvis. He is, or was, a displaced person living down on Bulletin Street. It seems he went to the police to complain about some kind of a holdup being pulled on him, and he was liquidated. Happy Mansfield is owner of KLP. Usually he lets me alone regarding the nature of the stuff I use on my broadcast. But occasionally he gets into a sweat about a particular story and demands that I give it the full treatment. Well, he got into a sweat about this one. Which accounts for the fact that five minutes after he denounced the murder of Jan Darvis, Carol and I were on our way to Bulletin Street. We found Bill Meggs at police headquarters and a couple of uniformed cops at the scene of the murder, which was an alley behind a pool hall. Hello, Bill. Oh, hi, Chuck. Hello, Carol. Hello, Bill. I wondered when you two would be along. Pappy tell you I called? Yeah, he told us. That's where they found the body, eh? Yes, only it wasn't a body when they found it. Darvis was still alive. He didn't die till they got him to the hospital. Did he say anything before he died? Well, he told us he'd gone to a policeman about the protection money he'd been forced to pay. And that's why he was beaten up. Did he tell you the policeman's name? Nope. But we'll find out. Bill, you don't think this policeman had... Sure I do. And don't give me that shocked look. We cops aren't all lily-white any more than everybody in every other business is. So far, we've a pretty clean record. It's going to be cleaner when I get my hands on this particular cop. Any clues, Bill? Well, yes. A set of brass knuckles, for one. Yeah. Blood on them, too, huh? Oh, what horrible-looking things. Not pleasant, that's for sure. You got any theories worked out, though? Yeah, I have. From the looks of Darvis's body, I figure that whoever beat him up didn't intend to kill him. I'm just going to use him as an example for the rest of the DPs. Yeah. That's why whoever called emergency hospital and reported the thing wasn't interfered with. I get it. They wanted someone to call the hospital. That's right. This uh, Petrov character is too small time to risk getting mixed up with murder. Have you had Petrov picked up? Not yet. Most we could do is hold him for 24 hours for questioning. Yeah. I don't suppose any of the other DPs will talk. No. It's the same old story. They're scared stiff. They don't want the same thing to happen to them or their families. A rotten mess. Bill, what are you going to do about it? Just what you and every other representative American would expect me to do, Carol. I'm going to find the murderer of Jan Darvis and send him to the gas chamber. It's going to be a tough job, Bill. Anything we can do to help. I know something we can do to help right now. Yeah? What's that? Have you talked to Anna Darvis yet? She's Jan's mother. No. That's where I plan to go from here. Well, don't. Let Chuck and me see her first. She's frightened of the police. She has another child, a 12-year-old girl, and she's terrified of what might happen to her. But look, if she won't talk to me... I know her, Bill. I've been calling on her once a month for almost a year. She trusts me. Maybe I can persuade her that the police in America are different, but they actually want to help her. That sounds like a good deal, Bill. At least you can't lose anything, huh? Yeah, maybe you're right. Okay... You two go up and have a talk with the lady and report your findings to me at headquarters. Bulletin Street is one of those crummy districts that few of our respected citizens are aware exist. As Carol and I walked along that dirty, noisy pavement, I marveled at the fact that she'd been making trips down here all by herself once a month just to check on our DPs and other unfortunate families. Well, we came to a two-story adobe tenement house that was sandwiched in between two larger but equally disreputable-looking frame buildings. We went inside. We walked up a flight of dusty stairs, down a short hall, and stopped in front of a door that was hanging on one hinge with a latch sprung. What happened here? Looks as though someone broke the door down. It wasn't like this when I was here yesterday. This... Yeah. <laughs> It's Anna, poor thing. Let's go in. We pushed open what remained of the door and entered the tiniest living room I've ever been in. A single window opened onto an air shaft. The room itself was spotless. 
The furniture, though old, was neat and in good taste. Snowy white curtains were at the window. To the right, a door led to the kitchen. What we could see of it was as meticulously clean as the living room. It was in this room that we heard the sobbing. It had stopped now. There was an ominous silence. We crossed to the kitchen and entered. A woman, perhaps 50 years old, was seated at the table. Her face was bruised and bloody. One eye was blackened. The look she gave us was wild and terrified. Oh, Anna, what happened? Oh, you poor thing. Go away, please. Do not stay here. But we want to help you. That's why we came. No. Everyone is evil in this wicked America. Do you think that I am evil, Anna? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... I cannot say anything. What happened to your face, Anna? Nothing. It is nothing. Oh, Anna, this is Chuck Morgan. He's a radio newscaster. He wants to help you, and so do the police. The police? Now, we understand why you feel the way you do, Anna, but if we're going to help you, you must tell us what happened. No. Telling would not bring back my Jan. My Jan is dead. Now I have only little Maria. Poor little Maria. She is so frightened. It is like in the concentration camps. But then we always had the dream of coming to America. It was a beautiful dream, America. If it were not for that dream, most of us would have died. And now, now... Please, Anna, please. Where is Maria now, Anna? No, I will not tell. The evil men will not help my little Maria. They can kill me and I will not tell. Anna, perhaps if oh, you wait knew... Wait a minute, what... Chuck. Anna, you trust me, don't you? You have been kind, Miss Curtis. Of all the people, you have been kind. And if I were to make you a promise, you know I'd keep it. I will not tell. I will not. Anna, the only way we can help you as we want to do is to have your cooperation. We understand how you feel, how much afraid you are. We don't want anything to happen to Maria either. That's why I suggest that you let us take you away from here. You and Maria both. Take us away? Away from them? Yes, away from them. I have an apartment up on Wilshire Boulevard. You can stay there. Miss Curtis will stay with you. We'll have a half a dozen policemen guarding the place until this rotten mess is cleaned up. Then i not have to stay here alone. It's a promise, Anna. You have my word for it. But first, you must tell us what happened. Yes, then I will tell you. It was last night, about nine o'clock, I think. I was alone here in our home. Someone knocked on the door. Please. Never mind who it is. Open up this door before I break it down. No, this is my home. You cannot come in. Oh, I can't, eh? Don't tell me what I can't do, old lady. In this district, Igor Petrov goes where he pleases and no one stops him, see? Then you are Igor Petrov? You heard me. Where's that yellow livered kid of yours? If you mean Jan, he is not here. Now you must go. I'll go when I get ready. Oh, no, please. You must not break our furniture. We have so little. Eh? Well, you're going to have a lot less when I get through. Where's the kid? I do not know. Oh. Where is he? No, please. My boy is not here. He's hiding. Where? I will not tell you. I will not. Listen, you old buzzard. I ain't got much time. That red-faced brat of yours went to the cops. He squealed. Don't tell me you didn't know about that. Yes. My boy did go to the police. I am proud of him for doing that. He is brave, my Jan. He wants what is right and no more. He, he does not think that here in America it is right for evil men to take any part of money that is hard earned by honest people. This America is to us a wonderful land. And we believe the police will protect us if we tell them the truth. Yeah? <laughs> Well, let me tell you something, old lady. The cop your kid squealed to is on my payroll. Get that? He does what Igor Petrov says. So does everybody else in this district. I'm boss here. Nobody crosses me. Nobody. And that goes for that punk kid of yours. Now, where is he? I will never tell. Never. No? When I get through with you, you'll tell or you'll think that concentration camp you were in was a bed of roses. Where is he? No. Oh. Where is he? 
Horrible. Yes, it was horrible. Was I think in the camps? Do you tell me your son was Anna? No. Jan came home while Petrov is still here. He is a little man, my Jan. He was no match for the man who was beating me. How awful! Did Petrov take Jan away? Yes, he took Jan away. And now my Jan is dead. <laughs> Anna, no one can blame you for your present opinions of Americans. Except for Carol, our people haven't been very well represented among those you've met. That's going to change, beginning right now. Carol, I want you to pick up Maria, wherever she is, and take both her and Anna out to my apartment. I'll phone Bill Meggs, tell him the story, and ask him to send some cops out. All right. But, Chuck... Yeah? What are you going to do? I'm going to make a call. Yeah, that's it. I'm going to make a call... I want to demonstrate to a certain district gang boss that here in America we don't tolerate gutter rats. Now, the conclusion of Stand By for Crime. News people learn to get hard-boiled about human suffering and human weaknesses. They have to. If they didn't, they wouldn't last long. But every once in a while, you run across something that hits you personally, and it's different. Then you cease to be a newsman for a little while and become yourself. That's what happened to me after listening to Anna Darvis' story. It affected me personally because I was an American, and Igor Petrov was representing himself as an American. And when I thought of it, I felt unclean. There was a fighting desire inside of me to correct the situation, so I wouldn't be ashamed of being a citizen of these United States. All right, maybe I wasn't using my head, but that's all right, too. I was boiling mad when I opened the door of the joint that Igor Petrov called his headquarters. The place seemed deserted. Then a human rat came shuffling out of the gloom and leered up at me. Hello, Morgan. Looking for somebody? Well, if it isn't little Benny Kapek, San Quentin's latest contribution to the scum of society. Lay off, Morgan. You can't talk to me like that. Ain't easy pushover I was two years ago. Oh, you ain't, ain't you? For my money, K. Peck, you always be a cross between a weasel and a wharf rat. What have you done? Tied in with Petrov? Yeah. Yeah, I've tied in with Petrov. Which means that neither you nor the cops can touch me. No? Wouldn't you be surprised if you found you bought yourself another ticket to San Quentin? Where is that tin horn boss of yours? I want to see him. What did I tell him you want to see him about? I want to remind him how to act when he talks to a lady. Out of my way, slime face, before I start in on you. you... Come back here. You can't go in there. Okay, Peck, this is all I needed for an excuse. Hello, Petrov. Morgan, who let you in here? I invited myself. Rat, come from behind that desk, brother. This is something I'm going to enjoy. Why, you? Take back, spider! That's right. Call your rats, but first I want to give you a little lesson in good manners. Am I getting my point across, Petrov? Boys, help! Get back! Calling yourself an American. <laughs> Why, you aren't fit to lick the boots of those people. Help! Boys! Okay, help. boss! Coming! Come on, boys! Get him! Get him! Get me get 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 but, Bill, Chuck's been gone almost three hours. That means he's either in trouble or dead. How can you and Pappy calmly sit here smoking cigarettes and not even worry about him? I am worried about him. When he called me on the phone, he asked me if I'd give him until 6 o'clock before I picked up Petrov. Said he had a plan. Chuck's plans usually pay off, Carol. Oh, not always. Boy, I've seen him so beaten up, he looked as though he'd been run through a meat grinder. I didn't say he didn't get himself worked over occasionally. He's a glutton for it. But he usually gets what he goes after. Oh, you men. We have Mrs. Darvis' story. Isn't that enough to arrest Petrofon, for heaven's sake? She was an eyewitness. Not to Jan Darvis' murder. That's why Chuck wanted some time. He thinks he can get the information that'll pin the murder rap on Petrov. My guess is he'll do it, too. Mine do. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Carol, why don't you quit saying for heaven's sakes and just sit down and relax? Relax? How would you feel if your boyfriend were in danger of being murdered? I haven't got a boyfriend. 
That's not very funny, Pappy. Sorry. Oh, forget it. i tell you what I'll do, Carol. If we don't hear from Chuck within the next 15 minutes, all three of us will take a run down to Bulletin Street and have a look around. Okay? Do I have a choice of answers? 15 minutes isn't long to wait. The chances are, right now, Chuck is on his way back here with Petrov as his prisoner. And a full confession in his pocket. <laughs> Take it easy, Morgan. You live. Uh, oh, Capek. Yeah, yeah, Capek. Only now the situation's a little different. Ain't it, Morgan? You dirty brat, untie my hands. Yeah, I'm apt to untie your hands. Oh. Having fun, Capek? Yeah. Yeah, I'm having me a dandy time, boss. Petrov, if you had a brain in your head, you'd know you couldn't get away with it. I've got a brain in my head, and I am getting away with this. You ready to talk, Morgan? About what? You know about what. Now you hit the old lady and the kid. I've already told you, they're in my apartment on Wilshire. There are seven cops guarding the place. And I say there ain't no one in your apartment on Wilshire. And I say there is. And why don't they answer the phone? Maybe they don't want to. If they're not in my apartment, they're at police headquarters. Why don't you call the chief? Okay, Morgan, suit yourself. Ready to play some more, Kepek? Boss, ain't nothing I'd rather do. All right, you got 15 minutes. Make him talk in that time or you and me is going to have an understanding. Oh, I'll make him talk. Just leave me alone with him. I got my own particular methods. So Petrov went out of there and Kepek began having his fun. Only this time I wasn't as cooperative as before. I passed out almost at once or pretended to. This made Kepek mad. There wasn't any fun beating an unconscious man. But it also gave me time to think. I told Bill Meggs I had a plan. That was partly to keep Bill away from Bulletin Street until I had had a go at this deal myself. And partly because there had been an idea in the back of my head. But what was it? At the time, I'd been too mad to analyze its worth. Then I remembered the brass knuckles that Bill had found. What about them? There'd been dried blood in those knuckles. Sure, sure, that was it. Dried blood. Well, it wasn't much of a plan. But in my present situation, who was I to be choosy? I cautiously opened one eye and saw Capex sitting two feet away, watching me. Okay, Morgan. You ready for some more? Hold it, Capex. I've got something to say. You bit ahead. Go on. Talk. What about the brass knuckles? Huh? What about the brass knuckles? They're going to prove that you murdered Jan Davis. They're going to send you back to San Quentin. This time with a reserve seat in the gas chamber. He ain't going to prove nothing. Now cut Wait out... Wait a minute. There was blood on those knuckles, Capek. Your blood. So how's anybody going to prove that? Easy. The cops will take a sample of your blood, compare it with the blood on the brass knuckles, and you'll be charged with murder. Hey, you're crazy. Anyway, they want my knuckles. I didn't have nothing to do with... With what, Capek? None of your business. Now, are you going to so see... So far, I... you've been nothing but a small-time operator, k -Pack. Murder's out of your line. The only way you can save yourself from the gas chamber is to tell me who owns those brass knuckles. Turn me loose. Shut up, but I won't do it. I can save you from the gas chamber, k -Pack. I'm the only one who can. Petrov will double-cross you in a minute. The cops are on their way here right now. You haven't got much time. You kidding me, Morgan? I'm giving it to you straight. Mrs. Davis has already told her story to the police. The only reason you and Petrov haven't been picked up yet is because they didn't have proof of the murder. Now they've got it with the blood on those brass knuckles. And you'll see that I don't get no murder rap? Yes. I, I don't want to take no rap for nothing I didn't do. Then you won't. It's a promise. Okay, Morgan. I'll take a chance. And if you pull across on I me... I never pulled across on anybody in my life. Now hurry up. We haven't got much time. I held my breath while Capek worked on the ropes for fear he changed his mind. One hand came free. The little weasel was working on the last knot of the second hand when the door opened. What the devil? Take it easy, Petrov. Kapek and I have made a deal. He's going to turn state's evidence on you, and I'm going to see that he doesn't take a rap for a murder you committed. Why? Come you... on, Kapek, let's get him. You're a lousy shot. Too bad because you won't get a chance for another. <laughs> well, Pappy, Bill Meg's glamorous. Fancy meeting you here. <laughs> Anna 
Lieutenant Davis and her daughter Maria are back in their tiny apartment on Bulletin Street. They like it there. To them, it's heaven compared to what they've been used to. They like America, too. The American way of life. Their dream has really come true. They'll make good citizens. Petrov is awaiting trial for murder. There's no longer any district gang boss on Bulletin Street. There never will be again if Bill Meggs has anything to do with it. And Bill has a lot to do with such things. Speaking of Bill, after my 7 o'clock broadcast that night, he and Carol, Pappy and I, went over to Mike Lyman's for dinner. Say, Chuck, before we leave here, I've got just one question I'd like to ask you. Yeah, yeah and after you answer that one, I've got a question, too. And at the risk of sounding parrot-like, I have a question also. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, Pappy. About this dried blood gimmick, comparing it with a sample of blood taken from a person. Who told you that a comparison would establish identity? Nobody. Then how'd you know? I didn't. Does it? You see, you don't know either. So how could Capek be expected to know? You mean you just made that one up out of thin air because it sounded like a good idea? Why, sure. Now, what's your question, Bill? How about that deal you made with Capek? What right had you to promise him he wouldn't have to take a murder rap if he turned state's evidence? Because I have a friend on the police force who's a very nice guy and who I knew would stand behind me. His name is Bill Meggs. Oh, yeah. You see, you can't win with this man. He talks his way out of everything. And now, at last but not least, we come to your question, Glamour What is it? Oh, never mind. I just answered it myself. Oh? When I said you can't win with this man, or can I? Well, of course. As far as I'm concerned, you won three years ago. The day I hired you, remember? Oh, Chucky boy, you say the nicest thing. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, unknown to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime is now transcribed for radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Hey, what's what going on here? here? This is my car here. Uh, oh. No, no, no. Hey, Stop it. hey, cut it out. Stop it. What's the idea? Now let that man alone. Look, you keep out of this, buddy, or I'll... Oh, that ain't the sink. <laughs> it's euphonic, but slightly ungrammatical, Mac. Now, what's the disturbance? Uh, they drew up alongside of my car. Him and the other fella, they said get out. We're taking your car. Why, Mac wouldn't do a thing like that, now would you, Mac? No. Of course not. The old man's nuts. What Mac would do if he coveted his neighbor's jalopy is slug him with a piece of lead pipe and drive off. Yeah, so good night. I'll get this. Now, wait, Mac. You could satisfy my curiosity a little. Why should you want to steal this gentleman's old automobile when you've got nicer, newer ones to choose from? Yes, sir. Uh, ask him, mister. Ask him. Yeah, ask me, sir. Go ahead. I'm going to satisfy a little curiosity of my own. I didn't think you had any, Mac. <laughs> what shape does it take? I always wondered how you'd look dead. Good night, all. Good night, man. Be seeing you. You, you let him go. Yes, he convinced me that I should for now. There's nothing like a thirty-two in the pocket of a known thug for winning an argument. Did you uh, say there was another fellow with him? Uh, yes, uh, run off when he heard you coming. It was the same fellow tried to buy my car yesterday. Someone tried to buy this <laughs> this car. Oh, sure. This fellow tried to buy it. And there was a woman made an offer, too. You mean you actually refused? I ain't selling until I find out why they want to buy it so bad. This fellow who tried to buy the car, do you know his name? No, he he looked like a gentleman until... Until you found him consorting with felonous intent with our just-departed friend, eh? <laughs> Tell me, was he uh, well-dressed and annoying little mustache placed just over the sneer he wears for a mouth? Well, well yes. Say, how did you... That's easy. Our friend Mac does piecework for him. Fancy Dan Turner is his current alias. And But I see you don't keep up with such things. You're going to tell the police? Later, perhaps, when there's something to tell them. Right now, I've got a great thirst that needs quenching. Thirst for knowledge. Huh? Yeah, what's your name and where do you live? Uh, Collins. Uh, 302 East 8th Street. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Now, put your car in cold storage, old time, and take care of yourself. Something tells me this is Rat's Night Out. Hello, Smitty. Back making book, I see. He's at the wrong joint, Saint. Take a look around. I run a pool room. You interested in a horse? No, no, a man. Well, like I said, Saint, you got the wrong joint. His name's Mac. He hangs out here. Now, where is he? In the back room? I'm the three monkeys, Saint. Deep, dumb, and blind. The only Mac I know is a truck. Oh, then if you don't mind, I'd like to look in your back room and see if he's parked there. I mind. But you won't even know, Smitty. You're deep, dumb, and blind. Oh, have a heart, Saint. I ain't got no back room. Besides, last time you dropped in my place, a, a lot of my customers started patronizing elsewhere. Including you, Smitty, remember? I've only been back from the gray place a week, and I ain't forgetting it. Oh, come on, Saint. Be a good guy. Beat it, huh? No, no, Smitty. Let him stay a while. Hello, Mac. I was hoping you were smart enough to go home and get some sleep. How could I sleep with you out roaming the streets, Mac? You know how I worry. Yeah, yeah. Too much. What does he want, Smitty? You. Why, Saint? I want to talk with Fancy Dan Turner. What about... Now, let's not be coy, Mac. It doesn't become you. I want to ask Turner why he's trying to steal a jalopy from an old man. Well, what do you know? I got a surprise for you, Saint. I'll take it to him. say you're looking for me, Saint. Mm, the boys are right. So you found me. So? I understand you're interested in a certain old car. So what? Probably the smiling Irishman is, too. A broken down 1929 sedan seems a little slow for a fast man like you, Fancy Dan. Well, maybe I like to go slow enough to read the billboards when I drive. What's it to you, Saint? That depends on what it is to you, Turner. What's on the fire? You are... There's a handle with care sign on this deal, and I don't want just anybody cutting in. You're a fouler upper. You've been stepping high and fancy free too long, Tony. You're beginning to irritate me. The feeling's likewise, Saint. Only I got more than fingers in my fist, and you haven't. Hmm, it's a nice gun you're so bravely wearing, Turner. It must be a pretty big pot to change a small time con artist like you into a fire breathing gunman. Big potatoes, huh? Yeah, plenty big, Saint. So big, I wouldn't hesitate to shoot at the slightest move. Am I clear? You couldn't be clearer if you were a day ordered by the Chamber of Commerce. Good. Oh, it ain't a palace saint. It's just the back room of a pool parlor. But please stay and be my guest. Oh, very well. For a little while, anyway. Where are the boys? Out. They're wasting their time. Collins won't sell his old wreck. Some old men are stubborn. And Collins seems like a hard man to intimidate. Well, that all depends on who's doing the intimidating, saint. Now, Max a chowderhead, and Smitty's even worse, but put the two boys together, and you'll get a job of work done. Dan, I've adopted old man Collins as a friend. Ah, oh, how big are you? Yes. And you know how I feel about people who push other people around, Turner? Especially when the guy getting the shoving is a friend. You know, if I had a glass of beer, I'd cry into it. Sit back and relax, Saint. The boys will be back with what they want after soon enough, and maybe then I'll let you go home. You mean they're coming back with a car? Well, maybe not the whole car. Sit back and relax. Hey, relax. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Sitting back with my chair to the wall, Turner. You want me to relax, don't you? Yeah, I... Hey, let go of that cue stick. <laughs> I... As my old grandmother used to say, Turner, there's nothing as relaxing as a game of pool. <laughs> Particularly with a hoodlum's head as the cue ball. <laughs> Collins, Collins, open up. You, uh, you wouldn't be from the police now, would you? No, no, I'm no more a policeman than you are, old man Collins. <laughs> Come in and be welcome, Dad. Oh. Where's Collins? The old man. He's here. Where? Behind the sofa. But if you're of a mind to look at him, make us a quick look. Dead? Very. How? Every way. Beaten, stabbed, and tortured. 
Maybe even shot, for all I know. Yes, and for all I know, maybe you've got a gun with an empty chamber, for all I know. Bless me, no. Me business doesn't allow it. <laughs> Just what sort of business are you in, Irish? The name's O'Brien. Ah. When a job is pulled, and the police go after the boys who pull it, I make an end run and go after the swag. Or at least part of it. Oh, I see. Uh, what's the swag here? Collins' wallet? Not unless there's 400 grand in it. 400 Oh, no, I'm afraid you'll find the old man a few cents short. Who killed him? Not I. How do I know? You don't. You're right. What brought you here? Why, I'm here about the old car, of course. You want to buy it? Certainly, don't you? Say, maybe you're not being cute. Maybe you really don't know about the... About what? Well, no. <laughs> I'm greatly relieved. When I first saw you come through that door, I said to myself, O'Brien... Oh, here comes some more competition. But I see you're not. I am relieved, laddie. <laughs> Greatly relieved. Turner is competition enough, eh? Yes, but Turner and his ugly ducklings are nothing compared to... Who? In time. I got here just a minute before you, laddie. The old man was dead when I arrived. Beyond that, I know nothing. Get down. Oh, O'Brien! O'Brien! Competition. Getting worse. All the time. Please, call the doctor. No, no, no. Uh, thanks, laddie. Lay, lay off this frolic. He'll get you next. You're gonna die, mister. You're gonna... Oh, Brian. Oh, Brian, the old man's car, what... Well, I guess I'll have to try another angle. This one's pretty dead. <laughs> I awakened Mr. Ritchie as you requested, Mr. Templer. He'll be right down. Oh, thank you. I hope the fire isn't too serious, sir. Well, it's serious enough to awaken Mr. Ritchie. Oh, oh, here he is now, sir. Well, well, which plant is the fire in? Who's responsible? How big is the damage? Oh, the fire isn't in any plant, Mr. Ritchie. What's that, then? Then, then where? It's where? inside of me. I'm burning up and I need your help. How dare you sneak your way in here at three o'clock in the morning by telling me there's a fire? Look here, who are you? Simon Templer. Oh. Oh, yes. The saint. Hmm. I've heard of you. If you have business with me, Mr. Templer, I suggest you phone my secretary for an appointment. Meanwhile, there's no subject on earth can keep me from going back to bed. Not even the subject of $400,000, Mr. Ritchie? What do you know about it? Nothing other than that it was stolen from you, Mr. Ritchie. That happened seven years ago. The criminal, John Qualey, was caught, tried, and convicted. Now, if you'll pardon uh, me... Qualey I... worked for you, I believe. He was my head accountant. And the money was never found? No. Qualey drew 20 years in the penitentiary. He never revealed where the money was hidden. Until the day he died. Died? Yes. Two weeks ago in prison. <laughs> and uh, now, Mr. Templer, if you don't mind, I need my arrest. I won't detain you much longer, Mr. Ritchie. Just one or two more questions. Well? Uh, did Qualey have a wife? Yes, he did. If he knew he were dying in prison, it's quite possible he made an attempt to get word to her, to tell her where the money was hidden. He may have made the attempt, but he couldn't possibly have succeeded. He was too closely watched. Oh. After all, $400,000 is a lot of money. A lot of money. Yes, you could almost buy a second-hand car with it. If I hadn't been fully covered by insurance, my firm would have gone under in the face of a loss that large. And uh, now, Mr. Templer, if I might ask a question. Certainly. Why this sudden urgency? This three o'clock in the morning business? An old man was tortured to death. Then a fellow named O'Brien, who came calling on the old man, was shot to death. But, but, Before but, but... he was killed, O'Brien told me he was tracking down $400,000 that had been stolen. Oh, I see. Yeah, and some checking back over how many people have ever had that amount stolen from Led them. you to me? Yes. I wonder what I've led you to, Mr. Templer? I wonder, Mr. Ritchie. I wonder. <laughs> Is it? Mrs. Quayley? What do you want? Several things, Mrs. Quayley. Like what? A murderer. You've got the wrong apartment, mister. An old automobile. No sale. Anything else? Maybe you'll buy this, Mrs. Quayley. Collins was murdered a little while ago. Collins? Hmm. Oh, the old man. Why? Someone wanted his car. Someone who evidently couldn't wait any longer for the newer models. So? So I saw Collins' car in your garage, Mrs. Quayley. 
Maybe you better come in after all, Miss. Come in careful. Careful enough? Keep those hands high. Yeah. I don't like you, mister. You're nailing together a frame and you're trying to put my picture into it. Colin sold me that car. When? Tonight. I could have bought a Cadillac for cheaper, mister, but I wasn't in any position to haggle. Yes, I know. What do you know? That's what I want to find out. I know that Colin's car, the car, is worth about $20, but if something else is worth in the neighborhood of $400,000. And you know that's an awfully nice neighborhood. Nice and exclusive. Chiselers aren't invited to move in. Mm, I've been gathering that impression all evening. Well, what if we're here? You name it. An acetylene torch, welder's mask, a few chisels, a hammer, steel wire. <laughs> Either you've gone to work for Henry Kaiser or the hand that customarily rocks the cradle is going in for rocking a safe. I had to go into a hardware store to make a phone call, and I just couldn't leave without buying a few things. How fortunate you didn't make your call in an establishment that sells steamrollers. Ah, I see you have a set of license plates. You see too much. From Collins Jalopy, aren't they? He's licensed. So that's how Qualey smuggled out his message. You're getting awfully close to a bullet in your head, mister. Give me those plates. Shh, there's someone at the door. Stay where you are. I'll see who it is. Better not take the license plates with you. Yes? Oh! Mrs. Qualey! Oh! Mrs. The devil. The devil. He... He got the plates? Yes, yes, he got them. Don't let him. Oh, Catch him there. Where? Where? Where Johnny worked. Shaft. Shot. Before six. Before... Uh-huh. Mrs. Quayley. Uh, Collins, O'Brien, and now... Now I have three reasons for wanting to meet a certain party. <laughs> Taxi! Hey, hey, taxi, taxi! They, uh, don't stop sometimes huh? when it's so early in the morning, Saint, because they're on the way back to the garage. Well, what brings you out so early, Mac? Looking for a drunk to roll? Just looking for you, Saint, just looking for you. See here what I got in my hand? Oh, there goes that coy streak in you again, Mac. All right, so it's a gun. Well, what does it want me to do? Come, go, turn handsprings, quote Shelley, play the bassoon? <laughs> you have to speak for it, Mac. Very funny. Look out, it shouldn't speak for itself, Saint. I and the gun, one you should get in that there car. Yeah, you have a most persuasive way of offering a fellow a lift, Mac. Yeah, yeah, a lift. Right now, it's a lift. Later on, it may grow into a ride. Hmm. Come on. Uh, where are we going, Mac? Back to our little gray home in the rear of the pool room, Saint. Fancy Dan Turner wants he should thank you for showing him a new trick. Oh, it really isn't necessary. He feels like it is, Saint. He feels like it is. He's got a couple of tricks he wants to show you. Sounds like fun. Oh, on, right, there's a car, Jim. Turner's waiting. He's got very little patience. Nice to have you back with us, Saint. I missed you. <laughs> From the looks of that bandage on your skull, Turner, I'll bet you wish I'd missed you. Not now, I don't, Saint. It's a nice feeling having you here, knowing that I owe you something. I pay my debts, Saint. I pay off. Yes, I know. O'Brien was paid off. So was Mrs. Qualey. Paid off with lead checks. They're dead? Oh, and I save that innocent expression for the jury, Turner. You'll need everything you've got. Well... When were they killed, Saint? Okay, I'll stooge for you. They were killed an hour or two after I so abruptly left you before. Oh, well, I'll have to find another pigeon, Saint. My alibi's fat. How fat, Turner? City Hospital. Having remembered the Saint embroidered where a cue stick hit me. And Smitty and Mac were there, too, to see me through it. Hospitals have records, Saint. We're clean. We're clean. Huh. Then you've got a competitor you don't know about, Turner. Yeah, looks that way. For a job that was supposed to be as simple as this one, I got too many competitors. I wonder how come. Who fingered the job for you, Turner? Who told you Qualey got word out to his wife about where the money was? I got nothing for you, Saint. Smitty, wasn't it? Smitty just finished a stretch up the creek. My guess is he ran into Qualey, maybe shared a cell with him. No. It was in the jail hospital they met. 
Smitty worked there. Quayle was dying off his nut. Smitty made him talk. Yeah, and Smitty not being mentally suited for solo work spilled the pitch to you, Turner, for a price, of course, for money on the line. Yeah, 10 G's to buy in on a 400,000 job. But what are you driving at? What are you picking Smitty's bones for? I was just wondering, Turner, how much O'Brien paid Smitty for his slice of this exclusive information and how much your other competitors shelled out. The one who happily goes around killing people. What do you mean? If you ask me, Turner, your pal Smitty is the sort of rat that even rats on rats. He sold Quayley's secret three times that we know of. Hey, thanks for handicapping it for me, Saint. If you're really grateful, Turner, you can return the favor by telling me uh, what time it is. It's uh, 5.15 in the morning, Saint, but you ain't going nowhere. I have a date to keep before six, Turner, with your competitor. Yeah, Saint, that's what you think. Maybe not, Turner. What do you say we play a little pool while we're waiting for the board? Get away from that pool table. I ain't playing any games with you, Saint. Well, maybe pool was the wrong game. How about a game of pitch and catch? What? Yeah, you know, I pitch like this. Ow! And you catch it like that. Hate to leave you all by yourself there in the side pocket, but like I said, I have a date to keep. Well, Mr. Ritchie, get enough sleep despite my interruption? <laughs> I wasn't really asleep when you called on me, Mr. Templer. I know, Mr. Ritchie. Your hair was a little too carefully combed for a man who's been suddenly awakened and told he's having a fire. You're very clever, Mr. Templer. But not clever enough to catch you before you committed three murders. So you're Smitty's silent partner, huh? See what low company's gotten you into, Ritchie? Yes, I see. $400,000 buried in the siding of this elevator shaft. And with the help of this acetylene torch, it'll be all mine. A very ingenious fellow, Quayley. And to think the money never left this building. Hmm. The place where Johnny works. He... Yes, he was ingenious. It was very smart of him to use his prison job making automobile license plates as a means of smuggling out the information to his wife. How did he do it, Richie? Very simple, Templar. There's an extra piece of thin metal in this particular plate, forming a sort of pocket. And inside the pocket, a note on cigarette paper telling poor Mrs. Quayley how to get the money. Of course, once he managed to tell her the number of the license plate, well, the rest was easy, wasn't it? Yes. All poor Mrs. Quayley had to do was ask the motor vehicle bureau to whom the plate was assigned. Mr. Collins, in this instance. Poor old fellow. <sighs> Mr. Temper, would you mind joining me here in the shop, please? Hmm? Yes, right on top of the elevator. I'd like to keep an eye on you while I finish burning out this metal partition. You see, I've only until six o'clock when this elevator is switched on downstairs. Oh, well, I... I... Come, come. In the shop, please. Well, really, I, I... I have a gun, Mr. Templer. Oh, well. That makes it official, then. There we are. Careful, Mr. Templer. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Anything accidental, that is. You know, it's funny. I've known you such a short time, and I have exactly the same sentiments towards you. I've never been astride the top of an elevator before, Richie. And we're right near the top of the shaft. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean to worry you, Templar. But when this elevator power turns on in a few minutes, it will rise to the top before it descends. How is your treasure hunt coming, Richie? Almost finished. One last strip of metal to cut away and the partition will come off. Then we'll decide your fate, Mr. Templar. Your future. Here goes. A last blow. <laughs> It's there. It's there. I see it. $400,000 in currency, Templar. Think of it. Think of it. You think of it, Richie, and also think of how much blood was spilled on it. Preaching, Templar? You? I never thought. What's that? The elevator, Richie. Maybe it came to work a little early today. My, my money. My money. Come on, Richie. Come on, get off. No, no, there's still some money left here. I want it. I want it all. All. Come on. We've got to get off. Jump, Richie, jump. No, no, my money. I must save the money. Richie, you fool. All right, I got it. I... Ah! Yes, Richie. You saved your money, and you saved the state some money, too. I'm sure you didn't plan on saving the cost of your execution. <laughs> You have been listening to another adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Vincent Price. 
These immortal words of Ovid, translated from the Latin, express quite well indeed the justice of our Mr. Ritchie's fate. Nor is there any juster law than that the contrivers of death should perish by their own contrivances. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. Our cast included Laureen Tuttle, Barney Phillips, Tony Barrett, Fred Howard, and Dan O'Herlihy. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint is a James L. Sapir production and was transcribed and directed by Thomas A. McAvity. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that The Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the story The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. This little story of frustrated love and violent death just happened to happen on the Côte d'Azur. It might have happened somewhere else, but no. This little strip of Italian and French coastline called the Riviera is where it all took place. The story begins at dawn. The lovely, tender, early dawn of a summer's day in 1946. At this period of my career, I was in the cigarette business, American cigarettes. My end of it was distribution, which in France was organized out of Marseille. That's where I was bound on this particular morning. I had a full truckload of the four leading brands disguised in cans of powdered milk. And I'd crossed the border, never mind how, while it was still dark. And by six o'clock, I'd passed through Monte Carlo. I think I was somewhere just outside of Villefranche when I saw her. She was young, redheaded. She was standing behind a big limousine trying to push it, and she was wearing an evening dress. I slowed up. She seemed to be having trouble car wasn't budging. She was a very beautiful girl. So I stopped, got out of the truck. I could see she was frightened. I went over to the car she'd been trying to push. There was a man sitting inside. I could see he was wearing a dinner jacket. He had on black horn-rimmed glasses and he was bald, none of which would have been very interesting except that he was also dead. Well, that's how it began. Stick around, I'll tell you how it ended. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, Murder on the Riviera. Well, I went back to my truck and turned it around. Don't ask me why, I'm just telling you what I did. I moved the truck up behind the car. She was still standing there in the road looking at me. Hey, you! You're stupid, aren't you? She didn't answer me. Well, you must be stupid. Don't you know enough to take off the brake? All at once, she understood, ran back up the road to the car, opened the door, and released the brake. Before I knew it, the car was teetering over the edge of the road. Then, with a lurch, it slipped down the embankment into the sea. She just stood there, looking at me. Well, what are you going to do now? I don't know. Well, where are you going? 
I don't know. Well, you can't just stand there. The day's starting. People are waking up. There's going to be traffic. Come here. What do you want? I well, suppose I give you a lift. You'd be a good girl if I do. Remember, I've got the gun. <laughs> What's your name? Daddy L. People call me Danny. Well, I'll call you stupid. Come on, get in and close the door, stupid. Better be on our way. Thank you. What's your name? Harry. You know where I'm taking you? Police? I live in Nice, stupid. It's just ten kilometers away from here. We're going home. I had a room in Nice over a cafe, nothing very grand, but convenient. I guess it was that evening dress that did it, but I found myself apologizing as I opened the door. This isn't your style, my lady, I'm sure, but you have to put up with it for a while, you know, bachelor's quarters. Hey. Hello, Harry. Now, look here, what's all this? Well, I didn't know you'd be back so soon. Oh, Harry. you didn't. Perhaps you'd better introduce us, Harry. Well, this is Lily, Danny. Danny, this is Lily. I'm sorry, Harry. Don't look so upset. I know how you feel. How I feel? You see, I thought you'd be up in Genoa for another couple of days, and by then I'd found some place to stay. The old woman dancers let me in. Come on, come on. Uh, get your things on now and go. Go? Go where? It's a nice day. Go take a swim. Well, I don't have a bathing suit. Here. What's that? 2,000 francs. Why are you giving it to me? Go out and buy yourself a bathing suit. Goodbye. There's something I've got to explain. All right, start talking, but make it fast. Remember what I told you before, make it good. Well, the first thing is, I've got to get to Paris. Well, if you think I'm going to drive you there in the truck... No, of course not. Here. What am I supposed to do with that? It's the key to my room in the hotel. Well, what about it? Uh, well, I, I can't spend the rest of my life in an evening dress, can I? Besides, I've got to have my passport. Try to get out of the country, is well, that it? Paris that... first, I told you. That's where the money is. Then we'll see. Well, then we'll... What do you mean, we? That's up to you. Hmm. So I'm supposed to check you out of the hotel, is that it? Well, just put a few things in a bag. You know, things I can wear in the day. Oh, and remember the passport. It's in the drawer by the bed. Is that what you wanted to tell me? Why, yes. I thought maybe you were going to do some explaining. E explaining? Yes, there was a body in that car. Didn't you notice? Well, you don't think I killed him, do you? Well, I don't think he shot himself. Well, why not? Why shouldn't he? You know what I ought to do with you? I ought to turn you in right now. We've been gambling all night. He'd lost heavily. He was desperate. Stop pawing me. You know what probation is. Probation? It's what you're on, stupid. You needed help. The idea was I'd give you a chance to explain things to me first instead of the cops. Well, you've had your chance. Give me a cigarette. Here, take these. I'll get some more. Harry, when you leave the hotel, you better go by the service entrance. And remember the plane tickets. Yeah, the, the what? The plane tickets? For Paris. You'll have to buy them. Well, let's get back to cases now. Who was he? Who? The stiff. Who do you think I mean? The dead body. I don't know. Well, how did you happen to be in his car? Oh, he offered to take me. It was late, remember? It was dawn. We'd been gambling in the casino all night. And you didn't know it? Well, I was just sitting next to him at the table. He staked me for a while, but he started losing himself and he wouldn't let me go. He said something about changing his luck. Well, how did he get you in his car? Oh, it was only a lift home. Oh. We were both going the same way. Well, we aren't. We're going separate ways. But first, I'll get you a bag and passport. Goodbye, stupid. My truck, packed full of smuggled cigarettes, was waiting in the street below. I couldn't leave it there in full daylight. I should have taken it on to Marseille, but I couldn't do that and still go back to Monte Carlo to Danny's hotel. I went to the airport first, but this being the holiday time in France, there wasn't any space, so then I drove over to the railway station and booked a seat on the blue train for Paris that night. And when I came out of the station, I found Lily waiting in the truck. Hello, Harry. Oh, I wish you'd take my suggestion, Lily, and go swimming. I've got enough troubles. Are you leaving for good, right Harry? Right now, I'm going to Monte Carlo. Where are you going? To Monte Carlo. I'm a liar. Why is that, Harry? I told somebody this morning I liked girls. Well, you do. You like them too much. Lily was a nice kid, but she wasn't making life any easier for me that day. I tried to talk her out of tagging along with me, but it wasn't any use. Lily, will you please tell me just why you're taking this long ride to Monte Carlo? I was just going to ask you the same question. All right, I'll answer it, because somebody's in trouble. Oh, what did she do? You keep jumping to conclusions. Why are you so sure that she did something? I said she was in trouble. That's how you get into trouble, isn't it? By doing things. Well, not necessarily. Look at you. I am not in trouble, Harry. You want me to be. When you lost your job, that's trouble enough. You, you didn't do anything, they just fired you. Well, I threw a gin face at a man. 
and hit him with it. Glass and all? Glass and all. I guess that's doing something. I guess so. Hmm. Well, now what? You mean about me? Yeah. Well, it's nothing working in this chip little place. Gonna try for something better? You've seen my act, Harry. The dance of the sacred flame. Mm. Uh, yes, yes. Lousy, isn't it? Pretty lousy. Well, it isn't going to get very much better. To be a dancer, I figure a girl ought to be able to dance. Not with your equipment, are they? You like me, Harry? You mean, do I like the way you look? Well, do you? Well, I like the way you look, but you're wasting your time, honey, if you're thinking of marriage or anything like that. I'm not the type. Oh, yes, you're the type. You're just not in the mood. What's wrong with that girl? Why are you hiding her? If I tell you, I wonder, would you help? I'd help you. No, I guess not, huh? No, you wouldn't help her. Well, why should I? And come to that, why should you? Well, I... I get a funny reaction when people are in trouble, Lily. I guess because I've been in so much trouble myself, but I never changed. I have to help them first before I ask any questions. Besides, I don't like policemen. What have the police got to do Nothing. with it? Nothing, I was just talking. Look, if a bird flew in your window, what would you do? I'd be scared. Why? Because I'm superstitious. When a bird comes into the house, it means death. Okay, let's forget birds. Are you superstitious about mice? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to explain a point of view. Now, tell me this. Have you ever let a mouse out of a trap? You mean a mouse in an evening dress by Jacques Fat? Uh, all right now, Lily, I'm leaving you here. Wait for me if you want to. This is the service entrance to the hotel. Well, what if it is? Well, they'd stop me at the front. Here, hold my coat. And just what do I do with it? Just hold it, hold it and wait. I'm going to be an electrician or a plumber. I haven't decided which. In shirt sleeves, I've got a better chance of getting up to a hotel room without anybody stopping me. Yes, but... but you wanted to help, didn't you? I went into the hotel. In my hurry, I forgot that in that coat I'd given Lily, there was the gun. Not my gun, the one that fell out of the car of the dead man. Don't know why I didn't think of it, but then I don't know what I was thinking of that whole day. 407 was the number of the key. I went up there as quietly as I could, let myself in. And on a drawer by the bed, I found Danny's passport. It identified her as Madame Danielle Savich. I put the passport in my pocket, opened up the smallest of her bags, and started hurriedly throwing some things into it. In the closet, I found a tailored suit. I picked out some shoes, thought it would match, threw the whole thing into the bag. I figured she'd need something from the dressing table, makeup, things like that. And that's when I noticed the leather folder, one of those things for photographs. It had slipped to the floor and it opened. I looked down at it. There were two pictures, each showing Danny and a man, the same man. In one pose, they were in ski togs, and in the other, in bathing suits. He was bald with heavy black horn-rimmed glasses, and I recognized him. He was the dead man from the car. At this moment, there was the sound of a key turning the lock of the door. I jumped to my feet, dropping the toilet articles, reached the door in a single leap, and turned the bolt. All right, open up in there. I didn't answer that. There didn't seem to be much point in getting into conversation. I looked wildly around for some means of hiding or escape. Open up! You'll only make it harder for yourself if you don't. This is the police! In a moment, Orson Welles returns as Harry Lyme, the third man. Now, Orson Welles, as Harry Lyme, the third man, continues today's story, Murder on the Riviera. Open up in there! This is the police! I rushed to the window. It was locked. I kicked it open. There was a balcony on the floor below. It was quite a drop. But in another minute, I knew they'd succeed in battering down the door, so I risked it and managed to drop safely enough on the narrow terrace. That jump had only been a matter of some 12 or 15 feet, but it was four stories between the balcony and the street. My idea was to try climbing into one of the other rooms and getting out that way. 
I pushed my hand in and turned the catch inside, but this, a very fierce-looking old dowager in corsets, appeared and scared me away, and I ran to the next window, and that was open. I jumped into the room where a very pretty girl without very much on, and whom I'm sorry to say I never saw again in my life, was giving herself a pedicure. She looked startled, but I didn't pause for explanations. I rushed to the door of her room and bolted out into the hall. Then she started to scream. Help! Murder! Police! Police! I started toward the stairway, but I could see some police and an assorted gaggle of bellhops and porters converging on my floor from above and below, so I turned on my heels and raced down the hall, trying the doors of the various rooms. Finally, I found one that wasn't locked and let myself in, slamming the door and bolting it behind me. I picked up the phone. Hello, Mayor Bessies? Does Patrice happen to be there? Well, we'll put him on the phone. I figured the best thing to do was to get my friend, who happened to be a croupier in the casino, and we used to hang out at this restaurant that I'd called to bring me a change of clothes over to the hotel room. If I could look enough like a tourist going down to the beach, maybe I could get out past the cops. Well, Patrice, the croupier, was a real friend. He arrived with sunglasses, a jersey pullover, a beach robe, and a low comedy blue canvas hat. And in that outfit, I managed to ride down in the elevator without attracting over much attention. At the side of the hotel, however, I found a gang of cops gathered by my truck. They were unloading the cans of powdered milk and prying them open. So that was goodbye to the truck, goodbye to a very expensive shipment of smuggled cigarettes, and maybe also goodbye to Harry Lyme. As casually as possible, I strolled around to the front and ordered a cab. Lily was nowhere in sight. That was something to be grateful for. Forty minutes later, I was back home in Nice. Not, I can assure you, in a very cheerful frame of mind. For one thing, the door of my room was locked. And for another, my croupier friend, Patrice, had told me that some sportsman spearing underwater for fish had come on the car. The bald man had been found and identified. His name was Victor Savage. Yes? Okay, stupid, let me in. Oh. Oh, it's you. Better let me in, Mrs. Savage. Oh. It's not much of a welcome. Hey. Hey, what are you doing? Thank you, Harry. That was nice. What do you dress like that for, Harry? Well, I, uh... What have you been doing all this time? What have I been doing? Well, uh, nothing much. Nothing hey, much. where's my bag? Oh, I forgot it. You what? Well, you might say I was occupied. It sort of slipped my mind. But all I've got is that evening dress. I can't stay here forever. Honey, you're not going to. But Harry. Yes? Don't you realize I'm a fugitive from justice? That makes two of us stupid. The only difference is if they catch me, I'll have to serve some time. What for? Breaking and entering for one thing, aiding and abetting a murderous burglary and impersonating a tourist. Oh, you're joking. Besides, why will it be you that's in jail and not me? This is France. You're a good-looking dame, and that's useful anywhere. What are you talking about? Just this, stupid. If you can make that shooting of yours look just a little bit like a crime of passion, you've maybe got a chance. But you better start telling the truth just to get into the habit. I just thought of something. Congratulations. When you were knocking on the door... Yes? What was it you called me? Well, what do you think I called you? Well, I don't know. I guess I was dreaming. I called you by your married name, Mrs. Savage. Well, that means you found my passport. Yes, and people went swimming today and found your husband, what? too. Yes, Victor Savage Esquire. He was wearing a black tie and very little hair, and he was sitting in a 1939 Humber Snipe, black with blue trimmings, about 30 feet underwater. And I warn you, Mrs. Savage, that anything you say will be used against you. I don't like your jokes. I don't like them much either. Want to make up some of your own? Oh, that's... Did you forget something else besides my bag? I don't have any cigarettes. At Wait all. a minute. I know something else you forgot. You had it in the pocket of your coat. The gun? Yes. Pretty little thing, too. Still, by now, I should think you'd be tired of playing with it. My fingerprints. Listen, stupid. Savage's body is identified. Your Mrs. Savage and half the casino must have seen you two driving off together. Forget about the fingerprints and get to work dreaming up that other woman. What other woman? The one he was cheating you with. When you found out about it, everything went red, remember? And before you knew it, you'd pull the trigger. But that isn't what happened at all. Okay, okay. Tell it your own way. Well, you see... Don't try it on me, stupid. Wait till they catch you. I've had all I can take. Hey. Yes? Uh, nothing, I guess, but... What are you doing? I'm changing my clothes, stupid. This is a tuxedo I borrowed from downstairs. But why? Why get dressed up for the evening? I don't know what's worse, your questions or your answers. Listen, stupid, have you forgotten that all you've got to travel in is an evening dress? I've got to get you from here to the station. This is summer. It'll still be light. But with me in the tuxedo, you stand a better chance of not being noticed. Maybe they'll think we're going to a ball. And what happens when I get to Paris in the morning? Well, you've got money in Paris, remember? Harry. What is it now? I don't really have any money there, Harry. I, I, I just said that. Well, I'm in it this far. Okay, how much can you get by with? 
How much? Now, I know you're stupid. Money, of course. How much money? But I've got money. Yeah? Well, certainly. I've got 15 million francs. What? Well, right here in my bag. It's what he won. Your husband? My ex-husband. You didn't mention a divorce. You didn't ask. Then what were the two of you doing in Monte Carlo together? We just happened to meet at the casino, and then he started to win. Go on. He wouldn't let me go because he was afraid it might change his luck. You know how gamblers are. So then are. you changed his luck for him. Well, no, I didn't play at all. Harry. Okay, stupid. Okay, keep your distance. I don't think I like you. We'll go into that later. When did your husband start to lose? Well, he didn't. He just went on winning. He didn't lose at all. I just said that. why, why, for goodness sake, did you lie about that? Because of the money, the 15 million francs. Your tie's crooked. I told you to keep your distance. And I told you I didn't like you. But I just said that. Uh, tell me more about the money. Oh, don't be so mercenary. I want you to kiss me. I'd rather talk about the money, the 15 million francs, remember? That's quite a well, lot, isn't it? I guess it was enough. Well, you see, now that Victor and I were getting divorced, I thought they might decide it wasn't mine. Well, you know, when they found him. Listen, you sexy little monster. It's just 15 minutes to train time. You're not going to get far, you know. The only reason I'm doing this is because I'm just a little bit cracked. <laughs> You're not anything of this sort. I'm the kind of fellow who refuses jury duty in a murder trial and lets mice out of traps. You're going to get it, stupid. They'll catch you. It just isn't going to be me that turns you in. By the way, where's the gun? Lily has it. Lily? You met her this morning. I'd better get it back or she'll hock it. She got fired out of her job and she's broke. Oh, she's pretty. She'll get by. What do you want with the gun? I thought I'd throw it in the Mediterranean, stupid. Guns can be traced, you know. Well, it wasn't my gun, Harry. It was his. He kept it in the glove compartment. So you took it out of the glove compartment and shot him dead with it, just like that, hmm? No, Harry, not just like that. Not like that at all. Do you honestly think it happened that way? Oh, why, Harry, what reason would I have? Fifteen million francs is a pretty good reason, honey. He didn't feel like giving it to you, is that it? So you settled the argument with a couple of bullets. Harry! Well... If that's what you really think, well, I guess there isn't any point in our talking about it anymore. No, honey, I guess there isn't. Take your money and let's get out of here. I got her to the station, okay, and into a compartment. She told me she was hungry. There were a couple of minutes to spare, so I went across the way to get her something to eat. On the way back, I found Lily waiting on the platform. What are you doing here? Seeing you off. I'm not going anywhere. Hey, I just thought, give me back that gun, Lily. You don't need it. I don't need it. I don't even want it. But neither do you, and you're better off without it. Come on, Gib. Harry. Yes? Why are you going back to her now? Can't you leave her alone? Got a ticket. Is that all? You sure? No, I'm not sure. I, I just wish... What? Well, I wish I had a better idea of what she's really like. Shall I tell you? No. You wouldn't believe me. Here's the gun. If you decide to go to Paris, Harry, send me a postcard. Why, Harry! Hello. I thought I'd seen the last of You're you. You're going to, honey, in another 20 seconds. Here, there's a little beef stew from the restaurant across the way. Here's some wine. Oh, you an angel. Oh, stop it. Well, stop what? Make it with a big blue eyes. Tell me what happened in that car. Or don't. That's up to you, but quit the kidding. Well, what's the use? You won't believe me. Nobody seems to think I'll believe them. Why don't you try? Well, what really happened is this. He owed me the money, and I tried to get it away from him. It, it was really mine, you see. Mine by rights. Yes. And then we started struggling, and before I knew it, I... Look! Look! They're out of the window. I turned. On the platform outside, we could see a crowd of police. I recognized some of them. They were the cops who found my truck full of cigarettes. They must have followed me. So you did it! After all, you told no, the police! No, no, Danny, I didn't. I didn't tell anybody. I swear I didn't. Hey, what are you doing? I thought I felt a gun in your pocket. Give it back to Don't me! Don't be a fool! Give me that gun. They're not coming after oh, yes, you! Yes, they are. You told them you trapped me! Danny! <laughs> the next minute, the compartment was swarming with cops. They grabbed her and got the gun away from her. That didn't do me much good. I had a nasty wound in the shoulder. Take the woman away. Lion, you are under arrest. But first, we'll get you a doctor. Well, Dan, at least I know now that your last story was the truth. What story? What did she tell you? She tried to hold up Savage with a gun. When he grabbed for it, she pulled the trigger. Reflex action problem. Reflex I right. couldn't help it, Harry. I just couldn't. I, I saw the gun sticking out of your pocket. Come on, take her out and give this man air. He's wounded. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Stu. No, no, let me through. Yeah, 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 what's this? There's another girl. What's she doing here? Harry! It was 
Lily down on the platform waving to me through the glass. Send that girl away! No use, officer. I've tried, but I guess I'm stuck with her. Harry, speak to me, Harry! I won't be using my room for a while. I'll be taking me to a hospital, and after that to jail. You can move in, Lily, if you want to. Lily? Lily who? Oh, just Lily. She's a nice girl, officer. But she's stupid, too. <laughs> Harry Lyme returns in just a moment. And now, Harry Lyme. So here I am in the hospital. But the doctor says I'll soon be up and around. Maybe around is the wrong word. The up part of it is more accurate. Up on a charge of cigarette smuggling. Well, I guess that's all for now. Uh, by the way, don't let this sad little tale of frustrated love and violent death keep you from taking a holiday on the Riviera. Murders don't happen here any more often than anywhere else. And generally speaking, in this part of the world, love doesn't get frustrated. <laughs> Just keep your powder dry and look out for that moon. It's loaded. So long now. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Trouble as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake, I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, what sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir, very urgent, I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any client until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake, come at once. What were you saying, boss? And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great-grandmother. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> What we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolf was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. 
Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. You've passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, This way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Uh, Good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I I haven't signed it yet. Uh, Also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, Do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a staff of the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly could Archie. have... Archie. Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolf, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolf. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. And good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You have more than earned this thousand, young man. Archie! Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. 
It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Boy, Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now. Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. Hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin? How do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolf. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. What do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable Mr. Blake. To, uh... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is... Oh, I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. Well, that's news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes. Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hammond. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They, they were fathers. I... Oh, Wilbur. Suicide? I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, Miss. You read it, Wilbur. Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it is all right. But this still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodman. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. 
His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will. Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he has to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? Joe says, uh... Hmm. Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours. But I loved her, too. And I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both. And I've, uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, when Marcia died last year and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you, and I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hilary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hilary. Mm, well, this, uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine for them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium's chlorostel. The b- b- Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. Find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to uh, fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin. What's happened? There's a body here. Rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. I'll be all right. No, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on. This way. Well, here we are. Wilbur. What do you say, Miss Blake? Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes. Father. And you, Mr. Blake? Well, it's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or... Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's Father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. 
No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, be of us. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, eh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do. But not by you, of course. Certainly not. <laughs> but who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm. How interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. So enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. <laughs> I merely asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm. I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad. Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. Yeah, thanks. Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed. The will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes. But on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That is, it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? Uh, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie, phone out to the Blake mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. And I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss, please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. Anita, Anita What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard Well, what's happened? Speak up, man You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look, look at these headlines Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall What? Yes, close the doors Oh, no, Wilbur, no, I can't believe such a I'm thing I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white 
Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to come up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense. He must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita, you mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her any place. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your uncle Hillary found the hiding place, and he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservations. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John, and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out. I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Archie, come in, Miss Blake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They've also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. <laughs> Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a neat order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolf. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, it just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope, too. But he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting. You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. 
Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Crime does not pay. <laughs> Look, baby, why don't you get smart? This attitude don't get you nothing except maybe a pretty little map all mashed in. This attitude will get me plenty after you bring your boss here. Listen to her. The gall of the frail. Hey, you don't think the boss will come to see you. I know he will. After you give him my message. Hmm. Now we're a couple of messenger boys. That's all you were in the first place. Now I'll tell your boss this. Tell him I've got a racket that means dough. Real long green mazuma. Got that? Keep stealing, kid. Tell him I know how he and I can get into the chips. Ten times over what he can pick up in this penny ante chiseling on card games. And tell him... Tell him I'm not too bad to look at. And he might do himself a lot of good just by dropping in on me, say, tomorrow night. In the interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear Cards and Spades, starring Susan Douglas. Now, Crime Does Not Pay, starring Susan Douglas as June Hathaway in Cards and Spades. June Hathaway was sweet and pretty and cute. Make no mistake about that. The women who came to her apartment each afternoon thought of her either as a daughter or as they thought of themselves at her age. This was reasonable rationalization for women who sought some excuse for their infatuation with the sight of cards and the sound of the chips clicking against each other on the table. Where June had come from, where she was heading, were matters of no moment to these women. They were matters of great importance to June, whose sharp, cold eyes belied her sweet face for anyone who saw them at unguarded moments. June had a plan. The afternoon card game was only the beginning of that plan. I'll raise five blue. Five and uh, five more call you, honey. Here you are. Two pair. <laughs> Not good enough, darling. Full house. Oh, winning streak, eh? <laughs> One more deal. I've got to get some of it back. As it is, Dave's beginning to wonder. Oh, you too, honey. Huh? Mine wants to know where all the money goes. <laughs> Cost of living's always a good excuse. Not with Ralph. He follows the index in the paper every day. Whatever an index is. I don't 
Please tell me, ladies, that the cost of living is an item among you. Oh. Hello, Jim. Oh, After all, where one of you loses, the others win. Isn't that right? Right. Yeah. I suppose. I was sharing the wealth and having fun besides. You're right, June, darling. Absolutely right. You're a bright girl, June. You'd have been a great success in business, I think. I couldn't wait for that. Me, a career girl with success at 50? No, thanks. You are smart, though, June. Oh, my goodness. 4.30 already. I promised Dave I'd take him up with the car at 5. Oh, excuse me, the door. One more hand, girls. That's all I have time for. I'll do. Mm-hmm. Make a move, sister. This gun ain't no water pistol. You know what's good for you? You keep your trap shut. But I can't shut up, you hear? All right, ladies, this is a stick-up. Oh, no. Coach will be in the bedroom, Huey. Pick the good ones. Check. Take your tables and the wallet. Double check. Yeah. yeah. Big game you're running here, sister. Yeah, not a bad hole. It was a big game, you sap. I got the coach four of them. Not bad. The rest are just dogs. Oh, my God. My God. Oh, shut God. up. You're insured. Got the cash? Let's go. Got it. Let's ride. June, call the police. Please, yes, for pity's sake. You, you got are the coach. crazy. I you want your names in the papers. I want my fur coat back. Do you want to go to jail for illegal gambling? Do you, any of you? Oh, didn't think of that. No, well, I didn't think so. All right, ladies. Cash your chips. The base plays over. Oh, you two again. Yeah, us two. Hey, glad to see us, kid. Like an epidemic of smallpox, I'm glad to see you. Oh, that ain't nice, baby. With mugs like you, I don't have to be nice. Ah, don't be like that, kid. We come back to tell you, you ought to have protection. Yeah, mm. you're from mugs like us who bust up card games. <laughs> After all, it gets around your game is stuck up every week. The dames ain't going to come to play with you, sister. I had a decent living out of this. You fatheads bust in, scare away the pigeons. It'll take me a month to build up the business again. I ought to make you give me a cut of what you snagged out of here today. We don't give no cuts. You cut us in. And the boss. He wants you should pay some insurance premiums. <laughs> Hold up insurance. Not a dime. Not one thin dime. You want to run a game? You give us 25%. We collect regular. Every Saturday. No bad man gets a cent from me. If I build this business by myself, I'm keeping what I make. Oh, what a shame. And she's a cutie, too. Now look, sister, grow up. The boss controls gambling in this burg. Everybody pays. Not me. I have nothing to pay with. You spoiled the whole deal this afternoon. Are you going to pay? You heard me. I'll say it again. No. N-O. No. Look, baby, why don't you get smart? This attitude don't get you nothing. Except maybe your pretty little map all mashed in. Well, this attitude will get me plenty. After you bring your boss here. Well, listen to her. The gall of the frail. Hey, you don't think the boss will come to see you. I know he will. After you give him my message. Now we're a couple of messenger uh, boys. That's all you were in the first place. Now you tell your boss this. Tell him I've got a racket that means dough. A real long green mazuma. Got that? Keeps failing, kid. Tell him I know how he and I can get into the chips. Ten times over what he can pick up in this penny ante chiseling on card games. And tell him... Tell him I'm not too bad to look at. And he might do himself a lot of good just by dropping in on me, say, um, tomorrow night. Yes? Well, not bad. The boys have better judgment than I thought. What do you want? I want in, first of all. And then? Then we'll see. Look, uh, Miss Hathaway, are you going to keep me standing in the hall all evening? You know my name. <laughs> I'm Dick Moorhead, known to you by way of Gus and Huey as the boss. I thought so. I expected Gus and uh, Huey with you. They're with me, downstairs in the car. Come in. Thanks. Sit down. I don't mind if I do. Drink. No, thanks. I never drink. At a business conference. Then uh, start the conference. You had my offer yesterday. Oh, that was no offer. That was an insult. Snappy, aren't you? Do you have a counter proposal? Mm, I may have. If you agree on what basis we're going to talk. What do you mean, what basis? Are you still pointing a gun at me? <sighs> I'm not even carrying one. Want to search me? I'll take your word for it. Ah, go on. 
Are we talking as equal? Ah, Gus was right. You do have gall. I run gambling in this town by disposition of the syndicate. You run or ran a card game, and you want to talk as equals? Maybe <laughs> you are the boss. I don't think you're so bright. Oh, you don't? Mm, bright boys don't kill the goose. They collect the golden egg. All right, as equals. What's your proposal? That we go partners. On what? Your game? Oh, that's chicken feed. What then? On what can come out of my game. Ender doesn't like it. Well, maybe you better draw a blueprint. Well, it begins to look like it. Look, Richard. Uh, the name's Dick. Richard has been a fighting word as long as I can remember. All right, look, Dick. Ninety-nine percent of the women who play my game or did play in it are afraid of their husbands. <laughs> Ideal situation. No jokes. They're afraid, but not the way you're thinking. They don't want their husbands to know what they're up to in the afternoon. I think I'm beginning to understand. There's more to it. We might make them pay off a little on a deal like that, but they'll pay off a lot more and in a lot of other ways if they lose heavily once in a while. Junie, you're a genius. No. no. I just happen to know my own gender. Well, now that you've given me the idea, what do I need you for? <laughs> the women trust me. They know me. I look too innocent, too sweet to be bad. They'll never trust a man like you. What do you need me for? A strong arm and, when necessary, and lays on with the syndicate. Junie, you're a honey. You're beautiful. And you're smart. How did you get to learn all these tricks? I was born in a jungle. I survived. I saw the other girls and what they were up against. I figured not to be trapped behind a typewriter or in a laundry. And I don't care for the usual career. So you use your brain. I try. You've got a deal, partner. I, I thought I would have. Now, how about that drink? Uh, the uh, business conference over? It's over. And the social side of our relationship begins? I think it does. If you want it that way. <laughs> Why not? Make yourself at home. Oh, the liquor's in that cabinet over there. You might as well know where everything is around here. I imagine you'll be coming back fairly regularly. Take your hands off me. Who do you think you are? Oh, shut up. You wanted the foresight and Kirby dames, Miss Hathaway. Boss, you got him. So I see. Okay, wait outside, Gus. Check. What's the meaning of this? You'll find out. I demand to know. Mysterious phone calls. Hoodlums bringing us here in a closed car. This strange man. Really, June, you'd better explain. I think you'd better explain this, Mrs. Kirby. Dorothy. That chick. Quiet, Mrs. Forsythe. Your turn will come. I... I lost heavily. I gave June a chance. Which I checked on before I cashed it, or tried to cash it. You have no account in this bank, Mrs. Kirby. You can't collect on a gambling debt in this state. My husband's a lawyer, and I'm... Do can't we, Mrs. Kirby? And now you, Mrs. Forsyth. I'm paid up. You haven't anything you can charge me with. Except the fact that you're deathly afraid your husband will find out how much money you've been losing. I don't care if he does. Uh, call up, Mr. Forsyth, Dick. The number's Jefferson 56703. No! No, don't call him, for pity's sake. It's as much as my marriage is worth. How much is your marriage worth, Mrs. Forsyth? What do you want? Money. Lots of it. About as much each week as you've been losing. But you'll have to keep on playing, too. I can't. I haven't got it. But you'll get it, won't you? Oh, won't she, Dick? I think so. I know that phone number now. All right. I'll try. What? What do you want from me? You have friends, Mrs. Kirby. My friends? They'll enjoy an occasional game of cards. You want me to... We We call them steerers. In cruder places, Mrs. Kirby, you are going to steer for us. I won't. That is, I... I can't. I can't. I'll lose my friends. You'll fleece them just as you fleeced us. I can't. I can't. Oh, but you will, Mrs. Kirby. <laughs> you will. You'd rather have them pay through the nose than go through a scandal yourself, wouldn't you? 
And the bad check is nasty, Mrs. Kirby. Very, very <laughs> nasty. You can, but you will, Mrs. Kirby. You know that just as well as I do. <laughs> In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with Cards and Spades. Now we continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Susan Douglas as June Hathaway in Cards and Spades. The racket worked, and with great success. The women caught in June's web, the mainstay of which was their own desire for the excitement of gambling. The women paid, and in many ways. Beginning with Dorothy Kirby and the friends she brought, June and Dick expanded their activities. For the victims, fear became the dominant feeling of their lives. For June and Dick, power and more power, money and more money became the prime motives. But even these activities can reach a saturation point for the victims. Margaret Forsythe reached that point the morning she came to pay her fifth installment to June. All right, Mrs. Forsythe, just leave the money. I have a busy morning. Your friend Mrs. Kirby is due shortly. I thought you might take something in place of money. From you? The distinguished Mrs. Forsythe, hardly. I, I've come to give you... Yes, the money you have it in your bag, Mrs. Forsythe. I can't. I won't. I've stood it for five weeks. I've gone on my own savings. But my husband's getting more and more suspicious. I'm through. I'm finished. Do what you think you can to me. Try anything. You can't get blood out of a stone. Never mind the histrionics. Just open your bag and pay and then get out. All right. I'll open my bank. I'll pay you. I'll pay you exactly what you deserve. I see. A dainty little automatic. Pearl handle, too. A real lady's gun. Only you won't pull the trigger. You haven't the nerve. I will. I will. Give me that gun, Mrs. Forsyth. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. With your pleasure, June. Yes, I did. I'll uh, take it away from her. Yeah, with pleasure. No, keep away. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Hey, you are, kid. Huh. Loaded, too. Yes, I thought it would be. What do you want I should do with the dame? Oh, teach her a lesson, Gus. Try to leave as few marks as possible. Oh, that's easy. No! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! I wouldn't want I should mark her face, so I twist the arms. Like this. And then I give her the knee. Like this. And then... I thought I heard you. Margaret. Watch closely, Mrs. See? Kirby, and I'll be a for you. And then I throw her down like this. And when she don't stop yelling, I use my little piece of rubber hose. I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet. That's better. Yeah. Much better. Well, Mrs. Kirby, I... I came to report. Yes, get on with it. I... I can't... Margaret. Never mind, Margaret, Dorothy, dear. How many friends are you bringing here this afternoon? Uh, three. N no, no, four. But I don't want to. I'm afraid. Margaret's very unhappy just now, Dorothy, isn't she? Isn't she? Now, how many did you say you were bringing to our little game this afternoon, dear? <laughs> Dorothy? Yes, Dave. Yes, it's me. Where have you been? Out with the girls. That's what you've been saying for weeks. Which girls? I won't be cross-questioned, Dave. Oh, you won't. Well, suppose I say I won't accept the kind of life you've been living and making me live these past weeks. Really, Dave, this attitude is... Attitude? Your... Attitude? Night after night, I come home to an empty house, to obviously dissatisfied servants, to a house that's no longer a home, and I have an attitude... You might let me take my coat off before you start shouting. It's got to stop. These afternoon gallivantings have got to stop. Oh, I'm I'm to be a prisoner, is that Stop it, it Dorothy. I don't know what you're up to, but... What do you mean by that? I happen to make a phone call today to your friend Janice. She hasn't seen you all week. 
And you told me on Tuesday and Wednesday both that you were spending the afternoons with her. She, she must have forgotten. She's telling the truth. I won't have you calling my friends behind my back. What are you doing behind my back? You've no right to Apparently, say that. Apparently, I have no right to a decently run home either. Dave. Oh, Dave, I'm so upset. I, I don't know what I'm saying. That act won't work either. Next thing you'll say is your best friend was run over and she's in the hospital. And that's where you were. I did take Margaret to the hospital. Oh, stop it. It's no go, Dorothy. She probably is there, or you wouldn't dare try to get me to believe you'd been with her. Oh, Dave. Dave, if I only could say... See here, Dorothy. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find out. And if you won't tell me, I'll find out some other way. That's a warning, Dorothy. Don't forget it. You, uh, sent for me, Mr. Kirby? I'm here. Billings, I understand you're a reliable man in your profession. Reliable and uh, discreet. Good. I want you to trail my wife every afternoon until you're positive you know where she spends her time. And uh, with whom? Not necessarily. After you found out where, we'll both go to see with whom. I believe that's the usual procedure in these cases, isn't it? Well, sometimes the husband ain't anxious to go along, but if you want it that way, that's the way you can have it, Mr. Kirby. <laughs> I'm worried about it. About what? The Kirby dance? Yes, the Kirby. Oh, she's bringing in her friends. She's doing what we tell her. She's too docile. <laughs> you bet she's docile. But you told me yourself she, she saw Gus operate on the Forsyth. The Forsyth was quiet, too, before she broke loose. And we taught her the time of day. <laughs> I wonder how she explained the busted ribs to her husband. I still don't like it. Quit worrying, honey. Everything's copacetic. And the dough's rolling in. Besides, geniuses don't ever worry, and you're a genius. I told you that the first time we got together. Hello? Mr. Kirby? Yes? Joe Billings here. He got her cold. Where? Swank apartment on the boulevard. You want us to go in today? The sooner the better. Who's us? Me and a photographer. Pictures of good evidence in the divorce case. I wouldn't know about that. Well, you want us to go ahead? Uh, wait for me. I want to go along. Where shall I meet you? We're in a drugstore at 9th and the Boulevard. We'll wait for you here. I'll be right over. Why all the mystery, Billing? The private detectives usually operate this way. We have to in buildings like this. We couldn't get past the front desk without being announced. That wouldn't do us much good, would it? Hardly. So the service elevator, Mr. Kirby, which we run ourselves. Standard practice. Hmm. Ten four, Mr. Kirby. Here we are. Yes, yeah, so I see. I uh, know it ain't pleasant, Mr. Kirby, but you got to face facts, I suppose. I suppose so. That's what makes business for the men in your profession. To the right here, 10F. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Kirby. Still, no matter how you look at it, it's not amusing. Okay. Now, everybody know what the deal is? Yes, sir. All right, now let's see. You want me to follow you in and say, that's my wife, and then your friend here shoots the picture. Check. Okay, here we go. Who are you? What do you want? It's a raid, lady. Don't try and stop us. Out the back way, everybody. It's a raid. Wait, why? It's a gambling (laughs) den. Dorothy! Dorothy, don't run away! Dicky took a picture! Get the camera! I think this is a divorce raid or something! Mr. Kirby, look out! He's got a gun! Oh! All right! Let the women go, but you stay here! She put her husband up to this! Kirby put her husband up to it! I didn't! I didn't! I say you did! Hold the gun on the men, Dick! Keep away from my wife! Stand still, you! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! All right, fellas, come on! Come on, here! What's going on around here? What's going on here? It's the cops! Drop the gun, Moorhead! We know you! You should have known better, Moorhead. Maybe you'll learn in the can. I know what's going on here. Gambling, roulette, everything. You can't prove a thing. With these witnesses? Are you kidding, sister? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a laugh. We've been watching this joint for weeks. Suddenly there's a riot and we walk in on a neat sucker layout in town. Let's go, everybody. I want a lawyer. You've got no warrant. You can't do this. You'll pay. You'll all pay. Cut it out, sister. Your boyfriend pulled a gun. That's all I need. Now get going. 
There's a free ride waiting for you with a one-way ticket. Come on, sister, move. Crime does not pay. <laughs> Susan Douglas, who starred as June Hathaway in Cards and Spades, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Susan Douglas. There's no doubt in my mind that June Hathaway knew exactly what she was doing. There is some doubt in my mind that she knew why she was doing it. June never examined the causes of her basic insecurity, the causes of the drive for money, money through any means, which brought her to cooperation with Dick Moorhead and eventual catastrophe. But it took more than June's schemes to bring about the events of this story. The necessary additional ingredient was the weakness of her victims. The craving for the excitement, the surrender to the temptation of the green table and the bright pasteboard. Without such help, without both sides of this story, there would have been no tears, no shame, no violence. For all concerned, for all those involved, including the victims, it can be said in all these cases, crime does not pay. Thank you, Miss Douglas. <laughs> Crime Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Marx B. Loeb, with music composed and conducted by John Garth. Technical consultant is Burton B. Turkis. The events, characters, and names used in the story you have just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental. <laughs> Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. The federal law enforcement agencies of the United States work in close cooperation with similar agencies in foreign countries. For only in this cooperation is there hope for a solid bulwark against international crime. This story tells how the French and American federal authorities combined to solve a difficult and baffling case. It was told to me by one of the commissioners of the Sûreté. In it, I will assume the identity of the special agent Tom Manning, the file case entitled Missing Masterpiece, in which only the names and places are fictional. The man beside me in the car was Monsieur André Mondeau of the Sûreté. He was an art detective. For this assignment, he had the training and background. I had not. Huh? Art is everything. Lights and shadows, colors and brush strokes. Masterpieces and murder. Well, that runs the complete gamut, Inspector. And this, <laughs> oh, this picture we are looking for is a masterpiece. And you say the theft was reported three weeks ago, eh? Wait. Le Comte de Montpellier came home from his trip abroad, and it was gone. You said before the painting would probably show up in the United States. You didn't say why. It has happened like this many times in the past. Well, that's not exactly what I'd call evidence. Ah, but, monsieur, I have evidence. Well, then let's hear it. Uh, here is the Comte de Montpellier Chateau. Um, before we go in, Inspector, don't you think you'd better tell me what you know? Oh, come, monsieur. We let the Comte tell you in his own words. Mm -hmm. 
The chateau was one of those unbelievable things you sometimes see in the movies. A uniformed servant led us into a huge study where the Comte de Montpellier stood ready to receive us. This, then, is the American detective? A special agent of his government, Monsieur Tom Manning, Le Comte de Montpellier. How do you do, Count? Please to sit down. You have told the American that I wish my picture returned at once. Oh, as soon as it can be arranged, Monsieur Le Comte. Monsieur Manning would like the details of what you have told us. Ah, I am weary to death of repeating them. But about one month ago, an art dealer, Monsieur Carpentier, asked if he could bring a client of his to see my collection. You said he might. Oui. Mm -hmm. They came, and immediately this lady was drawn to my Corot painting. A woman, eh? Then she had the effrontery to try to buy it. For $25,000. Uh, Monsieur uh, Lecomte reminded her that such pictures were not exportable. Yes. I dismissed the matter and they left. That week, I went away on a short business trip. And when I came back, I found this cheap imitation girl in place of my priceless treasure. This woman, you got her name? Oui, Mademoiselle Bonnet. I delayed Bonnet. A French woman? No, monsieur. An American. I persuaded the remnant of the French aristocracy to give us the imitation coho someone had so kindly left in place of the genuine article. Then Inspector Andre and I headed back to the city. Monsieur, you are satisfied that we have a case? It's worth an investigation. Hmm. What do you want me to do? We wish to take direct action, monsieur. And as an American citizen is involved... May be involved. We feel that you could best talk to her. Yeah. If she will return the picture to us immediately, we will forget this whole unpleasantness. I see. Well, uh, tell me, you know where she lives? Hotel La Rose. Drop me off there and I'll have a talk with her. If she's in. According to the clerk at the La Rose, Mademoiselle Banet of New York and Paris was not in her suite, so I sat around and waited for her. Surprising how much time an agent spends just waiting. I phoned the embassy and made a report to my chief. He told me to stick with it and do whatever I found necessary. About four o'clock, a tall, well-built blonde in her early thirties breathed through the lobby and up the elevator. The clerk gave me the nod, and in a few minutes I was knocking on her door. Tom Manning, a fellow American in Paris. I don't know a Tom Manning. That can be easily overcome. What do you want? To talk to you. Let me in, please. Who are you? Special agent, United States government. Oh. Oh, well, come in. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I fix you a drink? Well, this isn't exactly a social call. I suppose you've come to see me about the Count's missing Corot. Yes. He wants it back. What am I supposed to do? Open a trunk and hand it to you? Well, that'd help. You got it? No. You should know that. I've been followed every minute for the past two weeks. I've had my room searched as only the French can do it. You offered the Count $25,000 for the picture. Yes, I knew he wouldn't sell. So I made the grand gesture. You know it's illegal to export a picture of such importance? Of course. Art is my business. You represent the first galleries in New York, right? Some women come to Paris for gowns. I come for pictures. How long have you been here? Five weeks. Uh -huh. I understand you're sailing in a couple of days. Yes. Make some interesting purchases? Mm, I've accumulated the usual artistic nonentity for the carriage trade. Nothing exceptional, hmm? like a coral. No. Buy all your pictures in Paris? Look, my firm has done very well without resorting to international thievery. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Manning... I have to make myself pretty. Of course. Well, I'll be seeing you. Please do. After a time in the service, a special agent develops a special sensitivity towards the guilt symptoms a criminal might reveal when you're talking to him. In Miss Benet's case, they registered zero, and I was ready to call Inspector Andre, the art detective, and tell him to go sip an absinthe when... Instead, he called me at my apartment. Uh, Monsieur Tom, I am very excited. Not me. I'm very unexcited. I spoke to the girl this afternoon. I got nowhere with her. She will not return it. 
Yes, she hasn't got it. And I believe her. Nevertheless, we will get it back, thanks to you. To me? You planted the thought in my head. I did? Hmm, about the imitation copy of Corot. Well, good for me. <laughs> and I said to myself, Andre, if you can find out who painted this imitation, you can find out who stole the original. But there was no signature on it. Ah, why artist is his own signature. The brushes he uses, the thickness of his colors, his style, these are signatures. Well, I'll take your word for it. So, this afternoon, I've gone to see some of the better experts in painting. And they have absolutely identified the work. No kidding. No, the imitation was painted by César Laval, a painter of some skill and no scruples. César Laval? Uh -huh. But that is not all. César Laval has been working exclusively for the Carpentier Gallery. Have you arrested Laval? No. We have left Paris very suddenly. Does that uh, not show guilt? It helps, but we've still got to find him. Oh, the they will find him. I have no doubt of that. By noon of the next day, every informer in the Parisian underworld was looking for the whereabouts of Monsieur Laval. About two o'clock, I went to the Carpentier Gallery to take a look around. A middle-aged sales lady approached me. Bonjour, monsieur. Is Mr. Carpentier the proprietor in? He is away on a short business trip. Perhaps I can help you. I am his wife. I don't know. A friend of mine bought a painting here by César Laval. You still have any of his works? Uh, oui, monsieur. This way, please. You are an American? Yes. These landscapes are his. Well, they all look the same. Almost identical. Sort of a mass production. They sell very reasonably. Only 500 francs. If I trusted my own judgment, I'd say they looked, uh, well, pretty mediocre. Oh, he's no great artist, but there is a certain freshness. We have sold many of these to your fellow countrymen. You have anything else by Laval? Uh, no, monsieur. I understand Mr. Laval is an excellent copyist. I did not know that. Could you tell me where I might find him? Uh, no, monsieur. He is of the unstable temperament. He makes a few francs. Then he goes away. I see. You will take one of these Laval landscapes. Uh, 450 francs? Mm, I think I will, yes. No, not that one. It looks like it's been scratched. Oh, that. Uh, some foolish gendarme thought he would find some masterpiece hidden underneath it. Uh, let me give you another one. Shall I wrap it for you? No, 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 thank you. Something else, perhaps, that attracts your eye. No, that'll be all. Here's your money. Four hundred and fifty francs. Merci. You now own a genuine Laval. And for only 450 francs. Yeah. Someday it may be worth 450 francs. Goodbye. Merci, monsieur. Detective. The following day, Miss Banet sailed for New York. In the meantime, we hadn't located Laval, the painter whose imitation Corot had been found by the Comte de Montpellier. Without him, this thing was going to be tough to crank. But finally, they found him. Hey, Monsieur Tom, wake up. Come to the door. What is it? Quick, let me in. Well, you look like you've got big news. Oh, we have found him. We have his address. Oh. Laval's address. Get dressed, quick. Okay, give me a minute. Shave and a quick shower. And... Oh, this job, it does not matter if you are not beautiful. <laughs> Allons-y. Allons-y. For two days, Laval had not left his home. The caretaker told me that had been hiding. If your theory is right, then Carpentier had Laval paint the imitation Corot. Absolutely. Ah, well, we will walk. It's only around the corner. Ah, in a few minutes, monsieur, it will be over. I hope you're right. Ah, here is the place at the top of the stairs. Oh, this will be a great victory for the Sea of Day. Uh-huh. 
In the name of the Sierte, who right? Laval, you are under arrest. Looks like he's not receiving company today. Back. I'm going to shoot the lock off. Laval! Nobody's here. Let's take a look around. A few pencil sketches. Dirty dishes. Here's a passport. Hey, monsieur, quick! What have you got there? Behind these couch, look. Is... Is that him? Oh, bien sûr. The corpse of César Laval. You don't think the motive was robbery, then? Oh, no, 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 no. They made it look like robbery, but this was the work of a paid assassin. I know the trademark well. The quick knife thrust between the shoulder blade. Huh? You think this ties in with the missing picture? Laval dead is as important to others as he was to us, alive. Carpentier? Oui. What's the next move, then? We go to inquire about the very interesting passport Monsieur Laval used so recently. The one that says he visited Amsterdam only 30 days ago. We checked Laval's recent visit to Amsterdam and we learned some pretty significant facts. Laval had taken four of his own paintings with him. One of them, Inspector Andre was certain, covered the stolen masterpiece. Andre was sure Laval had shipped them from Amsterdam to New York to avoid too close a scrutiny by the French customs inspectors. So we went to Amsterdam and checked with all the shipping services. There was no record of any shipment to the first galleries in New York. We stood on a street corner, tired and more than a little baffled. I tell you, Laval shipped the paintings from here. Not according to the authorities. They have no record of Laval shipping anything. Wait a minute. Huh? I wait? Maybe he got someone else to ship it for him as part of a larger shipment. Oh, you're right. He could have done that. Uh-huh. Bought pictures in some of the gallery and sent them together. Yeah. Oh, come, monsieur. We must go to visit the gallery. We divided the territory, and in the next four days, I acquired a liberal but painful education in the field of art. Everywhere I went, I showed Laval's photograph and the Laval landscape I had bought from Carpentier. On the morning of the fifth day, I went into a picture house that was doing a brisk business. Yeah? Some fine prints today. Perhaps some china. Uh, we ship all over the world. America, South America. No, I'm not buying today. Will you take a look at this landscape, please? Uh, I handled some like it not long ago. About five weeks ago, would you say? Uh, yeah. Uh, See, who are you anyway? You remember the man's name? Was it Laval? César Laval? I do not remember the exact name. Here. Take a look at this photograph. Yeah, that's him. I will never forget that face. Tell me why. He came in one day and bought a dozen of my cheapest canvases. He did not even look at them. They were atrocious, some of them. Then he had me ship them for him. Only the twelve pictures? Uh, no, no. He added his four own canvases, and I shipped them together. Where did you send them? Wait, I, I, I will find the shipping bill. I keep good records. Oh, such terrible pictures they were. Even for the American trade. Ah, here it is. Sixteen canvases shipped to Mr. Alan Haskin. 1198 Longdale Road. Meadows, New Jersey. Inspector Andre wasn't in the hotel room when I got back. While I waited for him, I put through a call to New York. About an hour later, the inspector returned, and I told him what I'd learned from the Amsterdam art dealer. Ah, monsieur. In one week, we will have the picture back. This has been a great day for you, monsieur Tom. For me? Why? Well, you are completely vindicated. You say, uh, Mr. Haskins from New Jersey received the shipment? Yeah. Then you are right about Miss Bernard. She is innocent. Uh, before you bubble over, inspector... I just spoke to New York. Ah, yes. You told them that we were coming, huh? Uh-huh. And I got some information about Mr. Alan Haskins. Example? Mr. Haskins is half owner of the first gallery. So? And the other half is owned by Miss Adelaide Bannard. Well, 
Two days later, we were in New York instituting a nationwide search for the missing coho. But a week passed by and it hadn't turned up. In the meantime, I'd checked the reports on Miss Banai's activities since she got back to New York and there was nothing especially significant in them. Andre's early jubilation had changed to a bitter gloom. Well, I had thought for certain the buyer of the picture would shout to the world, Look, I have a coho. But if the buyer knew it was stolen, he wouldn't advertise the fact that he had it. Would he? But what sort of insanity is this? To own a picture like this and not share it with others? Well, it's possible, isn't it? Well, I think it's possible, I suppose. Mm. Now, there's only one thing left for us to do. Confront the Miss Banet and demand the return of the painting. And give her a chance to warn whoever has it. Eh? Oh, we will not leave until she tells us. I am certain of her guilt. No, this is serious, monsieur. There is murder involved, too. But all the evidence is circumstantial. Unless we can find the picture. We will make her tell us where it is. I have methods. We don't use them here. Oh, monsieur, I implore you. Uh, this is your baby, Andre. <laughs> and so, Inspector, voila. We are now in the sacred precincts of the first gallery. Crashik? Just like you'd imagine it to look. The only spot in America where you can still see lorgnettes. Sure. What is it? Idea. Two of Laval's hideous landscapes. May I help you? Uh, these landscapes. Very interesting. Bachelard Laval. One of the outstanding contemporary French painters. Mm. The manager, Miss Banneri. Have you been? I believe she's in her office. We'll go see her, Andre. Perhaps I'd better ask her if she's free. Well, don't trouble yourself. Where's the office? Up those stairs to the mezzanine. Come on, ami. I'm getting impatient. Ah. I did not expect that she would display the Laval landscapes here. Eh, she's a pretty shrewd gal. She knew we might trace him to this place. And if we find the two missing Lavals, we find the coho. Have they had time to restore the original painting? Oh. Come in. The antisocial Laval Miss Manning I met in Paris. The other gentleman, I don't know. Inspector Andre of the French Sûreté. Quite a formidable team. Sit hmm. down, gentlemen. Mademoiselle, we do not beat around the bushes. I have come to take back the coal. I see. And all trails lead to me. Yes. Will you answer a few questions? I believe I have the right to refuse. That's right. Do you refuse? Not at all. Go ahead. Ah, and Mademoiselle, Coros. Sir Lelac was shipped here? No. Did this firm receive a group of paintings from Amsterdam, 16 canvases, I believe? Yes. Included in that shipment were four Laval landscapes? I believe so. This shipment was not consigned to this firm, but to your partner. Why? Mr. Haskins has been ill at home for some months. I wanted him to see the pictures before they were displayed in the gallery. Why were Monsieur Laval's canvases included in that shipment from Amsterdam? Mm, a matter of expediency. I had commissioned him to buy some cheap canvases with a Dutch flavor. He included his own paintings with a lot. You had four Lavals. We only saw two in your gallery. Where are the other two? Well, I sold them, of course. Ah. To whom? Well, I really don't know. They went out as cash sales. May we examine your sales record? Uh, you may not. May I make a suggestion? Certainly. After we're gone, contact your attorney. Explain to him the nature of our investigation. Tell him the following governmental agencies are vitally interested. The Treasury Department, the Department of Commerce, and the State Department. Mm, I see. And what do you think this consultation will lead to? The exact whereabouts of the two missing Laval. <laughs> We paid our return visit to the gallery next morning. The metallic Miss Banai was waiting for us. I had expected you earlier. We wanted you to have plenty of time to think it over. It didn't take that long. You consulted your attorney? That wasn't at all necessary. You asked for certain information? I got it for you. Good. One landscape was sold to a Mr. Andrew Holt, West Dairy End Drive, Long Island. Get that, Andre? Oui. Holt. Is that the railroad man? I believe he is. Ah, I haven't heard his name for 15 years. I thought he was dead. He's very much alive. Does he buy here often? No. And the other one went to a Mrs. Elizabeth Burton, 1461 Parkway Place. Aha, now we are getting some places. (laughs) 
Then we rode out to Mrs. Elizabeth Burton's home on Parkway Place. She led us into her study where the Laval was hanging. Andre examined it minutely, and he told me it was a Laval and nothing more. From there, we went to Andrew Holt's estate on Long Island. And it was an estate, complete with iron gates and a long, curving driveway. Hmm, it's a formidable place, this Monsieur Holt's residence. Secluded, isn't it? Hmm. We have no trouble getting in. He's not exactly renowned for his hospitality. Well? My credentials, sir. Hmm. Special agent. What do you want here? We are interested in your paintings, monsieur. My paintings are not for public view. You will have to wait until I die. This is not just idle curiosity, sir. This is an official call. I see. Well, come in. You are interested in one specific painting? A Laval landscape. Come this way. Hmm. Monsieur, why do you keep your pictures covered? That is my business. They belong to me and me alone. Here is your Laval. Hmm? Ah. Eh? That is it. Do you mind if we take a look at some of your other paintings? They are not for public view. Their coverings are removed only for my eyes. I'm sorry, sir. We must see them. For 15 years, I've shared these with no one. Not even a servant. Remove the coverings, please. Oh. oh. A Rembrandt. Yes. The dancer. I've spoken to her many times. On a lonely evening, we talk together. Another one, please. Rousseau's sunset. Monsieur, do you keep these hidden from the unhappy eyes of the world? Rousseau's sunset. How young it makes me just to look at it. You see those two lovers? The man is I. Mr. Holt, you can save us a lot of time. We'd like to see Corot's sur le lac. Corot sur le lac? <laughs> How I wish I possessed it. What I would give for it. You do not have it, monsieur? No. Unfortunately, no. We looked at every painting in his considerable collection. He owned a million dollars worth of masterpieces, but there was no coral to be found. In his eerie way, Mr. Holt introduced us to his collection as though they were living beings. Before we left, Andre stood before the Laval painting again. I saw him take out his little pen knife and make a quick, tiny scratch on its surface. Then we left and got into the car. Stop when you get outside the gate. What for? He has it. In the house. I'm certain. What makes you think so? That Laval painting you saw me test it with my knife. Yeah? It isn't a Laval at all. It's a copy of a Laval. A copy of a copy? Hey, done only recently. Probably yesterday. Look, look at the pigment on my knife. Huh? Wet and fresh. Banay had one made for him in a hurry when she knew we were closing in. We? Oui. Oh, we will wait till it is dark. Then we will go and get the coal. Well, why not now? Oh, you see us coming and hide it again. And it won't be hidden tonight? No. When he thinks he is safe, he'll take it out to gloat over it. Like a miser in his gold. About nine o'clock I will be good to you You will never want for light Or air Or companionship We moved quietly into the room We will have many talks together And I will see what you have hidden in your shadows And I will get to know the mystery of your power I guess we might as well Come in with you such sentiment. I always wish for a... Hey, oui, monsieur. That man is as close to happiness as heaven will permit. This 
This is Douglas Fairbanks again. Adelaide Benet paid for the criminal offense of smuggling objects of art into the United States. Luckily for her, she had no connection with the murder of César Laval. For this crime, Monsieur Carpentier of the Carpentier Galleries in France made a final accounting. The recovery of the stolen masterpiece closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicles of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving heartbreak, fraud, and the United States mail. In the file case entitled, The Miracle Cure, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. The file case, The Missing Masterpiece, was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in our cast were Ben Wright, Eve McVeigh, Robert Boone, Sally Cassell, and Byron Kane. Your announcer is Don Sam. Douglas Fairbank is presenting Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture, Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The man is nailing a horse's picture to the wall. The horse is pawing the western skies in the classic attitude of pawing horses, and it is the top half of a calendar distributed by Isaac's livery. It's a hot April day in St. Joseph, Missouri in the year 1882, and the man is hanging the picture in his living room because he has a fondness for the noble beast. Horses have got him out of many a critical situation, such as one, holding up railroads, two, robbing banks, three, murdering fellows. His name is Jesse James, and as soon as he finishes hanging that picture, a friend of his is going to shoot the back of his head off. So tonight, my transcribed report to you on the death of a picture hanger. Crime Classics, a new series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. Tonight, we take you to Jefferson City, Missouri, to the mansion of the governor of that state. His name was Crittenden, but his cronies called him Critch. He liked living in the governor's mansion because he never had it so good. There were servants, crystal chandeliers, wine furnished by cronies, entertainments by cronies, and best of all, six small gilded cherubs, backs bent cheerfully to support a cast iron bathtub, and quite often the governor also. So, if you've never attended the governor taking a bath, here's your chance. Uh, where's that soap? Where is it? Oh, there it is, Critch. Ah. Right behind you. Uh, sir. Uh-huh? Uh, when's the last time you had a bath? Uh, Kansas City. Just after the hanging of Billy Bob Williams. You see, that was, uh... March 12th, last. <laughs> what a memory you got, Governor. Yeah, hanging outlaws one of the nicest parts of this job, Timberlake. You ever get to be Governor, hang a lot of outlaws and remember when. That way you can tell people and people will be impressed and keep you Governor. <laughs> I'll remember. Uh, hand me that rose water and glycerin, Sheriff. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks. Hmm. <sighs> Uh, you you know what I called you down here for? Got an idea. Tell me and I'll tell you if you're right. Jesse James? Mm. 
Look good on my record. He to die somehow soon. During my administration in my state. People will cheer you wherever you go. They like the sound of people cheering. Governor. Uh, hand me that towel, sir. Oh. Uh, thanks. Governor, I've been thinking. Scheming kind of thinking? Oh, you might say. About Jesse? If it works, people are liable to cheer you right on to Washington. <laughs> then there's no telling what. In a case like that, you liable to be standing right where I'm standing. That's right. Get Jesse for me. I'm gonna do that. <clears throat> Not since Kansas City, huh, sir? Sure. Not since then. Well, how'd you like to take a bath right now? I didn't want to say nothing. I uh, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> She's all yours, Sheriff. Enjoy yourself. Sheriff Timberlake was a man who instinctively knew his way around a bathtub. He soaked, lathered, and rinsed, and was out of there in the shake of a lamb's tail. Then he went home. Then he changed his clothes. He got into a nondescript outfit of brown woolen pants and a black alpaca coat, and he went down to Kansas City. Many things were to be found in Kansas City. A wooden monument, long since burned, of Daniel Sanker, who got a message through to his beleaguered dad, a grand opera house, and three mechanical pianos, each with fiddle attached. All in all, it was a very happy community. Worthy of note is the fact that Spit in the Ocean, a poker variation, was invented at Bobrick's Poker Palace during this era. And it is into this very den that Sheriff Timberlake wandered. He wandered here because he was looking for someone, a girl. A young lady whose job it was to stand in back of strangers at the gaming tables and make signals to the housemen on the opposite side. When Timberlake approached her, she had three fingers in the air and the tip of her tongue pointing to the left. Maddie. Oh. Up you, honey. Want to talk with you, Maddie. A second. Raise you. Carl. I got me a one-eyed jack in the hole. Gives me three of them. Where'd you say you're from? Roanoke? Nice place. Come on. Out here. What you want? How's Johnny? You said you weren't going to turn him in. For favors. What you want him to do? Nothing. What you want? Jesse James. Oh. Got to clean up Missouri, Matty. Oh? Got to start with Jesse. If you say it. Here, yeah, Jesse's staying with Robert and Charlie Ford. That's right. Now, your friends, ain't they, Matty, Robert and Charlie Ford? I used to know them pretty good. Ain't hard to talk to old friends, Matty. And you ain't gonna touch Johnny, are you? You just tell Robert and Charlie Ford I'm at Stan Pony's boarding house right now. I ain't got a gun either. That all you want me to do? You tell them, Matty. Yeah. Come on in, boys. Well, didn't Matty tell you I left my guns back in Jefferson City? Just you come on in. Bob, over there. All right. Glad to see you back in Missouri, Charlie. Heard you and Robert were over in Kansas for a while. Heard you were in jail. Heard you killed a man to get out. Glad to see you back in Missouri. Bob, get him. All right. I told you I weren't holding no iron, boys. Making sure. Take your shirt off him, Bob. 
Now let him go, Bob. How come you ain't holding nothing, Sheriff? Now you know what I'm going to say, you believe. Go on back here, Bob, where you was before. All right. Sheriff, you crazy? Let me ask you a question, then you decide. How'd you like a full pardon for what you've done in Missouri, Charlie? Robert, you need never go back into Kansas. You're free to stay here as long as you live. Come and go as you please. Don't have to worry about killing four people in Missouri. Besides, have $10,000. You've been robbing, you've been stealing, you've been killing. You got $10 between you? Both of you, murderers, thieves, scum. I figured you'd do that. I'm glad you did. Because now you're hating yourself. Put your gun back, Bob. Let him run on a little bit more. You like Jesse James, Charlie? Ain't nothing about him I like or don't like. You like Jesse, Robert? Man's talking to you, Robert. He wants to know you like Jesse. Do you? <laughs> Once Jesse and Bob had a little fight. Two years ago, Bob was only 19, and Jesse a full-grown man. When Jesse was finished with Bob, Bob got to be a full-grown man. The governor wants Jesse dead or alive. A lot of people do. Governor says he'd give both of you a full pardon and $10,000 for Jesse. Ain't no bargain, Jesse being who he is. Gunfighter like he is, and fast like Whatever he... do it, be a hero. People cheer... That'd be nice. What'd you say, Robert? That'd be nice. Ride with the governor. That'd be nice. <laughs> Being a hero instead of a running dog. I like that word. Hero? Yeah. Robert? Yeah? Say it. Hero. <laughs> now, what's the matter? Listen to what I can say. Ten thousand dollars. Well, boys? Jesse James died all of a sudden. Wouldn't take long for you to hear about it. We'd let you know. That's a promise. Chain reaction. Governor in bathtub, sheriff in waiting, Matty, the girl card watcher, and the brothers Ford, Robert, and Charlie, the principals involved in getting Jesse James assassinated. It would be well at this point to remark upon some of the accomplishments of Jesse James. His standard feat was murdering cowboys and rustling cattle. One incident in Star County, Texas, had him murdering single-handedly three cowboys and driving off 500 fine head of beef a record which stands to this day. On record, too, is his slaying by Bowie Knife of Mr. John W. Wicker, a Pinkerton man from Chicago. Then there were several train robberies, outstanding of which was the one five miles east of Council Bluffs, where he and his men derailed the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Express. The cars telescoped. The engineer was instantly killed. Twelve passengers were seriously injured. And Jesse and his men robbed them all. There are many other mayhems too numerous to mention, except that they averaged 1.37 corpses per exploit. One act of kindness must be noted, however. Mr. Avery Thompson, hurt grievously by a runaway horse in the streets of Abilene, pleaded to be put out of his misery. From 50 paces, Jesse obliged. His act of mercy was applauded by all around. It was then this half-kind, half-renegade person that the brothers Ford were going to kill. Charlie and Robert went home, lit the kerosene lamp, and waited. They didn't have to wait too long.
Hi, Jesse. Come on in. It was a Saturday night when Jesse walked through that doorway in Ray County, and Sunday was his favorite day because he could sleep late. Listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Tomorrow night, if you're in the mood for still more adventure listening, don't miss 21st Precinct, the program that probes the inner workings of the world's largest police force. 21st Precinct shows you policemen as the human beings they are, exposes their tough grinds, their dangerous careers. Remember, it's Tuesday nights on most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on The Death of a Picture Hanger. The night Jesse James walked into the Ford home, he was carrying a 45 Colt on one hip, 45 Smith Wesson on the other, and a 44 Derringer in his waistcoat, and a Winchester rifle hung limply from his left hand. Armed in this manner was standard operating procedure for Jesse when he walked into homes, a procedure which varied only some years before when he courted. At this time of romance, he did not wear the Derringer. It should be remarked, however, that the Winchester was kept by his feet like a faithful old dog. All of which adds up to the fact that all of the people who tried before this Saturday night to kill Jesse were long dead. And the Ford boys, Robert and Charlie, were well aware of this fact. But Robert wanted to be a hero. And Charlie wanted $10,000. So they were very hospitable. Sit in the rocket, Jess. Uh, want some whiskey? Bob. Heard you have been in Jefferson City, Jess. Here you are, Jess. You must be sleepy, Jess. What's the matter with you, Bob? You don't have to tell Jess when he's sleepy. Jess knows when he's sleepy. I just don't want to talk important things to him, that's all. Not when his head's nodding. Simmer down, Bob. All right, Jess, I'll tell you. We're tired of lazing around. Me and Charlie have been doing nothing, just waiting for you to say go. When are you going to say go, Jess? (laughs) Kid's anxious, Jess. Just like kids. Tired, that's all. Been on my back like this for a week, Jess. Worrisome, ain't he? Listen, Jess, we figured something. The train, Jess. Trains are easy. You hear what he said? You hear what he said, Charlie? Trains are easy. Kid. The Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific out of Kansas City. It makes a stop at Winston, Jess. At Cameron, too. Here's your drink, Jess. We are gonna do it to the train, Jess? Need some sleep. Bob, fix just that place in the barn. Sure, sure I will. So Bob went out to the barn, fluffed up some straw, and made a bed for Jesse to sleep in. This was considered an act of compassion of the time, barn owners to wayfarers. But in this instance, it was known as a tactic. Get Jesse on his back in the barn with maybe his guns off. Get him while he's sleeping. 
So consider now what we have here. Jesse James bedded down for the night and his two would-be assassins as guardian angels. In the trade, this is known as a precarious position. So switch now from prone Jesse to outside the barn. Nearly midnight in Missouri and a mist from the river threading between Charlie Ford and Bob. When are we going to kill Jess? Try killing him from now on. You think he's sleeping? Where'd you bet him down? Under that window. Let's go peek, see if he's sleeping. What you think? He's lying there, all right. Eyes closed? Can't tell. I sure tell this, though. What? Look at that pool of moon. Wait a minute, I'll get out of your way. See? He's holding a gun in each hand. He's a light sleeper. When he sleeps. We don't even know he's sleeping. Charlie. Hmm. Shoot him. Kill him. You want to be the hero, younger brother. You do. This is supposing I miss. I'll shoot you just where you're standing if you miss. Because if you miss, you wake Jess. And I'll just explain to Jess that I killed you to save his life. That way saving mine. If we were sure he's sleeping, be no trouble at all. You make sure. If some kind of animal or something walked by him soft, that'd be a way. Hey, you wait here a minute. Come here, you little old dog. That's right. You're too old to live anyhow. Little dog's too old to live anyhow, Charlie. Step aside a minute. I push him through this chink in the wall. Critter'd run into the barn past, Jess, and we'll find out for sure. You're chattering like a woman, Bob. Just do it. Bob and Charlie huddled together that night. And in the morning, they flashed their nicest, sleepiest grins when they awoke to find Jesse James standing over them. I shot me this critter last night. Who's gonna cook me my breakfast? The boys tumbled out of bed and vied who would be first at the skillet. Bob won, and Charlie put the kettle on. It was late, and it was Sunday, so they had brunch. Toward its end, as a gesture of carefree camaraderie, Jesse heaved the Ford's best china against the wall. Breaking them against the wall's easy, Jess. Why don't you throw them up in the air and shoot them? You crazy, Bob. What'd you tell them to do that for? We use up all his boots and then we... <laughs> Watch it, Jess! <laughs> Ain't gonna hit you, Bob. Just seeing how close I can come. In the name of heaven, oh, Jess! Cut it out, Jess. You got the kid almost crying. Stand <laughs> still. See how you like it, Charlie. See if I can fan your ear without drawing blood. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go do it to a train. Which meant riding down to Winston. Which meant for the Ford boys a constant vigilance for the moment when Jesse would turn his back, would ride ahead of them a few paces. Anything so that they could have an irretrievable advantage. Historians make category of this event as the ride to Winston with the Fords up front. Jesse just didn't trust anybody to ride in back of him, except his mom, but then she was only comfortable on very slow horses. So down to Winston they rode, and at 9.30 p.m. on Monday night, they boarded the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific train. As soon as the train started, they dressed themselves in white linen dusters. They wore red handkerchiefs over their faces, and they waited in the vestibule for the conductor. Fifteen minutes later, Jesse James and the Fords left behind them two corpses, a wounded engineer, and an empty duck cage, the boys having released a dozen ducks from the express car. They took with them $8,000 in cash and convertible mementos. The boys jumped off the train at a point where they had tethered their horses. Then they rode south. They rode to St. Joseph, Missouri. They rode to the home of Jesse James, with Jesse 
riding behind. Wait out here, boys. Ann. Annie. Is that you, Jess? Sure. I'm in the kitchen. Oh, hello, Jess. Don't you kiss me now, Ann. You wait till I wash off this road dust. I don't mind. You're too pretty to get mussed up. Oh, Jess. What do you got there, Ann? I was in Isaac's today to see about some harness. He gave me this calendar. He said, you put this up in a nice place, Mrs. Howard. Everybody in town calls you Mrs. Howard, don't they, Ann? They call us the Happy Howards. They ask what you do, I say a traveling man. You been traveling, Jess? Brought your watch, Mrs. Howard. Yeah. Why, Mr. Howard, porcelain and gold, just what I wanted. Now you go away and wash so I can kiss you. What you doing to that calendar, Jess? Pretty picture of a horse, Ann. Tear off the calendar part, it'll look nice in the parlor. Nail it up in the parlor, Ann. Some tacks and a hammer in the cabinet. Brought the Ford boys with me, Ann. Oh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. I'll have the boys come in. You make us something to eat. I'll fetch you some water first for washing. Come on in, boys. You boys like this picture? Right good picture of a horse. What are you going to do with it, Jess? Figure to hang it here somewhere. I wouldn't want me a picture of no horse in the parlor. You just ain't got no eye. No, he ain't. Yeah, I, I think hanging a picture like that's real good. Where are you going to hang it, Jess? Here, I guess. Oh, that's too low to hang a picture. Yeah. Higher, huh? Hmm. Had me that picture, and I was gonna hang it. I'd hang it high. Mm, maybe you're right. Pleasant to be home. How's your missus? Pleasant to be home. Man don't have to carry around all these guns weighing heavy around his middle. Yeah, feels mighty fine. I said, how's your missus, Jess? Getting water. Gonna cook us something. Get off that chair, Bob. What for? You stupid. I said I was going to hang me this picture. All right. Pretty picture. Bob. All right. All right, Charlie! He shot the back of Jesse's head off, Bob. That make me a hero, don't it? Sure does. Shooting Mr. Howard, alias Jesse James, in the back was a very heroic deed. So heroic that a song was written about it. The refrain goes, And the dirty little coward, he shot Mr. Howard and laid Jesse James in his grave. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. All right.
that man. I guess that's all. Put him on the stretcher and take him to the morgue. Oh, must I stay, Inspector? For a while, Mrs. Bunting. Oh, dear. I... I need all the details for my report. Oh, that such a thing could have happened here. Here in my own house. <laughs> Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Lodger, by Mrs. Bellock Lowndes. Peter Lorre is The Lodger, and Alan Bunting is played by Miss Agnes Moorhead. Mystery in the Air, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Mrs. Bunting, you said you were looking for a lodger? Uh, yes, yes, Inspector, we had to. But I never dreamed such a thing could happen here to us. Why, it was only last Tuesday night my husband and I were sitting before our fire reading the newspaper about the latest murder. It was the theft by, by the Avenger. Yes, yes, I remember saying distinctly, Robert... Oh, but this Avenger person, you know, he could be the fellow standing next to you, or maybe the man you bump into. It's a terrible thought. Yes, but it appears to me that the Avenger's too quick for the police. And look here. Look here, it says this girl he got last night was like all the others. Pretty blonde, and she'd just come from a music hall. Exactly like all the rest of his victims. Oh, what a pity. Ellen, have you stopped to think who fits that description perfectly? Our own Daisy. Oh, sure. What a pretty thought, Bunting. It's a good thing she's with her aunt instead of here. London isn't a safe place for any girl now. Just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it would be to have her here with well, us. Well, there's no sense even talking about it. We just can't afford it. Oh, I know that, Ellen, but I hope we could manage it some way. How? Haven't I scrimped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? I know, Ellen. Well, don't you go worrying about it. I think we can... Who do you suppose that could be? Could it be someone looking for a room? Oh, I wish it were. Then you could have your daisy back. Well, I went to the front door. And when I opened it, there stood a man wearing a black cape and hat. He carried but a single piece of luggage. Good evening, sir. I saw your sign. Says you have a room to rent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, uh, could I take your cape, sir? No, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. But it should be very quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Just that. <laughs> Above all, our house is quiet. Okay. Your bag, sir. May I take it? No, just show me the room, please. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. This way. You see, sir, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking. Well, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think I like this room. Yes, it is pleasant, isn't it? Ah, there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures, now is there? I don't know. Pretty pictures interest me very little. What I like about this room is... Uh, it's the simplicity. I like the bareness. Yes, I, I think I'll take it. What is your name? Mrs. Bunting, sir. All right, Mrs. Bunting, I, I'll take the room. Oh, yes, sir. And please let me help you with your luggage. No, don't I... you touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to, to... I know, I know. You only wish to help, Mrs. Bunting. It's, uh, it's just, uh, forgive me, it's, it's just that I... 
I'm weary. I'm, I'm very tired. Uh, see, I do a lot of studying. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, sir. Of course. Well, anyway, you can see how few things I need. It's, it's just what, what's in this bag. But this... This here is my favorite book. Hmm? It's the Bible. Good book, Mrs. Bunting, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed it is, sir. Yes, it says, uh, he brings them to their desired haven. Hmm? Beautiful words, huh? And now at last I found my haven of rest. Now, Mrs. Bunting, uh, if I pay you 30 shillings a week for this room, that's satisfactory? Oh, why, yes, sir, yes, sir, that's, that'll be quite all right. My name is Sleuth. Mr. Sleuth? Yes, Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. <laughs> Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. Here. Here are your 30 shillings. Oh, oh thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, would you be wishing anything now? Supper, tea, or... Mm, no, nothing. Uh, good night, Miss Bunting. Uh, yes. Yes, good night, sir. Please stop that. You hear? Oh, oh, sir, I... What did I do? You were humming. That's music. Oh, but I... I music always... is an instrument of sin. Oh, y- yes, sir. And you did tell me, Mrs. Bunting, that your house would be absolutely quiet. Oh, but it is, sir. I, I didn't mean any harm. Believe I me, sir. I... I believe you, I... I'm sorry I spoke sharply. I, I know you. You are trying to be considerate and kind. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank oh, uh, you. By the way, Mrs. Bunting, I, I think I would like some bread and some tea. Oh, certainly, certainly, sir. I'll have it in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> so he took the room, eh, Ellen? Yes. He, he took the room at, at 30 shillings a week. Yes, in advance. Oh, hurry now, Bunting. It's the water for the tea hot, yes. Yes, what a stroke. Put the bread and the butter on the tray. I'll pour the water. You know, Ellen, it's wonderful. Yes, it is. Do you realize what this means? We can have Daisy back with yes, us now. Yes, I know, I know. Hurry with it now, why, why, we can have her back with now, us tomorrow. Now, the water and the tea, and I guess... Yes, it's all ready. Open the door, Bunting. I'll take it up to him right away. There you go, old girl. First thing in the morning, I'm going to fetch Daisy and bring her home. Oh, it's a wonderful night, Ellie. Wonderful. Oh, oh, I mustn't do that. And she has cast down many wounds from her. Yes, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in. And to know how the wickedness of folly... Oh, oh why, why, Mr. Sleuth, you, you... Yes? What is it? Those pictures, hmm? those pretty girls, you've turned all their faces yes, to the wall. Yes, I've turned them to the wall because they are wicked and sinful. Oh, but, sir, Don't I... Don't you agree, Mrs. Bunting, that everything wicked and sinful should be purged from the earth? Huh? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I'm happy to hear that, Mrs. Bunting. Now, if you'll excuse me, I... I have to leave. Oh, but, sir, here's your tray. I have... Good night, Mrs. Bunting. You know, for a moment, I was stiff with fear. I set the tray down. He hadn't so much as noticed the light supper I'd prepared for him and rushed to the window to watch. He came out of our cottage and moved off down the street, his black cape swirling about him. Finally, he was lost in the fog, and I don't know why, but I stared after him for a long, long while. Well, I did the dishes and got ready for bed. I lay there thinking, and it was almost dawn before I had convinced myself that at most he was a trifle odd. And after all, paying 30 shillings, maybe... Maybe he had a right to his strange way. It was daylight when I was suddenly awakened by the newsboys shouting in the street. Horrible murder! Read all about murder it! Murder at King's Cross last night! Avenger strikes again! Slowly Expect- I realized what the newsboys were shouting. Horrible murder! Avenger took <gasps> six victims! Oh no!
As the inspector takes notes of the terrifying events, Alan Bunting continues the story. And now, Mrs. Bunting, what did you do the morning you learned the Avenger had murdered his sixth victim? Well, I was a little frightened to meet our lodger, yet I kept my thoughts to myself. After all, you know, there still wasn't much to go on. Robert had gone to make Daisy, so Mr. Sleuth ate breakfast alone. I watched him through the crack in the door. Finally, I went in with more tea. Hmm? Uh, uh, tea? Uh, no. No, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bunting. I, I don't care for any more tea, thanks. Uh, you're very kind. But I have to go on with my work now, if you'll excuse me. My fear really changed to pity then. Oh, he seemed so helpless and tired. And he was so considerate. This man couldn't be a murderer. It was all a coincidence. Besides, we just couldn't afford to lose that 30 shillings a week. Well, around 10 in the morning, he left the cottage. And I decided to go upstairs and have a look about his room. I had to find out what he carried in his one piece of luggage. It wasn't a bag. It was more like a case. Yes. Yes, a case. A case for a knife. I rushed upstairs, my heart beating wildly at the thought I'd had of the case. No. No, there wasn't anything in his closet. I went over to the chest of drawers against the wall. Nothing in the top one. In the next one, there was just some socks and some underclothes. The next one was empty. There was only one other place for the small, narrow case. The bottom drawer. And it was locked. I pulled and pulled at it. And then suddenly I heard the front door open downstairs. In a panic, I rushed out of the room and down the hall. Oh, you're upstairs, Ellen. Oh. Look, Ellen, Daisy's here. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, Mother, it's oh. so good to see you. It's so good to be home. Oh. Why, whatever's the matter? Yes, you're quite white, Ellen. Oh, I... It's... it's uh, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. It's just that I wasn't expecting you so soon. Uh, well, it's good to be back. The country's <laughs> all right, but there's nothing like London now, is there? Oh, no. No, no, that isn't. Well, as long as that Avenger's about, you're going to have something to do to keep this young lady indoors, London or no London. <laughs> oh, don't you worry. Mother will see to that. Oh, well, Daisy, I... I might as well get you settled. You see, Father? What did I tell you? She'll have a dust cloth in my hand oh. before I have my coat on. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sleuth. Why is my door open? We, we, we were just leaving, sir. Have you been in my room? Oh, oh, oh uh, uh, not at all. Not at all, sir. From now on, Mrs. Bunting, I shall keep my room locked. Oh, uh, 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 but you see, sir, I, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he brought our daughter home. Uh, 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 she just arrived. Uh, this is this is Daisy. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, she, she's been away for quite a while. That's why we're a bit excited, you might say. Yes. Uh, you were probably surprised to hear us laughing and carrying on. Yes, yes, I, I must say I was, I was, but, uh, but then... Uh, there are different kinds of joy, are there not, Daisy? Yes. Yes, I'm sure there are. Yes. There is the despicable evil joy of the abandoned, and and then there is the divine happiness of the blessed. That's a great difference. You understand that, Daisy, don't you? Why, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Slew. Good, there. There are so few young women nowadays who do. Why, Mr. Slew, you mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have any fun? Enjoyment and fun, my child, are a devil's breeding ground. All his implements are there. Pleasure and impropriety. The temptation of music, dancing. Oh, that's crazy. Why, there's nothing I like better than dancing. And I'm not... You like to she, dance? She didn't know what she was saying, Mr. Sleuth. She's just a child. Daisy, you know you've never been one for dancing. You've never learned how but to... But I did learn, Mother, while I was away. What's so wrong about it? What's the harm in dancing? It says she lies in wait as for a prey and increases the transgressors among men. I don't know what you mean. I've never heard such nonsense. Nonsense? You call it scripture nonsense? Daisy! Daisy, go into the front room. It's all right, Mrs. Bunting. It's all right. Uh, 
I'm used to that kind of talk. Good day. Daisy. Here. Daisy, listen to me. What, Mother? I, I've got to tell you about... About, about what? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. For a moment, I was about to tell her my awful suspicions, but I stopped. They were only suspicions. At the same time, I had a thought. I'd go to the coroner's inquest they were having for the Avengers' latest victim. I was hoping to hear something said that would clear my suspicions of the larger. At least I'd give him this last chance. A lady was testifying as I took my seat. She'd seen the Avenger from her window, she said. And her description of him didn't tally with Mr. Sleuth at all. Oh, I can't tell you how relieved I was. Till it was pointed out she couldn't possibly have seen anyone that night from her window because of the fog. <laughs> then the next witness was a Mr. Cannot. I leaned forward anxiously as they swore him in and began asking questions. You say, Mr. Kennedy, that you're positive that you saw this man? Positive, sir. It was only a few moments before the murder that I saw the Avenger. Uh, uh, describe him. Well, he wore a black cape, I believe, and was very gaunt-looking, and was carrying a small handbag. A handbag? Yes, a small, narrow handbag, such a one as might contain a knife. <gasps> Oh, Silence oh, in the court. Uh, proceed, Mr. Uh, Kennedy. Well, he had a low, hesitating voice. I'd say with something of a continental accent. An educated man, I'd judge, but quite mad. And what do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Oh, believe me, sir, he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Oh, oh no, it can't be. It can't be. <gasps> Could there be any doubt about it now? Mr. Sleuth, our lodger, he was the murderer. I got out of the courtroom as quickly as I could. I didn't even notice it had started to rain. I hardly remember going home, running and walking somehow, while the nightmare of fear and terror grew bigger and bigger inside me. It was three streets from our cottage that I saw my husband, Robert. One thought hit me clearly. I realized Daisy must be home alone with the Avenger. Bunting! Bunting! Why, Ellen? Ellen, what is it? Bunting, where's Daisy? Where is she? Where's Daisy? Why, she's at home. Oh, listen, listen, Bunting, listen. Sleuth! Sleuth is the Avenger. What? What are you saying? Ah, oh, larger. He's the Avenger. Daisy's alone with him right now. Hurry! Hurry! Now listen to me carefully, my child, and and rejoice with me in your heart, for for the moment is at hand, and you are not afraid, Daisy, are you? No, I'm not afraid. You are very beautiful, and. And you should live in the ways of righteousness. You hear me, Daisy? You want to live in the ways of righteousness, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. I know you do. I I know. And, and that is why I've been sent to purge your soul so that you will be elevated beyond all sin and evil. You like to dance, Daisy, don't you? Already six have gone on before you and they are beyond all sin and evil. You are the seventh to be elevated, my child, and my work is almost done for the seventh I've promised at this appointed hour. <gasps> be still, Daisy. Daisy. And, Daisy! and don't listen to the temptations of the crowd when they call out your name, because I am here to save you from all evil and wickedness that consumes you like a wildfire of scarlet and crimson. You like to dance, don't you? Yes, I do. Look at me, my child. Look at me and don't fear me. And do not tremble. 
Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, and therefore I must bring you down like the lamb to slaughter. And now I lift my hand with a flaming sword, for now comes the vengeance and the time to rejoice. Take away your hands. Let go of me. Get away. Don't you know that such that are for death to death, and such that are for a sword to the sword, and no one, no one dare to have pity on them. He, 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 He fell on the knife. Yes. And he's burning. He's burning in me like a fire. Oh, it... It purges me and, and consumes me. All sin and evil are falling away. Praise. Praise and glory. For it is I who is the seventh... Yes, the vengeance is fulfilled. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Pursuit! Pursuit. A criminal strikes and fades quickly back into the shadows of his own dark world. And then the man from Scotland Yard, the famous Inspector Peter Black, and the dangerous, relentless pursuit when man hunts man. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Now, with John Dana starred as the famous Inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, Wrigley Spearmint Gum brings you tonight's story, Pursuit of the Limehouse Killers. Chief Inspector Black. Sergeant Meston here, sir. I'll call for you. Mm. Anything important, Meston? I'm just about to go home. No, no, sir. It's a man. He says he won't talk to anyone but you. Oh. Uh, put him on, will you? Yes, sir. Chief Inspector will talk to you. Hello? Hello? Are you there? Tell the other chip to hang up. All right. Now, who's speaking, please? Hello, Peter. This is Mr. Roach. Clive! How are you, old boy? We've been worried about you. Awfully sorry I haven't been able to get in touch sooner. I found the head man. Good work. Who is it? Jackman. Oh, wonderful. Only two things wrong. I can't locate the narcotics and they just popped him off. The what? Who did it? Oh, I don't know. Someone here, I think. Jackman's on the second floor back, the room next to mine. Are you there now? Yes. They're up to something. We'd better make our move then. Right. But I wanted to warn you. Yes? That, uh, when you get here... 
Uh, all, all, all right, Ducky. Uh, keep it warm for me, eh? <laughs> uh, ta ta! Moffitt. Yes, sir? Fetch a car, will you? Right, sir. Couple? Uh, our inside man on the narcotics matter has located the leader. <laughs> For over a year, Scotland Yard had been working on the case. It involved one of the cleverest and most sinister narcotics rings in the British Isles. We knew their methods, and we knew some of their lesser members. But to date, we had been unable to make an arrest. The phone call I had received was from a flying squad man, Clive Furness, who, using the name Roach, had been assigned the unenviable task of living in the neighborhood that harbored the scum and driftwood of London's underworld. Ostensibly, he was one of them. And it was this fact which we had hoped would guide us to the leader of the organization. It took us quite some time to arrive at the dismal, cold water flat in Limehouse. The fog was very dense, and the street lamps waged a valiant but futile battle against it. Taste the filthy stuff, sir. Yes, I know. Mm. It's a fallacy, Moffat. There's not the slightest similarity to... Pea soup. Oh, wait a minute. Did you hear something? A foghorn, sir? No, 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 no. A woman. It sounded as though she were in pain and crying. <laughs> Although I imagine there's a lot of pain down here, Moffat, and not all physical. Come on. Can you make out the numbers? Uh, that was uh, 36 we just passed, sir. Right. Landlord, sir? Yes. Yes. Are you the landlord here? Yes. Scotland Yard. So? We received a report there's been somebody done away with in your building. Done away with? You got the wrong place. Does a man named Jackman live here? Not anymore. Oh? He moved away two days ago. Mm. I should like to see his quarters, please. You're the police. I got to show you. Upstairs. Would you give me your name, please? Caprilas. Do you know where Mr. Jackman went? No. Does anyone else occupy the, occupy the room now? No. Mr. Jackman moved away two days ago and left his clothing? That's right. I wouldn't let him take them. He owed me money for the flat. I told him to pay and I would give his clothes to him. Who tells you this? Somebody dead here. You received a phone call at the yard. It may have been from somebody in the building. Must be a joke. Somebody called to make trouble. How many rooms are there on this floor, Mr. Caprillus? Mm, three. Mm. And who occupies the one next to Mr. Jackman? Nobody. Huh? How long has he been empty? Mm. Two days ago. What was the man's name? I did not say it was a man. Who was it then? A man. Name? Roach. We'll see his room, please. All right. Your tenants move rather hurriedly and frequently, Mr. Capillus. That's against the law? Not at all. Merely an observation. Mr. Caprillus, you always leave the windows open in your vacant flats? Sometimes. If they smell, I leave them open. And did Mr. Uh, Roach, was it, prefer a ladder to the stairs? I was going to paint the building.
You've seen enough? Nobody dead in here. I hadn't expected to find anyone dead in here. Had you, Mr. Caprillus? And in here, Mr. Caprillus? Um, just a girl. You don't have to bother her. She doesn't know anything. She's drunk all the time. Always drunk. You can go downstairs, Mr. Caprillus. I'll see you in a few minutes. You're wasting your time. It was the joke. Nobody dead in here. Keep your eyes open, Moffat. You can watch the front door from the banister. See that nobody leaves. Right, sir. May I speak to you a moment, miss? I'm tired. Go away. It's the police. Asleep. What do you want? There are one or two questions I should like to ask. May I come in? Better use the bed. The chair's broke. No, don't use the bed. All right. Friend of mine broke it. Give me this bruise, too. Have a drink? My friend gives me whiskey, too. No, thank you. I'll use a cup. So I broke the glass. I don't remember when. Yesterday, maybe. Did you know Mr. Jackman along the corridor? Of course I did. When was the last time that you saw him? I don't remember. It was yesterday, maybe. The day before, I don't remember. Sure you won't have a drink? I don't like to drink alone. Sad. Lonely. There was a report phoned into Scotland Yard this evening that Mr. Jackman had been murdered here, possibly in his room. Did you hear anything? No. No, I'll never hear anything. I just live here. I'm on my own business. Have you been here during the whole evening? The whole evening? Oh, yes, I've been here. I was going out for a bite with my friend. But he didn't turn up. I'm frightened. Go away. Leave me alone. Why are you frightened? Don't you know? Everything. Everybody. <laughs> I was going to have a baby once. I wish I'd died too. It's lonely and right. There, um, there was another man on your floor, Mr. Roach. I didn't know him. I may want to talk to you again. Would you give me your name, please? My name? Glory. Just ask for Glory. Everybody in my mass knows Glory. I heard you crying on the street before I came in here. Why have you been crying? Wasn't me, you had. I've got no reason to cry ever. It's a little bit too much to drink. If you're finished, Mr. Policeman, you can go now. Yeah, all right. Um, will you do this for me? Don't be frightened. I know what has been going on here, and I know how to stop it. Please call me when you feel you can talk. All right, I'll go now. Don't call. Stay here with me. I'm lonely. Yeah, take this. No, I don't want your money. Not now. Stay with me. That's all. I'm frightened. I'm sorry. If you wish, I'll leave a man outside. Go on. That's right. Get out of it. You make me sick. You're nothing but a dirty copper. You're all alike. Get out! I left the girl who in Somerset of Devon would have been so pretty but in London's Limehouse was not but so frightened and unhappy that she had to remain intoxicated to tolerate living I wondered who her friend was and why he gave her whiskey 
and where she fitted into the sordid picture of narcotics and murder. I arranged for a constable to stand on guard and return to the yard with Muffet to await further word from our flying squad man, Clive Furness, alias Mr. Roach. The ladder outside his room might have been his means of escape. Beg your pardon, sir. Mm. Uh, you can go home if you want to, Muffin. No, sir. I'll, I'll wait. They were lying. Both of them. The landlord Caprilius, because he knows what's going on, and the girl, because she's afraid. But I can't bring either one of them in. We have no proof of either murder or narcotics. What I don't understand, sir, mm? is how they covered the traces of Jackman's murder so quickly. I'm afraid, Muffin. Sir? I wonder... Ah, this may be furnace. Chief Inspector Black. Uh, oh, where? Uh, yes, would you? Man's body has been found in an alley behind the boarding house, Muffin. Oh, sir? Sergeant has the description. Uh, yes, Sergeant. What? Are you sure? Oh. Yes, I see. Yes, I'll come down. Thank you. Well, sir? Not Jackman. The chap I rather liked. Detective Sergeant Furness. He's been murdered. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. Now, the second act of Pursuit. Of the Limehouse Killers. Well, sir, I don't imagine he suffered much. They had to put him out of the way quickly. They knew we were coming. What about his wife, sir? Are you going to tell her or will the commissioner? No. I'll tell him of it in the morning. We're going back to the Limehouse. Now, sir? It's almost three. Would you be able to sleep, Muffet? No, sir. If you don't mind, I'll have a couple of pistols issued. All right, Muffet. I'll meet you at the car. <laughs> Everything quiet, Constable? Oh, yes, Inspector. No one's gone in, no one's come out. Right. Your relief will be here in about an hour. Thank you, sir. The girl first, sir? Yes, she knows. This time she's going to tell us. Miss Glory. I've got the lights in. Oh, that's torn it. I should have taken her in before. Come on. Capillus, where is the girl upstairs? How should I know? Up to now, you seem to have been well aware of the movements of your tenants. Maybe she went out. Maybe she likes to... Walk at night. 
There is a constable on duty outside. He says that no one left here. Now you think she's dead, like you think Jackman's dead, eh? Look, somebody's playing a joke with you. Nobody's dead here. Why don't you leave me alone? You lied about Mr. Roach. I don't lie. He was found dead tonight in an alleyway near here. Uh, so? Mr. Roach is the man who found me about Jackman. He used the telephone in this building until tonight he was living here. You've been lying. I don't lie. He moved away two days ago. Maybe he come back tonight to, to see a friend. I'm just the landlord. I don't spy. Let me try, sir. I'm only a sergeant. Moffat, take your hands off him. Sorry, sir. Caprilius, you are to stay here. If you attempt to leave, you'll be placed under arrest immediately. Why, why should I go away? This is where I live. An investigation of the house showed us that someone had used a skylight leading to the roof in order to escape the building unnoticed. Our case now rested on evidence only the girl could supply. At the yard, I sent out a general alarm for her, and then took to my office couch for an hour or two's rest. When I awoke, the first thing that I did was to go to Detective Sergeant Clive Furness's home. His wife took the tragic news rather wonderfully. And I knew that in their marriage, Furness had been a most fortunate man. When I returned to the yard, I learned that Jackman's body had still not been found. Therefore, I ordered the river police to drag the Thames in an effort to recover it. There was still no word of the girl. I decided to go to Limehouse and try once more to question Capriles. Why? What questions? I answered last night what you asked. Why? We think that you know what happened to Mr. Roach and to Jackman. Roach, I told you. Jackman moved away two days ago. He owed me money. I told you. You don't believe me? Why don't you ask him? Him? Mr. Jackman. He come back this morning, paid his money, I give him the key to his room. There's nobody dead here. Ah, he's upstairs. Now? Hmm. As I walked upstairs, I carried with me the sight of his insolent and toothy smile and the expression in his hard, dark eyes that told me he thought he was making a fool of me and of the yard. There could be no mistake if it was Jackman. Criminal Records Office had a complete dossier with photographs of him, which I had studied. Hey. Scotland Yard. What? The police. You are Mr. Jackman? Yeah, that's me. What happened to you last night? Last night? It's rather personal, isn't it? Murder is personal, Mr. Jackman. Murder? I don't follow you. Mr. Roach, your neighbor, called the yard and stated that you'd been killed. Hey, he's dotty. <laughs> so I look dead. Where have you been? I was asked to leave three days ago. Back of funds down. Last night I made a sweep of White City. Greyhounds. I paid Mr. Caprillis and I'm back in home, sweet home. You have witnesses to swear to your statement? Well, I can find him if you want. You may have to, Mr. Jackman. Good morning. Before his death, Furness had told us that Jackman was the leader of the narcotics ring. But an arrest on those charges necessitated the discovery of narcotics on the person of the principals. A task which at this point in our investigation seemed to me an impossibility. I determined, therefore to take grim advantage of the murder of Clive Furness. And if I could find proof, arrest Jackman and Capillus on that more serious charge. In order to accomplish this, I left instructions with the men guarding the rooming house and returned to the yard. At six o'clock that evening, word came that my plan was succeeding. Jackman and Capillus had left the house and were being followed by two flying squad men. At eight, my phone rang. Yes? Inspector, Sergeant Meston here. Huh? The young woman on the phone wants to speak to someone who came to see her in Limehouse last night. 
I think it's your call, sir. Yes, it is, Meston. Put her through. All right, miss. Hello? Are you the one? Miss uh, Glory? Yes, it is you, isn't it? Where are you? I'm at Regent Street, too. They're following me. What happened to you? I ran away because I was afraid. They knew I saw what happened last night. Now they found me. I'm afraid. Stay where you are. We have men following them. And I'll be there as soon as I can. I came down from the street. They know I'm here. I can't stay. What shall I do? Now, hold on. Moffat, radio cars in vicinity of Regent Street, too. We found the girl. She's in the station. Jackman and Caprillus followed her, as I thought they would. Right, sir. Inspector, what shall I do? Some shooting. There'll be more help in a minute or two. Now stay in the light. Stay near to people. You don't understand. I stole it from them and now they're after me. I'm afraid they'll catch me. Inspector Black? Yes? Inspector Roselle, sir. We followed them down here. As you said, they led us to the girl. They opened fire, hit one of our men and the girl. We've trapped them somewhere in the tunnel. Where is she? On the seat over there. She doesn't have the narcotics with her. I'm afraid there's not much we can do for her. Sir. See that she gets to the hospital as soon as possible. Yes. Come on, Moffat. Uh, uh, they're about 200 yards in, sir. Uh, we haven't gone in yet. They're armed. So we... Men at the other station? Yes, sir. Waiting for guns before they come this way. Right, Constable. Keep the tunnel entrance clear. I imagine they've stopped the train, sir. I hope so. We're in an awkward position if they haven't. Hey, behind that pillar, sir. Yes, yes. Jackman! Caprilis! We are armed! We want you for the murder of Clive Furness! Jackman, sir. Oh! Muppet. Just my leg, sir. I'll be all right. Be careful, sir. You were a filthy dog, Caprilus. I hope it hurt. <laughs> I sent Moffat to the hospital in the ambulance that couldn't move the girl. Her spine had been broken. She was dying on a bench in the station, still conscious, and strangely not afraid anymore. Hello? Hello. Can you answer one or two questions for me now? Yes. Why did they kill Mr. Roach? Because they knew he was a policeman? They weren't sure till they set the trap for him. By pretending to kill Jackman? Yes. Hmm? When Mr. Roach went to the phone to call someone, they listened. Heard him talking to the police. It was Mr. Jackman killed him. I saw it. Why didn't you tell me this before? I was frightened. I stole... You know... Uh, narcotics? Yes. I stole it from them. You'll find it in the mattress of my bed. They said they'd kill me if they found out I stole it. Now they can't. All right. Thank you, Gloria. Don't talk anymore. Mister. Hmm? In my purse, there's a pound note. Yes? If I die, will you send me some flowers? The sort you'd buy for a girl. I bought her the flowers the next morning. But I couldn't go to her funeral. Because they buried my friend, Detective Sergeant Clive Furness, that afternoon. Pursuit. And the pursuit is ended. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. 
there's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum. Pursuit, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis and written by Gil Dowd and Anthony Ellis. Music was composed and conducted by Marlon Skiles. John Daner stars as Inspector Peter Black with Raymond Lawrence as Sergeant Moffat. Also featured in tonight's cast were Peggy Weber, Larry Dobkin, Paul Fries, Jay Novello, Tom Holland, and William Johnstone. Pursuit. makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of pursuit and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Pursuit will bring you another dramatic story of the famous Inspector Peter Black of Scotland Yard, relentlessly hunting down those whose disordered passions breed violence and murder. Another story of man hunting man when we bring you Pursuit. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Police Reporter. Again, we present the police reporter dramatizing bizarre mysteries from the police records of the world. On an October morning in 1930, a Coast Guard and the town marshal of Ketchikan, Alaska, were sitting in the Coast Guard station at Point Higgins. Say, Taylor, why do you go fooling around with all them microscopes and telescopes and all them mother scopes you got around here? Ah, uh, these are scientific instruments, Stone. Well, what good are they? You'll end up in a nut house if you don't stop playing with all them doo jiggers. Well, I'd rather be like I am than like you are. That's just a matter of opinion. And I can't say I think much of yours. Hey, take a look through that telescope and see if there's anything doing out there. 11.30, time to check up on the boats. Okay. What's the matter? You expecting trouble? Nope. The weather's been too good. But my job is watching those fishing boats out there. You see anything? Yep. There's a fishing boat away out there. This time of day? Yep. Who is it? Can you tell? Nope. You better look. You see it? Hmm. Yeah, it looks like old man Marshall's boat. He's out kind of late in the morning, ain't he? Hey, there's something wrong with that boat. She's just drifting with the tide. Do you suppose something's happened to the old man? Maybe. Guess I'd better run out there and take a look. Anybody moving around on her? Nope, not a soul. That's what makes me suspicious. Maybe I better come with you. This may be a case for the law. Oh, come on, then. We'll run out in the launch. It won't take us ten minutes. Wait till I get my hat, and I'll be right with you. Fifteen minutes later, the two men were standing on the deck of Old Man Marshall's boat. Hey, look out. Holy smoke. What do you know about that? 
It's old man Marshall, ain't it? Yeah, dead as a doornail. Looks like he'd been shot. I'd say he'd been knocked down first and then shot while he was laying on deck. You can see where the bullet went right through his head and into the deck. Hey, what's that he's got in his hand? It's hair. Black hair. Hey, give it to me. I'll put it in an envelope and take a look at it under a microscope. Sure looks like the old man put up a fight before they got him, don't it? Say, Stone, get out your jackknife and dig that bullet out of the deck while I take a look around. What do you want with the bullet? You're a cop, ain't you? You ever hear of ballistics? Sure. That's that newfangled business of looking at bullets through a microscope. Hey, here's a broken hacksaw blade. And maybe we better take that along with us, too. I got the bullet dug out. Let me have it. Thanks. Let's go in the cabin. Gosh, sure is a mess in here. Why do you suppose anyone would want to kill the old man? Looks like robbery to me. Robbery? Do you think he had any money on board? Certainly. The old man was a fish buyer for the canneries. He always paid cash, so he generally had quite a bit of money aboard. Say, look at that safe, will you? All busted to pieces. What do you think we'd better do? Well, we'd better tow this boat into Point Higgins and see what we can find out there. At Point Higgins, they discovered that George Marshall had gone out to buy fish from two men, Bert MacDonald and Lloyd Close. At the city float, they found the boat of one of the wanted men and boarded her. Doesn't seem to be anybody here. He must have just left. This cabin smells of fresh tobacco smoke. Sure does. Well, if Lloyd Close did kill the old man, it had been nice to have catched him before he had a chance to go uptown. Why? We can get him any time. Well, he'd still have whatever he stole on him. Now he's had a chance to get rid of it. Say, will you take a look in this chest? Plum full of new tools and about 50 hacksaw blades. Yeah, and the same kind of blades as the one we found on Marshall's boat. This looks like the stuff that was stolen from the cannery about a week ago. I wouldn't be surprised if it were. Well, this trip wasn't a waste of time anyhow. Oh, looks like that cannery robbery is solved. Yes, and I've got a feeling we've gone quite a ways towards solving old man Marshall's murder. I wouldn't be at all surprised. What you got there? 38 caliber revolver. Well, that cinches it. I'm going to find Lloyd Close and arrest him for both these crimes. Hey, what's the matter with Bert McDonald? Old man Marshall went out to buy fish from him, too. What's the use of taking him? No doubt but what Lloyd did both jobs. Well, it won't do any harm to talk to McDonald. We know he went to see Marshall aboard his boat. It'd be just a waste of time. Never can tell. Let's talk to him anyhow. What's the use? This case is in the bag right now. Hey, do me a favor, will you? Arrest both men. We next find Stone and Taylor in the former's cubbyhole office in the city lockup. Well, I've got both of them. Good. Let's talk to them. I want to hear what they've got to say. We'll take McDonald first. He's mad as a hornet about the whole thing. All right. If we're satisfied with his answers, we'll let him go. Sam? Yes, sir. Uh, bring Bert McDonald in here. Yes, sir. Now I'm going to set my microscope up on this table by the window. What are you going to do with that darn fool thing? I don't know yet, but I got some ideas. Well, kids have to have their toys, I guess. Go ahead. Here's McDonald, Mr. Stone. Thanks. Sit down, Mac. What's the idea to pinching me, Stone? Well, it wasn't my idea, exactly. But now I've got you, I want to ask you a few questions. Mm, about what? Oh, a couple of things. Well, let's get it over with. Did you see old man Marshall yesterday morning? Sure, I sold him a catch of fish like I always do. I see. And then, uh, was he still alive when you went aboard his boat? Of course he was. And you didn't have any trouble with him? Oh, why should I have any trouble? He's a square guy who always paid the market price for fish. Well, did he buy from anybody else while you were there? No, he didn't. You see anyone else around? Oh, yes. Saw a Lloyd Close boat heading towards the old man's when I was leaving. Well, what do you say, Taylor? Got anything you want to ask him? Yeah. Would you mind giving me three or four of your hairs, McDonald? My hairs? Yeah, I just cut a few off your head. Don't mind him, Mac. He's potty about that microscope of his. I'm serious, Stone. How about it, McDonald? Oh, go ahead, Mac. Give him a couple of hairs to play with. All right. I'll pull out a couple. <laughs> there. Thanks. Can I go now? Why, yeah, I guess... Hey, that... let him wait here till you've talked to Lloyd Close. Do you mind, Mac? No, it's all right. Hey, Sam... Bring Lloyd Close in here. Yes, sir, Mr. Stone. When you get four people in this office, it's a crowd. Hey, excuse me while I go take a look at this hair. 
Uh, sorry to keep you like this, Mac, but I can't be helped. You understand, don't you? Sure, I know. It's all right, Stone. Here he is, Mr. Stone. Well, Lloyd, I'm afraid you'll have to stand. Ain't another seat in the place. I don't mind, Stone. I can talk better standing. Oh, I guess that's what you want me to do, ain't it? Yes, Lloyd. I'm afraid you've got a lot of explaining to do. About what? About the cannon factory robbery, for one thing. So, Mac, you couldn't keep your mouth shut. I yet. never said a word. Then how did they know we pulled a cannon factory robbery? What do you mean, we? So that's it, eh? Trying to dump all the blame on me. Well, you won't get away with it. They had just as much to do with it as I did. They didn't find any of the stolen stuff on my boat. Well, you're in it, and you're in it just as deep as I am. You can't blame it all on me. Now, the fact is, Lloyd, he didn't. But that's neither here nor there. We brought you here for another reason. What other reason? The murder of old man Marshall. I didn't have nothing to do with it. That's going to be pretty hard for you to prove, Lloyd. Well, I didn't do it. I didn't see the old man yesterday. Mac here says he saw your boat headed for old man Marshall's when he left. That's a dirty lie. You didn't sell him any fish yesterday? No. I had a bum catch. So I took him into town and sold him retail. And I can prove it. Taylor here says the old man was killed with your gun. Well, how can he say that when the gun ain't been out of my cabin in months? Well, but some kind of microscope business. Uh, uh, you tell him, Taylor. The rifling on a bullet to kill the old man is the same as all the slugs I fired from your gun. I can prove that your gun killed the old man, Lloyd. I don't care. I didn't kill him. And that ain't all the evidence we got either. We found a broken hacksaw blade in the cabin of old man Marshall's boat. It was the same kind of a blade that was stolen from the canning factory. Well, what of it? Explain that one if you can, Lloyd. I ain't explaining nothing. I'm telling you. I never saw old man Marshall yesterday. I ain't fired my gun in two months, and I ain't used one of them hacksaw blades I stole from the canning factory. There it is. You can take it or leave it. That won't do, Lloyd. It won't do at all. I've had my say. Well, that's all right with me. All I can do now is charge you with the murder of George Marshall and put you back in jail to wait for trial. I didn't do it. What's he used denying it, Lloyd? When we got the proofs. Why, there ain't a jury in Alaska that wouldn't convict you. You through with me, Mr. Stone? Well, now I guess, uh... Hey, you've been doing a lot of bum guessing, Stone. Now, let me tell you some scientific facts. Stuff you found out with that there microscope? No, well, that microscope doesn't make mistakes like you do. Say, what mistakes have I made? Well, the first thing this microscope has told me is that the hair we found in old man Marshall's hand was McDonald's hair. How do you know that? Well, you can look in the microscope and see for yourself. It's exactly the same color and texture as the hair McDonald gave me less than ten minutes ago. There's a lot of people have the same kind of hair. Yeah, but it don't look the same under the microscope. Lloyd has the same kind of hair I have. Why didn't you put that under your microscope? I eh? will if it'll make you feel any better. How about it, Lloyd? How about what? He wants to look at a couple of your hairs under the microscope. It's all right with me. I'll pull out a couple. There. Come over here, Stone. Take a look. Do we have to go on with this foolishness? Ah, don't be bald-headed. Take a look at that eyepiece. What do you see? Why, it looks like two cables with rings around them. Do they look alike? Yes, sir, exactly. Well, what you're looking at is one of the hairs we found in Marshall's hand, which was evidently pulled out of the murderer's head. The other one is one of the hairs Burke McDonald gave me. Well, what do you think of that? Now, I'm going to put one of Lloyd Close's hairs with these two. There. Now, what do you see? Why, it looks like an altogether different kind of cable. Are you satisfied? Yeah, I'm satisfied. I've made a mistake. But evidence like this is kind of hard to hang a man on. Well, here's something else that don't quite hitch. Did you notice a hold of the old man's boat when we discovered the body? Well, can't say that I did. Well, there wasn't a fish in it. What'd the old man do with those that McDonald says he sold him? Throw them overboard? You're sure of that, Taylor? Of course I'm sure. And if you've got the sense of a flea, you'll hold Burke McDonald for the murder of old man Marshall. And Bert McDonald is serving a life sentence on McNeil Island, and all because of a hair. You have just heard the police reporter bringing you another dramatization of an actual happening. These stories are taken from the police records of the world. If you like this type of entertainment, write to the police reporter in care of this station and tell him so. This is a radio release production. Please report.
reporter. A number of listeners have been asking for a gruesome story. The police reporter has brought you one. On March 27, 1931, the New York police were in a frenzy attempting to solve the now famous Star Faithful case when the story you're about to hear broke over the heads of an already overworked homicide squad. The time is about 10.30 in the morning and the scene is the Williamsburg Bridge. Hey, what do you want, lady? I want that bundle. I saw it first. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm a-taking that bundle. I got it first. You get fresh about it and I'll call a cop. Yeah, if you do that, neither of us will get the bundle. He'll take it to the Lost and Found Department. Well, let's take a look at it. Maybe I won't want it after I see it. All right, I'll open it and we'll go 50-50. Okay, lady? That's fair enough. It's a pretty big bundle, ain't it? Yeah, she's heavy, too. I wonder what's in it. Hey, it's meat. That's what it is, meat. Meat? Oh! Oh! It's a man's leg! Three days later in a lumber yard in Brooklyn. Mr. Newton! Mr. Newton! Well, what is it, Hattie? What's the matter? What's the matter? I just found something! Well, what are you getting so excited about? Oh, it's awful, awful! Say, what is this? Calm down, calm down, and let's hear about it. (laughs) I was getting some lumber off in one of the piles to fill an order when I see the bundle wrapped up in brown paper. It was right in the middle of the pile. Well? Well, I opened it, and it was a man's body without no arms or legs or head. Two days later in another part of Brooklyn. Hello. Hello. Give me the Homicide Bureau. Hello, Homicide. This is Patrolman Gawler. Badge 48762. I'm off duty today, so I goes across the street to dig up some dirt for my flower boxes, see? I just dug up a big package wrapped in brown paper. Yeah, there's two arms, a leg, and a man's head in it. At Morgan Avenue and Ten Hike Street. Okay, I'll wait for you. After Patrolman Gawler's find was taken to the morgue, the homicide squad had the final pieces of this grisly jigsaw puzzle in their possession. It was now up to them to discover the identity of the dead man and to find his murderer. The case was turned over to Detective Colgan, who went to police scientists to get what information they could give him. Say, listen, Doc. That Brooklyn murder has just been turned over to me. Oh, you mean the guy who was cut up? Yeah. They told me you fellows had been on the case, so I thought I'd find out what I could from you before I start out on it. Well, here's all I can tell you. The body we have is that of a man between 35 and 40. He's been dead about two weeks and put on ice to keep him fresh. Whoever cut him up knew something about anatomy, so it must have been done either by a doctor or a butcher. You got any idea who the guy might be? Not the least. Couldn't get a thing out of the missing persons bureau. Nobody's been looking for anyone who answers his description. Well, that means just one thing. Mm -hmm. What's that? Whoever killed him is the only person who'd miss him. Yeah, looks like it. It's going to be a pretty tough nut to crack. What do you think, Doc? Mm, I'm afraid so, but it can be done. Well, I'm taking a try at it anyway. You got any clues at all? Yes, one. And it's a pip. What is it? The shirt the head was wrapped in. Have any laundry mark? We couldn't find any at first, but finally a chemist brought one out. Good. Could you trace it? Yeah. A man in the department found out the shirt belonged to a guy named Joseph Klein at 78 Bartlett Street. You think the shirt belonged to the dead man? Well, it fits him. Well, then the dead man is Joseph Klein of 78 Bartlett Street. Oh, I don't know. You'll have to verify that. Well, I'm starting on it right now, and I don't mind telling you, I think it's a pretty good start. Detective Colgan discovered that Joseph Klein and Andrew Zubitsky had operated a speakeasy at 78 Bartlett Street, from which address the shirt had been sent to the laundry. The two men had quarreled and dissolved their partnership. The premises at 78 Bartlett Street were vacant. Then Colgan learned from the neighbors that one of the two men had opened a speakeasy on Throop Street, also in Brooklyn. So he hurried over there. Say, you used to have a place on Bartlett Street, didn't you? Yeah, but I couldn't get along with my partner, so we split up. Where's your partner now? I don't know. Somebody told me he opened a place somewhere. You know the address? No. Why should I bother about him? Your name's Zubitsky, ain't it? No, that was my partner's name. I'm Joseph Klein. You're Klein? Yeah. What about it? Nothing. Did you ever see this shirt before, Klein? No, I don't think so. Why? You're sure it never belonged to you? Sure, I'm sure. I never owned a shirt like that in my life. See, it's too small for me. I wear a 16, and this ain't more than a 14 and a half. 
Got your laundry mark on it, Klein. What have you got to say about that? Say, listen, fella, what's the idea of coming in my place and asking a lot of screwy questions? I ain't... I'm Colgan from Homicide Squad, and this shirt was found wrapped around a murdered man's head. A what? But you heard me, and if you know what's good for you, you'll tell me what I want to know. Say, what is this? Some new kind of a shakedown? What do you mean, shakedown? You know. I'm running a speak. You're a cop. Now, how much do you want? Say, if I thought you knew what you were talking about, Klein, I'd bust you smack in the nose. See, I don't get you at all, fella. Say, what how is... long you been in this saloon business? Oh, about six years. What'd you do before you went into this? I was a butcher. You were a what? A butcher. All right, this is getting better every minute. Now, look here, copper. Let's get down to cases. What's this all about? You read the papers, don't you? You read about that murder where we found parts of a guy all over Brooklyn. Sure, but what's that got to do with me? Well, that job was done by a butcher, Klein. And a shirt with your laundry mark on it is wrapped around the guy's head. Do you mean that? That's why I'm here, to find out what you know about it. Why, I don't know anything about it. Honest, I don't. Gee, fella, this is terrible. You don't think I did it, do you? Well, I don't know whether you did or not, but the least you can do is to tell me what you know. Sure, sure, but but I don't know what you want to find out. Well, first let's settle this shirt business. If it ain't yours, it must belong to somebody who sent his clothes to the laundry with yours. You anybody like that? I don't think so, I... Yeah. Yeah, Zabitsky used to send his clothes out with mine. He was too lazy to take them himself, so he used to stick them in my bundle when I went to the laundry. You're certain of that? Sure I am. And his doing that has gotten me into all this trouble. We don't know yet. That shirt may not mean a thing. You want to come with me? Where to? Down to the morgue to see if you can identify the corpse. Then you think it's Zobitsky? Well, the shirt fits him. No, I'm not passing up any bets. Klein identified the body as that of Andrew Zubitsky, his former partner. We now go to another speakeasy, that of Mr. and Mrs. Zubitsky. Hello, Klein. What you want? A beer. What's yours, Colgan? Same. Two beers. Where's your old man, Mrs. Zubitsky? He's gone someplace. I don't know where. When do you expect him back? I don't know. Maybe never. You mean he ain't around anymore? Yeah. He's gone about a month now. Well, what happened? Did he take a run-out powder on you? What's that? Did he run away from you? I don't know. He went away about a month ago. He don't come back. Well, what do you know about that? What do you think happened to him? I think he got back to the old country. He don't like it over here. Why didn't you go with him? I don't like it in the old country. Want another drink? Not no. for me. Not, I guess, for me either. Uh, Mrs. Zubisky, do you know your husband's dead? You're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. Klein here just identified him down at the morgue. He's been murdered. That's not my husband. That's somebody else. No, it ain't. It's Andrew. I just saw him. He's the guy the papers have been full of. The guy they cut up. You're fooling. No, we're not fooling. I'm from the homicide squad, and I'm taking a look around here, see? What for? What do you want? You keep out of there. This guy's a cop, and he's investigating Andrew's murder. What are you going to find here? I don't want no cops. Bad for business. You can't do anything about it. He won't go till he gets ready. Hey, what do you use this mop for, Mrs. Zabitsky? I don't use it. Charlie bought that. Charlie? Who's Charlie? A fellow what works for me. Does Charlie O'Breedus work for you now? Yeah. Hey, do you know this O'Breedus guy? Sure, I know him. Used to hang around our place on Bartlett Street. Worked in the neighborhood. What'd he do? Oh, he did something in a butcher shop. Another butcher. Hey, where's this guy now, Mrs. Zabitsky? He upstairs asleep. Well, get him down here right away. Well, what are you waiting for? We're going to attend bar. Say, how long is it going to take you to get him down here? Come on, move. All right. You sure she won't run away? Oh, I don't think so. Well, Klein, you've helped me a lot. I'm sorry I had to take up so much of your time. Oh, that's all right. I'm just getting myself out of a jam. Say, before they come back, tell me what you know about this fellow she's gone up to get. Oh, nothing much. He's a pretty heavy drinker, and he used to hang around Mrs. Zubitsky a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm beginning to get the drift. You know anything about her? Not much, except that Zubitsky was her second or third husband. Neither one of them ever talked much, and I never asked them anything. I asked her once how she met Zubitsky, but she wouldn't tell me. What'd she say? She said she'd cut out her tongue when she left the old country. Well, here they come. Watch me give them both a surprise. Mrs. Zubitsky say you want to talk to me. Yeah. Get your coat on. I want you to come along with me. There we go. We're going down to the morgue. What is that? That's the place where they keep dead people. What do I want to go there for? You're coming down to take a look at Andrew Zubitsky's body. I don't want to see him. Then you know he's dead. Yes, I told him. Oh, you did. Oh, Breedus, where'd you get this mop? Buy it to clean up the place. Well, what do you need a mop for? The floor's covered with sawdust. You can sweep that out. Well, I 
Tink, did I... Take a good look at that mop, Obritus. Do you know what that hard black stuff is around the edges? It's blood. Look at it. Don't stick that on my face. You know whose blood it is? It's Andrew Zubis. No, no. It is. You know it is. You killed him, didn't you? Didn't you? Take him off of her. Take it away from her. You killed Andrew Zubisky, didn't you? Yeah, I did it. I did it because you want me to. You're a liar. Shut up, you. Who is lying? I'm telling the truth. She gave me $300 to kill him. I wait right outside that door with meat cleaver. Andrew, he drunk. When he come in, I hit. Then I cut him up and put him in the ice box. I take pieces and leave them around here and there. Now you'll catch me. That's all. And believe me, that plenty, old breeders. Charles Obritus is serving 35 years at hard labor for his part in the crime. Mrs. Zubitsky beat the murder charge, but was sent up for forging her husband's name to a bonus check after he was dead. Again, the police reporter proves that crime does not pay. If you have a favorite type of true murder mystery... Write the police reporter in care of this station and tell him what you would like to hear. Listen for the police reporter. This is a radio release production. Now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes, welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight we bring you a rollicking comedy mystery written by Sid and Larry Sloan and entitled, Follow That Cab. In it, you're going to meet a couple of very strange detectives, Mo and Julius, taxi drivers who spend all their time between calls reading detective stories. This, in their own opinion, qualifies them as expert detectors. And when they attempt to apply their knowledge to the solution of a murder, they get some rather startling results. Ah, uh, you mean they catch the murderer red-handed, Mr. Barnes? Well, I can't tell you that, Dan. Okay, but I can tell you, as well as our men listeners, that when a fellow gets caught red-faced and sore right after shaving, it's probably because he's got wiry whiskers or a tender skin. So he needs Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. Yes, sir, with Mole, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. That's right. Mole is the shaving cream that's heavier. The cream that's right for a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or tender skin. Because Mole is heavier, it not only softens your whiskers, it stands them up straight and lets your razor whisk them off. So you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Mole. And now for tonight's Mole mystery, follow that cab. Maybe you were reading in the papers about them two hack drivers, Julius and Moe, which is solving this here Larkin murder. Well, I am personally acquainted with these two characters very well. As a matter of fact, I am one of them, Moe. You see, Julius is all the time reading a magazine called Absolutely Authentic True Crime Fiction, in which is running a series by the name Daniel Dare Moore Detective, which is our ideal. 
Now, on the day in question, Julius and me is parked in a hack stand at 55th and 6th, waiting for a fare. And I am standing with my foot on his running board while he is reading AATCN. Then a dark, foitive man climbs into the cab. Yeah, yeah, go on, Julius. Driver, he whispers hoarsely, urgently. Driver, follow that cab. Uh, what's the matter? What's the matter, Julius? Mo, how many years you been driving a hack? Uh, let me see. Uh, my wife's appendix. Uh, Eleven years. Me, I've been pushing one for nine. So? So what? It says here in black and white that the dark, pointive man is saying, Driver, follow that cab. Did a guy ever say that to you, Mo? Gee, you're right, Julius. You got a head full of brains. You know what, Mo? If I had the chance, I could be a private dick like this here Daniel Damore and this here man. Yeah, I bet you could, Julius. You're smart. Smarter than Daniel Damore. Oh, I would not go so far as to say that, Ma. I would. Julius, you are a genius. <laughs> oh, maybe. But you know, Mo, I could make with the clues and the fingerprints. Yeah, fingerprints. Just give me a chance, Mo. Just give me a chance. I'd show him. Uh, can I go with you on your cases, Julius? Sure, Mo. All good dicks has got stooges. Uh, gee, Julius, you're a real pal. Follow that cab. Oh, it just ain't done, Mo. It never happens. Driver, follow that cab. Huh? I said follow that cab. Hurry. Yes, sir. Bye, Julius. We're falling is pulling into the curb in front of that apartment building. Stop. Stop right behind him. Yes, sir. Hey, look. The guy in the cab is running into the building. He's not going to get away from me. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about my fare? I followed you in my cab. What happens? What's the deal? It's murder. That's what it is, murder. Murder? Yeah, that big so-and-so is running off into that building without paying the tab. And I'm going in there and collect. Come on. Yeah. It's Julius. Mo, that was a shot ringing now. A real shot? Yeah. Come on, something is going on in there. Open the door. There's the guy who was in my cab. Come on, Mo. Yeah, right with you, Julius. Come on, Mo. Come on, please, open up. Hey, you. Someone's been shot in this apartment. Shot? How do you know? Oh, I heard it, Julius, didn't you? Shut up. I ain't asking you. I'm asking this gent here. Oh. Okay, mister? I was trying to get into this apartment when I heard a shot fired inside. Oh, you was trying to get in, hey? Besides jumping taxi fares, you're also a burglar. No, no, you don't understand. Hey, Julius, the door is open. What? It was closed. Oh, just a minute ago. I tried it. A likely story, a likely story. Julius, if the door's open, why don't we go in and see what goes? Don't rush me. Don't rush me. Come on. Well, everything looks okay in here. <laughs> Holy mackerel. A corpse, Mo. A corpse. Yeah, and dead, too. It's Larkin. Say, how come you know his name? He... I, I was associated with him. And he was the guy you was following in my cab. Yeah, Julius, look, he's got something in his hand, a dead corpse. Get it, Mo. No, you get it, Julius. I don't want to touch no stiffs. A fine assistant you were going to make, afraid of stiffs. Get it. Okay. Uh, it's a piece of paper. Give me it. Yeah, sure, Julius. Here. Mm, been trying to see you for weeks. You can't brush me off any longer. You stole Joan away from me. Signed, Boynton. What's your name? Boynton. I wrote that note. Ah, uh -huh. this is very serious. I get it all now, Julius. This guy I here... told you before, Mo, I am running this here investigation. Now, the way I see it, you two guys is in love with a lady by the name Joan. But Joan isn't a lady. Now, look here, buddy. Leave her mortality out of this. Please. Joan is the name of the song, a song I wrote which Larkin stole from me. I tried to see him to get what belonged to me, but he wouldn't let me in his office. You see, he's a song publisher. So you knocked him off to get even, huh? Julius, leave us call the cops. You're not going to turn me in. I didn't do it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Maybe you don't. Suppose we was to let you go, Boynton. Then, then you believe? You can't do this, Julius. I'm doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't kill Larkin, but I'd have a terrible time trying to prove I did. Just a minute, Boynton, uh, before you go, just for the record. Where do you live? Live? Yeah, we gotta know, just for the record, you know. Oh, uh... The 709 East 78th Street. Uh, take that down in the notes, Mo. Notes? What notes? Take it down. Oh, oh okay, Julius. I got it. All right, Boyden, go on. Beat it. Thanks. Frank. But, Julius... Shut up. Wait till he gets outside. Julius, we're going to get into all kinds of trouble letting that guy go. He done it. I know, Mo. I know he is knocking off this body here. But if we turns him into the cops, what's in it for us? Nothing. If, on the other hand, this case is a mystery, no one knows who done it, the cops is baffled, and then we are solving it from the clues. What clues? Think of the tabloids with my picture on the front page. Heroic hacky solves case which is baffling entire police force. Think of it. Go on, think. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, but I'm worried. Don't worry, we got this address, ain't we? I think of them things. Now we got to find some clues. Clues? What for? We know Boynton done it. You said so yourself. Of course I said so, but that ain't the way a good detective works. It'd be like reading the back of the book first. We got to show the cops we solved this here case legitimate. We got to start at the beginning. With fingerprints? Correct. Now, I just happen to have here in my pocket my little nifty knick-knack fingerprint detecting kit. Oh, did you right away for one of them? I seen the ad, too, in the magazine. 49 cents covers postage and handling. Yeah, just the same as the G-Man uses. For 49 cents? Well, nearly as good. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, that bottle there on the table. Uh, this one with the liquor don't in it? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. I don't want you should smudge the prints, understand? I will take care of that bottle. Oh, yeah, sure, Joyce. Now, I just blow a little of this powder on the bottle to make the fingerprint show up. <laughs> hey, look. What did I tell you? Fingerprints. Gee, real ones. Now, I need a clean white handkerchief to wrap around the bottle like that. Now... Julius, you're drinking the evidence. Uh, don't be a joke. The evidence is on the outside of this here bottle. Oh. That's not bad stuff. Now, look. Wipe the rest of the things off in this room. Doorknobs and other things. Yeah. We got the evidence now. We don't want the cops should get it, too. This'll make it baffling. Yeah. Now, let me see. I wonder... Holy mackerel. What goes, Julius? My meter in my cab. I forgot to pull the flag. The meter's still running. Oh, wait a minute, Julius. Where you going? I got to turn off the meter. Well, I'm coming with you. Stay there. I'll be right back. Oh, holy mackerel. Look at that meter. A buck sixty-five. Is this your cab? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, lady, but... I want to go to Grand Central Station. Hurry. Yeah, but lady, I'm busy. Oh, didn't I see you cancel the meter just now? Yeah, but... Well, you're not busy anymore. Come on, I'm in a hurry. No, lady, you'll have to get out of the cab. I ain't driving you no place. Look, how would you like to lose your license? I wouldn't. Listen, I've hired you to drive me. If you refuse, you can lose your license. No, I'll report oh, okay, you. Okay, okay, don't get yourself in an uproar, lady. I'll take you. Okay, Grand Central Station. This is the place. Now, I think maybe it was a false alarm, Sarge. Some crank here is shot. Well, we'll soon find out. Here, this is the apartment. Is that you, Julius? Stay right where you are. What? Cops? Yeah, and what are you doing here? Me? Yeah, stay right where you are. Don't make no false moves. Come into the apartment, Mike. Shut the door. Okay, Bill. Hey, take a look at that. That's Locke and he's dead. Yes, I see he is. Brother, you've got plenty of explaining to do. Start talking. As the curtain falls on act one of tonight's play, Moe finds that being a detective has its ups and downs. 
And he's really got himself... Uh, excuse me, Mr. Barnes. Did I hear you say ups and downs? Yes, I guess you did, Dan. Well, you know, I have a secret solution for some of the ups and downs that men have. Now, come on over here and listen closely. Men, if getting up in the morning gets you down because shaving is torture, chances are you have wiry whiskers or a tender skin. So try Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Why, Mole gives you a shave as smooth as an apple. Yes, Mole is a heavier cream. The cream that not only softens your whiskers, but holds them up straighter and lets your razor cut them off close and clean. With Mole, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly. Try it. See if you don't say, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Mole. Now back to Jeffrey Barnes and act two of Follow That Cab. Mo and Julius, taxi drivers and would-be detectives, having apparently caught a murderer red-handed, let him go so they can solve the case by the clues. Having wiped away all the fingerprints to make the case more baffling, Mo is left alone with the corpse, all unaware that Julius is not coming back. And now the police have arrived on the scene and confront Mo. Well, buddy... What have you got to say for yourself? Myself? Nothing. Don't look at me. I didn't do it. Yeah, that's what they all say. Frisk him, Bill. See if he's got the murder weapon on him. <laughs> uh, he ain't got nothing on him. I'm being framed. What did you do with the gun, buddy? It ain't here. I've just been looking for it. It ain't here. Oh, oh, it ain't. Hey, Bill, careful how you touch those things. Might be fingerprints, you know. Uh, there ain't no fingerprints either. Oh, no? And why do you say that? Because I wiped... Uh, because you wiped him. Go on, go on, as you were saying. I wasn't saying nothing. Where's Julius? Where is he? You was going to say you wiped him off, right? I, uh, where's Julius? He said he's coming right back. One false move out of you and I'll let you have it. You really think I've done it? Who else? You look mighty suspicious. I didn't do it. Brighton done it. Brighton, I tell you. Yeah, well, tell that to O'Brien. O'Brien. O'Brien? Yes, buddy. He's chief of the Homicide Bureau. And you're under arrest. For murder. So they are taking me to see Inspector O'Brien. At first, I won't talk because I remember what Julia says about how we are going to solve the case our own selves and get famous. But finally, I am realizing that instead of getting famous, I am getting a hot seat if they can pin the murder on me. So they throw me in the cell, and the next morning, about 10 a.m. Julius! Hello, Mo. You know what day this is? Huh? This is visitor's day. Oh. You got just five minutes, mister. Mo, why did you do it? Do what, Julius? You don't have to pretend now, Mo. You can tell me. I'm your friend. I, I don't get it, Julius. What? Mo, crime does not pay. Why did you do it? Do what? We know you've done it, Mo. Confess and things will go easier with you. Confess? Come, come. My patience is getting exhausting, my friend. You know you murdered Larkin. Murdered Larkin? Julius! Don't make me put you through the toy degree, my friend. Julius, are you crazy? You was with me when it happened. What are you trying to do with me? You know what happened. <laughs> all, we right, all right, all right, Mo. Settle down. And then we told him we saw the whole thing I was just and practicing. And then we said, was, uh, Practicing? For what? You know the way Daniel Dearmore, once he gets a crook in a corner, how he starts to make with a toy degree and busts him down? Oh, that... You didn't have to do that to me, Julius. I didn't do it. You had me scared for a minute. Did I? Well, Julius, you got to get me out of here. Yeah, don't worry, my friend. That little matter has just been taken care of. I turned in the evidence to Chief O'Brien. Uh, you mean the bottle of whiskey with the fingerprints? The empty bottle with the fingerprints. Yeah, the empty bottle. Oh, and I give O'Brien Boynton his address. Then you were in the clean. The cops will pick up Boynton, and I will be in a tabloid as the guy which cracked this case open. Ah, here comes Chief O'Brien to let you out now. Hi, O.B. You say a man named Burton gave you this address, 790 78th Street? Uh, yeah, officer, that's right. That's where he lives. Did you make the pinch, Chief? You got him, huh? We uh, checked that number. It's the middle of the East River. What? Maybe he moved. 
Oh, Mo, the rat is giving you the double cross. Julius, ain't they gonna let me out of here? Just a minute, Mo. I'll do my best for you. Look, Chief, this man is not guilty. What about the fingerprints on the empty bottle I turned into you? Oh, yes, that's another thing. Uh, we've checked that, too. It's Boynton's. No. It ain't Moe's. No. It belongs to the man who's going to burn for Larkin's murder. Whose prints is it? Yours. Mine? What do you know? I took my own prints. Uh, come in, you two. Sit down. Uh, yes, yes. I suppose you are bringing me in here to your office because the entire police force is baffled, huh, Chief? I knew you would have to come get to me. Get your big feet off of my desk. Sure, sure. Don't get excited. Say, uh, what's all this here stuff on the table, Chief? Oh, that's some odds and ends we picked up in the lock and the poppin'. Keep your hands off that stuff. All right, all right. Clues, huh? They might be. Stay away from it. You've done enough damage already. Yeah, enough damage already. You know, you two boys are lucky. Very lucky. Yeah, lucky. How do you mean, Chief? Burton has just given himself up. He saw in the evening papers that we were looking for him. So you're in the clear. Burton give himself up. Julius, we are free. Yeah, very interesting. Extremely. Um, by the way, O.B., is Boynton confessing? No, but he will. <laughs> I am sorry I cannot see eye to eye with you, O.B. No. No. Now, I have a theory about who is knocking off who. Oh, look, you. One more theory out of you, and I'll send you up for ten years. Now, get out of here and get out fast before I change my mind and hold you as accessories after the fact. Uh, we're going, we're going, ain't we, Julius? Yeah. Whew. It certainly is lucky for us that Boynton give himself up. Mo, Boynton didn't do it. Didn't do it? But we seen him. You said he'd done it your own self. It's a dame which done it. A redhead dame. She's the dame which got in my cab yesterday and makes me drive at a Grand Central Station. Why her, Julius? See this picture? Yeah. That's her. I took it off the table in O'Brien's office. It was found in Larkin's apartment. But Julius, you should I have... remember she was very suspicious, nervous. Yeah, but what about Biden? Mo, all good dicks are getting off on a red hair and now and then. Remember what happens to Daniel Dearmore in the case of the Black Knighty? Oh, but that wasn't a red herring he got off on. That was Shut a... up. Now, look. This redhead dame, which is in such a stew to get away, is the real killer. Yeah. Yeah, Julius. A redhead herring, huh? Mo, we know who done it. We got a picture. Now, all we got to do is get her. Yeah, all we got to do... Hey, wait a minute, Julius. Remember what O'Brien said about being accessories. Accessories, smasheries. We got the real clue now. Let's go find her. Oh, you're my very own. Oh, please, Julius. Turn Take off the radio. Own. You'll run down the battery. Look, Julius, we've been waiting parked out in front of Larkin's building for eight days now, waiting for that dame to show up. What's the matter, getting discouraged? Well, look, Julius, maybe she won't never come back She's here. got it. Says so in the book. A criminal always returns to the scene of the crime. I know. Yeah, and that song which Boynton wrote, it's driving me nuts. All the radio programs are playing it. Turn it off. I like it. Yeah, but okay. Look, let's quit this detecting business, Julius, and get back into the hat business. That dame won't never show. Hey, Mo, look. That dame. The one we're looking for. The redhead herring? Yeah. Hey, she's going into the building. Come on, we're going after her. This is Larkin's apartment. There she is. What? Okay, lady, you are under arrest for the murder of Larkin. I don't know who you are, what you're talking about. Look out, Mo, she's but, reaching for a gun. Grab her. Yes, for me. I got it, Julius. Nice work, my friend. Now, Mrs., what you got to say for yourself? Well, I, 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 uh, okay. Okay, you got me. Now, aren't you proud of yourself? Hey, Julius, <laughs> the dame's boiling. I can't help it. Crime does not pay. Yeah, you're right. I killed him. 
I killed him because he mistreated me. He beat me. Me and my four children. Four kids? A dirty rat. Well, I'm sorry. It was bad enough when we were poor, but when he started making money, he just threw us out. Out into the cold, cold night. We were starving. Starving? Oh, that dirty bum. Yeah, I had to sell my new mink coat to get food for my little children. A guy like that didn't deserve to live. That's what I kept telling myself, so I bumped him. I killed him in self-defense. Everything went black before my eyes. I didn't know what I was doing. Naturally. Hey, Mo. Yeah, Julius. Got any money on you? About a buck seventy-five. Give it to me. For her? Yeah. Here. I couldn't accept it. I insist. Gee, you are a generous character, Julius. Ah, oh, don't mention it. Here, lady, take it. Oh, gee, thanks. Thanks a lot. You gonna let me go now? What else? Oh, you're so kind. You're so sweet. Oh, are you just saying that? Could I have my gun back now? You want it back? What for? Well, I, uh, so that I can pawn it and get a few bucks, uh, dollars, to buy food for my poor little children. Yeah, yeah, sure, the poor little dove. Give it to him, Mo. Here, here, lady. Open up in there, open up. The cops. Goodness. Come out of that room with your hands up. Look, I'll hide behind the door. You open it. Don't worry, little dove. I'll handle him. Oh, so it's you two again. Oh, Brian. I thought I told you the next time I caught you monkeying it. You hit O'Brien over the head. He's out cold. Oh, lady, you shouldn't have done that. Okay, okay, let's cut the comedy. What comedy? Come on, we're getting out of here. Your cab outside? Oh, yeah, but... Shut up! I'm giving the orders. Let's go. I've killed one man with this gun. I can kill two more. Oh, Julius. She ain't no little dove. <laughs> This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of Follow That Cab. If you've been having trouble trying to combat dandruff, bear in mind that most ordinary hair preparations merely remove loose dandruff. Now, plain water does that. So if you want to fight a common type of dandruff effectively, the thing to do is use double dandarine. Double dandarine is a scientific product that goes to work on your scalp and actually combats this dandruff by killing the germs that many outstanding authorities contend are a cause, and it kills them on contact. Now, the reason why double dandrine is so amazingly effective is that it contains an active antiseptic called Alzan. This is a special ingredient used by many hospitals because of its remarkable efficiency, and no other hair preparation contains Alzan. You get it only in double dandrine. So try double dandarine and see why most ordinary hair preparations can't compare with its dandruff-combating effectiveness. If you're not completely satisfied, return the empty bottle and get your money back. Buy double dandarine at your druggist's. I can't go no faster, lady. I got it down to the floorboard now. Just take it easy with my cap. You oh. shut up. I'll tell him what to do. Yes, ma'am. Julius, they're shooting at us. Oh, Lord, don't let him hit the tires, please. Two can play at that game. Lady, you could have rolled that window down. Don't bother me! Did she get him? No, but I'm afraid what's going to happen to us. What's the matter? You hit Julius? No, worse. They hit the meter. It's 75 cents already. Well, turn it off. Turn it off. I can't. It's jammed. No, oh, the meter again. So that one should have stopped it. It didn't. It's going twice as fast. $3.94. 25 dollars Oh! Listen, Listen, you turn left. What, lady? Turn left. But I... Turn left or I'll blow your hell. Okay. <laughs> What happened? What happened? No street? So we are capturing the culprit, like Julius says. You see, she is the dead guy's ex-missus, and she don't like him. The reason she is coming back to the apartment is that she knows there's some cash hid there. 
Well, Burton is let go by the cops and he gets his songs back. And that is why the papers are calling it murder in A flat. You see, A flat is an apartment. But the best thing about the whole deal is Julius and me is becoming real famous. No kidding. You get the magazine, absolutely authentic, true crime fiction. Our true-to-life stories are appearing in this week's issue. the story of the great gold robbery. On the night of May the 15th, 1855, gold coins and bars were delivered in three iron-bound boxes to London Bridge Station to be dispatched by the South Eastern Railway to the continent. These boxes had been sealed and weighed by the carriers. At the railway station, they were placed in safes that were considered impregnable and transferred to the Folkestone boat train under care of the guard. Each safe had two locks and duplicate keys were in the possession of trusted servants of the railway company at London Bridge, at Folkestone, and with the captain of the channel boat. At Boulogne, the safes were opened, and as a matter of routine, the boxes were weighed before being sent on to Paris. I cannot understand it. This number two case, it weighs 40 pounds less than it should do, according to the paper. Maybe they make a mistake in London. What about the other boxes? Oh, they weigh about the same, except for the fourth box. That weighs a little more. There must be something wrong with their scales in London. Anyway, they are sealed up all right. What had we better do? Send them on to Paris. And so it was not until the boxes reached Paris that they were opened. What's this? Look, not gold. Bags and bags of lead shot. Weighing over 200 pounds. Worth today a small fortune, and even at this time of a value exceeding 12,000 pounds, had been extracted. In its place were neatly sewn bags of lead shot. Somewhere between London and Paris, one of the cleverest robberies of the age had been perpetrated. Nowhere was the slightest trace of how the trick had been done. Six months had passed and still the search went on. The first clues came, as is often the case, through a woman's jealousy. Her name was Fanny Kay, a simple girl, but when roused, she was as jealous as anyone else. She was in a fine state of temper when she came to see the police. I've come for my rights. That's what I've come for. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Calm yourself. Now, tell us how we can help you. I've been robbed. Robbed of my money, which is my due. Well, who's robbed you and how? He's not only robbed me. He's robbed me man as well as my child. Yes, but who has robbed you? Pierce, his name is. William Pierce. Where does he live? Where I live. I lodge with his mother. Now, suppose you tell me your story quietly and calmly, and we'll see how we can help you. All right, then. I'll tell you the story. It began this way. Oh, well, first you better know that my man is Edward Agar. The forger? He's no forger. He was sentenced to seven years at the old bailey for forgery less than two months past. Sentenced he was, but forgery he did not do. It was Jim, the penman. Well, is it he who has robbed you? Not Jim. Then who has robbed you? Pierce. He was a friend of my man. And when Ted was arrested for the forgery and put in jail, Pierce was to look after me. He took me and my child to live with his mother. And my child and I have lived in his charity these past two months. At least I thought it was charity until I heard from Ted. You've uh, had a letter from him? More than that. I've seen him. 
He'd given Pierce the care of £7,000 of his money, and Pierce, what's he given me? A pound a week is charity. £7,000? <laughs> Mr. Agar must have found crime a profitable occupation. But it's my money. Well, that remains to be seen. Well, it's not Pierce's money. Oh, yes, there I agree with you. The question is, where did Mr. Agar get £7,000? I, I think I'll have a little talk with Mr. Agar. This did not lead very far, for Ego was keeping his mouth shut. He'd been arrested for forgery and convicted. That much the police had against him, but there was no reason to connect him with the great gold robbery. True, he had 7,000 pounds, but that was not in gold. The mystery seemed as deep as ever until... You wanted to see Roberts, one of the porters, sir? Uh, that's right. Is he on duty? Uh, yes, sir. But I don't understand... He wasn't on duty the night of the robbery. No, he wasn't, but he was on the following day. And we've already questioned all the porters who were on the night of the robbery. Yes, sir. But when Roberts was on duty, the gold was aboard the boat on its way to France. Not all the gold. Remember that. Anyway, I'd like a word with Roberts, the porter. Come along with me. Yes, Roberts is my name. Uh, you were on platform until the day after the gold robbery. That's right, sir. It must be a hard job for porter's work. Well, it's not an easy one. Sometimes the luggage you have to lift uh, is very heavy, eh? Pretty heavy, sir. And when it's very heavy, the passengers are glad to have you carry it. I say they are. Uh, not always, though. Uh, what do you mean, not always? Well, it's, it's funny you should mention it, sir, but it was the very day after the gold robbery. I was on duty on the platform and a couple of passengers with two big travelling bags were taking a train to London. Uh, what happened? Well, I picked up their bags, at least I tried to, and my, they were heavy. Well, but you carried them all, sir. It's no, sir. No, I'll never forget what happened. One of them first stepped up and he did. Leave it alone, Porter. Why, what's the matter, sir? Leave that bag alone. All right, sir. You want to carry it yourself? I certainly do. Uh, can I see your ticket, sir? Very well. Thank you, sir. But uh, these are from Austin. Well, what of it? Well, there's no boat in from Austin today, sir. Oh, we came yesterday. Oh, very good, sir. You're sure I can't carry your bags? Uh, no, but um, here's two shillings for you. Thank you, sir. Well, that's a hurry, sir. All right, man, give the bags to me. And that's the last I saw of him, sir. But not the last you'll ever see, I think. Roberts, you're coming to London with me. You're going to Newgate Prison. Why, what have I done? You haven't done anything, but you can help us a great deal. I want you to see if you can recognize the passenger you met that day. <laughs> Roberts, the porter, was brought up to London and identified Agar as the mysterious passenger. Still Agar refused to talk. But now, the first link in the chain of evidence was complete. And the hunt was on. now went over the ground all over again. They brought in Burgess, the railway guard, and confronted with Agar, Burgess broke down. One by one, the crews were followed up until at last the full diabolical story was revealed. Listen now to how this crime, almost the perfect crime, was carried out. To tell the full story, we'll have to go back not six months to the actual robbery, but fully 18 months, for over a year of planning went into this famous crime. Edward Agar was the mastermind, and yet the original idea came from a minor criminal known as Ted Pierce. Now, here's the idea. As you may know, before I went to work for a bookmaker, I was employed as a ticket printer by the South Eastern Railway. Yes, I know that. Well, now... In my work at the station, I've often seen consignments of gold on their way from London to the continent. And I remember that it wasn't a hundred pounds or even a thousand pounds, but more, much more. Enough money for a man or several men to retire on for life. Provided they don't spend the remainder of their lives in prison for attempted robbery. Ah, anyone clever enough to steal the gold should be clever enough to keep it. And how would they go about it? Well, I'm not that clever. If I was, I wouldn't have to come to you. But I'll tell you one thing. 
If anyone is to steal the gold, it must be done in such a way that the police can never find out exactly where it was taken. What do you mean, ma'am? Well, it travels from London to Paris, or wherever it's going, in sealed boxes, iron boxes. They're locked. Well, then we'd have to get the key to the boxes. Ah, not only that, but the key to the safe in which they keep the boxes. Yeah, but they must be kept in more than one safe. Yeah, it's a safe on the train, safe on the station, and one on the boat. And where do you think our best chance would be? On the train. It's a mad idea. I'll have no part of it. Still, it might be worth looking in. And look into it, he did. Agar went down to Folkestone for the day, found out that at least one of the keys must be kept there, for the station master at Folkestone had the responsibility for unlocking the safe on the train. He was a patient man, was Agar. Stayed at Folkestone for over a fortnight and managed to make friends with a number of people who worked for the railway. Mr. Agar, I've some news for you. You've got the key? No, but it's lost. Well, how does that help us? Well, they've ordered a new key for the bullion boxes. They're changing the locks and by next week they'll all be altered. And what about the new key? It'll be brought to our offices by the locksmith. And it's my job to turn it over to the station master. And he gives it to the bank? That's right, sir. How long will you have it? Oh, only a few hours. Less by right, sir. I daren't take any risk. Do you know a pub near the station? Well, there's the place where I have my lunch. It's called the Blue Ball. At what time of the day do you think the key will be brought to you? That I can't say. Probably the morning, sir. Sometime next week. All right, then. Each morning you'll find me in the Blue Ball. If the locksmith comes in, bring the key to me as quickly as possible. All right, sir, but I daren't take a risk. For four days, Agar waited in the bar of the Blue Ball. Then his patience was rewarded. Here it is, Mr. Agar. It's no good. Give it me. Shh, let it leave my hands. Give it me. All right, then. Take care. Is there somewhere I can wash my hands? Oh, yes, sir. Just across the back of the bar. Oh, thank you. Uh, come with me, Tester. <laughs> Agar had with him the necessary wax from which to take an impression. Within 20 minutes, the original key was back at the station, and Agar was busy making a duplicate. So far, he'd only had the key to the boxes. Before they could embark on the crime, they must also have the key to the safe. Back went Agar to Folkestone, this time determined to succeed. He masqueraded under the name of Mr. Archer. Pierce had been entrusted with 200 pounds in gold, which he was to have packed, insured, and sent by train to Mr. Archer at Folkestone Station. As Agar himself had reasoned... You see, Pierce, if it comes to Folkestone, it'll have to go into the bullion safe. To get it, somebody at Folkestone will have to unlock that safe. And I can see where they keep the key. Everything went according to plan. Agar returned to town a few weeks later, but he came back. That morning he was on hand at the harbour station when the boat train arrived. To use his own words as evidence of the trial, Agar waited amid the stir and confusion while passengers and luggage were being embarked on the boat. And then... I saw the station master leave the railway office. I tried the door. It was unlocked. I entered and went over to the cupboard and took out the key. I took an impression of the key I wanted and put it back in the cupboard. I went back onto the platform. The scene was set. Now came the question of trying it out. There were frequent consultations between the conspirators. How were the keys to be tested? Agar, who was little disposed to leave anything to chance, resolved on the expedient of himself accompanying Burgess to the van and trying them. This was a daring move, for the risk of discovery of a stranger being seen entering or leaving the guard's van must have been great. Yet it was done not once, but seven or eight times. The keys had to be altered again and again, ere they could be made to fit. Assistance was at last rewarded, and the safe was opened. There, man. It's open. We've done it. A lesser man might have been tempted to take what could be got with his confederates, to have made off with the loot and taken the chance of evading pursuit and capture. Not so Agar. He was playing for big stakes. And having got so far, he did not intend to risk the fortune that was in sight, nor do anything that might jeopardize his chances of what the modern crook calls a clean getaway. He closed and locked the safe. He could have afforded to wait. The next thing we must do is to guard against discovery. What are you playing? We must get some lead shot. We can get it near Waterloo. All this must be brought up to my house at Shepherd's Bush. 
We'll make it up into cloth packages. But how can we get it to the station? I don't like it. It sounds dangerous. Nonsense. It's more dangerous if we don't take these precautions. We'll put the packages of lead in leather courier boxes. They have to be specially made. We can't carry those to the station. Why not? They go inside traveling bags. We'll have to rehearse it over and over again. We can't be too careful. Almost nightly for a couple of weeks, Pierce and he left the former's house carrying carpet bags and with courier bags strapped to their persons under big cloaks. Pierce wore something of a melodramatic disguise, a black wig and whiskers. But, after all, there was some astuteness in disguising before the commission of a crime when it was less likely to be suspected than afterwards. If anyone should chance to notice him, the description would be misleading. And even if his disguise was penetrated, however suspicious it might seem, it was not illegal. After many fruitless journeys, the moment came. On May 15th, 1856, the two took a cab from a Camden Town public house to the appointed spot. I had word from the tester. When's it to be? Tonight. And it's £20,000, I believe. So come along, we'll get started. Chisels, wedges? Yes, all here. Right. What's in that bag? Seals, wax and tapers. Remember, the boxes must be done up so that nobody will know they've been tampered with. Now, up with the lead. There. Gold! Right. Take out just enough to fill this small bag. We'll get the rest out and then packed up in a few minutes. Scarcely had this part of the work been finished when the train drew up at Red Hill. Here it had been arranged that Tester should be in waiting. Swiftly and unobtrusively, Burgess passed the black bag to him. He was to carry it back to town while his confederates finished the job. Both Agar and Pierce remained in Burgess's van and went on to Dover which they reached at 11 at night. There, the two rogues alighted, and carrying their plunder, gave up their tickets, and went to an hotel near the station where they ordered supper, explaining that they'd driven in and were going to London by the 2 a.m. train. The rest you know. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Charge. 
you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Please be prompt with your questions or identifications. <laughs> when the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the bathroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. Hello. All right. Come on. All right, come on, move it along. <laughs> Keep it moving right up to the end of the stage. Now face front, hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. Number one, Bernard Egan, alias Bernard Bushman, assault. Five arrests, two convictions, armed robbery. Where do you live, Bernie? You got no special place, Sergeant. It's been kind of tough to live with friends. Why did you slug the man in that bar? Very uncouth language. You're a two-time loser, Bernie. This won't be easy on you. I should have controlled my disposition, I guess. The things that Muck said. You hit him with a bottle. It's empty. Number two, Rex Gay. Alias Gaylord Green. Alias Rex Anderson. Nine arrests, one conviction. Grand theft auto. Where do you live, Rex? 618 North Adams. You stole a car belonging to Mrs. R.H. Henderson. Well, I was walking by, and I seen this here car parked out in the street. It was way out. Anybody could have run into it. I just figured I'd do a good turn and park it right. You were trying to park it right three miles away from where Mrs. Henderson left. You know, that's a funny thing. I pulled out, getting ready to back it in right, see? Some low life sneaks in right behind me. Well, I cussed him out, sure, but I couldn't just sit there in the middle of the street, everybody blowing horns, quack, quack, quack. So I went looking for another space. Three miles away. Number three, David Hellman, alias Richard Hellman, alias Herman Richards. Sixteen arrests, two convictions. Armed robbery, larceny. Served 15 years in the state prison. Where do you live, David? Lately, the bar is, Sergeant. The mission. You're not working? <laughs> I'm on vacation. See any of the boys lately? Well, I've been going straight. You know that. You keep tabs on me. We've been watching you closer than you think. Number four, John Kaler. Alias Jack Johnson. How are you, Sergeant? You talk when I ask you. I beg your pardon, sir. Vagrancy. Four arrests, one conviction. Forgery. Now, where do you live, John? Oh, I just got out. Where do you live? Oh, I downed it. Just registered when the door flew open. Two of your finest gently lifted me by the back of my neck. Did a very sloppy job of risking my duffel bag. All me down here. Where were you registering, John? Eaton Hotel. Two bits a night. 334 West 89th Street. Any questions or identifications from the audience? None of these men. Oh, no. Any questions or identifications from the audience, please? Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. No identifications. Run on the next group. a whole bunch of them down looking at the mug files. I'm going to see Baylor. Want to come along? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. We haven't had a bank job like this in six years. How's the guard? Uh, still unconscious. Doesn't look like he'll make it. Hello, Chief. Hello, Ben. Matt. Hello, Chief. I just had the witnesses look at the lineup. Didn't spot anybody. We haven't had a bank hold up in five years. In six years. Well, here's how it stacks up, Chief. Five men went into the bank at 11 this morning. As near as the bank can tell, they got away with close to 100,000. They ran for the street, and this bank guard pulled a gun, exchanged shots with one of the hold-up men. Julio Bulati. Yeah, that's right. Bulati and the guard are both in pretty bad shape. Unconscious. Not likely to live. Sergeant Quine's over with Bulati in case he regains consciousness. The other four left Bulati on the sidewalk, piled into a green sedan. Witnesses say it was either a Chrysler or a Plummet. Couldn't get the license number covered with mud. Well, the witnesses have identified two of the hold-up men, Leon and Jack Holstetter. We'd like to have those boys. Well, they've never operated here, Chief. All we know about them is what you got from Denver. They've been under circulation for about seven months. 
Never pulled a job this big before, but that doesn't mean they couldn't. Originally from Oklahoma, a couple of brothers who started out bad. Both have done time. Skipped out on their parole a year ago. Well, this Bulani is a local boy. We know him. They probably landed here, cased the job, and then rounded up some local talent. Well, that's what we're hoping for. We've got Bulani, but he may die before he can tell us anything. The other three boys are local talent. Maybe we can trace that green sedan. If it wasn't stolen. Well, even if it was. It'd be easier rounding up some of our own local hoods than it would the house center, brothers. We've set up the usual roadblocks. Covered the airports, the bus stations, and trains. The witnesses in the bank got a good look at all five of the men? Well, they say so. They identify the house center, brothers. Let's hope they can tag the other two. Now, what about the sixth? Man driving the car. Nobody got a good look at him. Just our luck. He's probably the one who owns the car. Chief Bailey speaking. Yeah. Okay. You better get down to the hospital. That was Klein. Doctors say Bulati's regaining consciousness. Here comes Klein. Is he still conscious? Uh, no. Too late. Yeah. Didn't even get a statement. Just opened his eyes, took a look at me, and died. Want some coffee, man? Oh, yeah, please. Well, they didn't come up with one identification. I sent them home. Mm -hmm. Cream, sugar? Uh, no, no. Thanks. <sighs> Not one identification. No. They were a little vague. They all got a good look at the Holstetter brothers, but the others were off near the door or by the side of the room. Mm -hmm. They identified Bulali's picture, all right. They all got a good look at him while he was lying on the street. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping Bulati's death out of the papers. I want the Halstead of boys to think he can still talk. Yeah? We got the men you wanted down in the tank, Lieutenant. Okay. I'll uh, see him in the interrogation room. Stoolies? Yeah. We haven't been able to find out too much on Bulati. Thought maybe some of the stoolies might give us a lead. Sorry, you uh, won't be able to finish your coffee, man. Something comes out of this. I hope so. Hello, Lieutenant Cutty. Hello, Bert. Good afternoon, Sergeant Clebb. Hello. How are you? Is this about the bank robbery this morning? Uh-huh. I can't help you, Lieutenant. You know Julio Bulati? I heard of him. Don't know him. He was one of the men who stuck up the bank. Yeah, he got a hundred thousand in here. He sure had a lot of nerve pulling a job like that. What do you know about Bulati? I've heard of him. And what have you heard? Got a record. Just a hood, that's all I heard. Mm hmm You know any of his friends? No, Lieutenant. First National Bank they knocked over. Some nerve. How about the Holstetter brothers? What do you know about Leon and Jack Holstetter? Can't help you with this one, Sergeant. We've done you some favors, Bert. Oh, I appreciate the favors. I done you some, Lieutenant. You can't help us? No, Lieutenant, can't help you. I'd like to help you, but I uh, don't know nothing about the bank job. Or Bulati. No, Sergeant. Or the whole set of brothers? No, Lieutenant. You're sure, Bert? Oh, I'm sure. That's all, Bert. Thanks, Lieutenant. Yeah. Keep your nose clean. Yes, Sergeant. Good afternoon. Bye, Lieutenant. Yeah. Now bring in the next one. Uh, I hate working with those guys. Sometimes you got them. Cigarette? Oh, yeah. Here's Tony, Lieutenant. All right. Come on in, Tony. Hello, Lieutenant. Just sit down, Tony. Sure. Hello, Sergeant. We uh, want to ask you some questions, Tony. How about the bank job this morning, huh? Word gets around. Yeah, it sure does. I can't do you no good. Uh, did you know Julio Bulati, Tony? No, I uh, heard of him, no. Know any of his friends? No. How about Leon and Jack Holstead? Heard of them, too? Don't know. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, I think we only have one more. Amos here is the last one, Lieutenant. Well, okay. Come on in, Amos. Yeah, 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 Lieutenant. Have a chair, Amos. Hey, thanks. <clears throat> how, how you been, Sergeant? Uh, fine, fine. We want to ask you some questions. Sure. About the bank holdup this morning. I know. <sighs> they all do. You know Julio Bulati? No. I know a kid named Frank Merritt. Oh, you do, eh? Yeah. Good friend of Bulati's. <clears throat> Here he was with him all last night. How about this morning? Couldn't say, Lieutenant. I hear there's Frank Merritt is from Denver. <clears throat> all Stutter boys are from Denver, ain't they, Lieutenant? Yeah, that's right. Now, where can we find this Frank Merritt, Amos? I don't know, Lieutenant. Got a hunch he's making himself scarce. How long has this Frank Merritt been in town? About two weeks, I think. Drove in from Denver in a green Chrysler sedan. <laughs> I saw Chief Baylor. And? And nothing. I'm getting sick of this. We get a lead and we sit around for two days. Yeah, I'm getting sick of it, too. But we can't find merit. Or the Holstetter brothers. Or an identification on the other two hold-up men. Or the green sedan. Yeah. FBI's got every available man on it. We've got every precinct in the city working on it. Sooner or later, we're going to turn up with something. Yeah. Ulcers. Well, now, look, if we don't pick up one of the Halstetter boys, then we might find Merritt, and he'll lead us to the rest. If we don't find him, we may get a lead on that green sedan. There's so few green Chrysler sedans in this city. Maybe you have a better suggestion? No, but I have an alternate. Make some coffee. I'm sick of coffee, too. Well, then, you think of something. Hand me the coffee, John. Lieutenant Guthrie. This is quiet, Lieutenant. That bank guard just died. He never regained consciousness. Okay, come on in. Well, that's swell, Matt. Bank guard just died. No identification. Oh, where the devil are these guys, Matt? I always thought we had a pretty efficient force. They're keeping out of sight good. Yeah. Well, they haven't gotten through the roadblocks. I haven't left the city unless they have Houdini's ghost with them. We'll get them, Ben. Sure. They're somewhere in the city. We've got them trapped and we don't know it. And you know something? Neither do they. doing, man? You, uh, knocking off? Yeah. You? Uh-huh. Give you a lift? Oh, I'd love it. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lieutenant. Uh, good night, Bill. Oh. I'm a little tired. Yeah, me too. Want to stop and get some dinner? Oh, yeah, sure. Lieutenant! It's Quine. Wait a minute, Ben. Oh. Glad I caught you. Yeah, what's the matter? We well, think we've got the green Chrysler sedan spotted in a garage over on 3rd Avenue. Guy fitting Merritt's description brought it in yesterday morning for a paint job. What, uh, What were you saying about dinner, then? It's your listening post to the world. CBS new program, Hear It Now, featuring Edward R. Murrow, Friday evenings on most of these same stations. The top news of the preceding seven days, international, political, sports, entertainment, all the fields of interest are covered in this fascinating, noteworthy one-hour program. Oftentimes, you hear the actual voices of the people who've made the news on Hear It Now. 
Be listening every Friday for Hear It Now, your listening post to the world. That's right, Lieutenant. That's the fellow who brung in the car. That's it right over there, the black sedan. You painted it? Sure. That's what the fellow wanted. How'd I know you guys were looking for him? He just come in and wanted a fast paint job. How'd I know? I'm in business. Got to make a buck. It was green? Sure. He wanted to yell at first, but I told him that for a good job, might have to sandblast. Stuff bleeds through. He settled for black and a fast job. Green don't bleed through black. Yeah. When is he supposed to pick it up? Some butt time between 5.30 and 6. We close up at 6. Well, it's nearly 6 now. Yeah, maybe he spotted us coming in. We were pretty careful. I've done a good job, too. If you pick him up, who pays, huh? Coin. Let me get behind one of those cars. All right. Merritt's picking the car up. He's probably expected back with a gang. We can't give him the car and take a chance on losing him in traffic. Oh, how can we take the time to haul him down to headquarters and sweat him? His friends will wonder where he is. We can't take the time. Huh? Well, then what? Then we'll sweat him right here. Maybe we can drag it out of him in a hurry. Uh, you got an office? Sure, right back there. Okay. Uh, get behind one of the cars on that side, Matt. No shooting if you can help him. Right. Shooting? Uh, get out of that cap and overalls. Huh? Get out of them. Hurry up. Okay. See if I can take him alone. Don't come out unless I give you the word. Okay. Matt. Say, aren't those overalls a little snug? Now, look, I'll take him first to... Here he is. Hey, you! Yeah, we're just closing. I know it. I got a car here. Oh, okay. It's that black man right over there. You remember I brought... Now, you ain't the guy who was here yesterday. No, no, he's uh, back in the office. Oh, uh, well, look, I'm in a hurry. Say, uh, you must be Mr. Merrin. Yeah. Hey, how did you know? Keep your hands where they are, Merrin. Now, what is this? Police. Hey, now, wait a minute. Don't move. Put your hands behind your head. Hey, you're making a mistake. Where can we find the Holstetter boys? Who? Here, uh, here's his gun. All right, get him in the office. Move. No, no, look, wait a minute. I, I tell you, you're making a mistake. That bank guard died, Merrin. What bank guard? What are you talking about? Move. Okay, okay. But I don't know what you're talking about. You stay out of here, Quinn, in case somebody else shows. Garage man's hiding down in the grease pit. Help him close up. Yeah, sure. All right. Sit down, Merrick. Look, sit down. Why don't you guys listen to me? You got a permit to carry this gun? Permit? Uh, yeah. Where is it? I left it at home. In Denver? No, no, where I live. Where do you live? Look, you got no right to ask me. You were one of six men who stuck up the First National Bank three days ago. You're crazy. You and the Holstetter brothers. I didn't stick up no bank. I don't know nobody by that name. You know Giulio Bulotti? Bulotti? Giulio Bulotti. No. He knows you. He couldn't. Who? Well, why couldn't he? Because I ain't never met him. I don't know him. He swears he knows you. I can't help it. Maybe Maybe he does, but I don't know him. I never heard of him. He says that you were in on that holdup. He's a dirty liar. I tell you, I don't know him. He's in the hospital. We got a sworn statement. I don't know him. I don't know him. He didn't like being left behind. What are you talking about, left behind? After he got shot outside the bank, you left him lying there. I didn't leave him nowhere. How could he I? He named I all I six men in that holdup. Well, I wasn't one of them. I swear you got you the... You got you and the Holstetter brothers. I don't know any Holstetter brothers. That's your sedan out there, isn't it? Yeah, so what? This is a murder rap, Merritt. That bank guard died. Listen, you can't do this to You're me. Your my statement is enough to execute you. I don't know no Bialotti. What were you doing three days ago at 11 o'clock in the morning? Uh, three days ago. The 16th. At 11 o'clock in the morning. I don't know. I don't remember. How, how do you expect me to remember three days ago at 11? You better stop remembering, Merritt. Uh, I was having breakfast. Where? Well, I don't know this town very well. I don't remember. Some drugstore. Near where you live? Yeah. Where do you live? Roaming house on Baker Street. What's the address? 412 West. There's no drugstore around there, Merritt. Sure there is. One on the corner. That's the one you had breakfast in? No. You went to another one? Y- yeah. You walked? Well, no, I went to a drugstore further away. I don't remember which one. You drove? Yeah, yeah, I drove. In that car out there? Yeah. A dozen people identified that car as the one in front of the bank. Well, they're all nuts. They got the license number. They couldn't have. Because it was covered with mud? No, they just couldn't have. I wasn't near the bank. You know where the bank is? No. Then how do you know whether or not you were near it? You're a stranger in this town, aren't you? I told you, yeah. That car was identified as the holdup car. You're in trouble, Merritt. Why? I didn't do anything. Give me a lawyer. We've got sworn statements from a dozen witnesses and Bulotti. You won't stand a chance against the jury. I didn't pull no holdup. Sworn statements, Merritt. I don't believe it. How do you think we found you? Might not execute you for state's evidence. 
I don't know nothing about it. Okay. I'm satisfied just to get this one, Matt. Take him down and book him on armed robbery and first-degree murder. Oh, wait a minute. We'll get the whole set of brothers whether you help us or not. Yeah. Got a cigarette? Yeah. Where can we find the whole set of brothers? Will you go easy on me? No deals. I'll do what I can. You'll die if you don't help, Merritt. Okay. The Holstead of Brothers are down in a shack in the freight yards. Who were the two other men in on the holdup? I thought you said Bulati squealed on all of us. Well, I hope you won't hold this against us, Merritt. But Bulati's been dead for three days. <laughs> It's Chief Baylor, Ben. Yeah, as if we don't have enough trouble. Hi. Now, we got the yard surrounded, Chief. They're down in that shack. You seen them? No. Merritt says they're down there. Quine and Asher have Merritt in the car. How many of them? A whole bunch, according to Merritt. All Stutter brothers. A man named William White, Detroit record. A guy named Jake Harrison, also a Detroit boy. Merritt was supposed to pick him up in the car. You got lights? It's pretty dark. Yeah, four big ones. All right, now what's the deal? Well, I, I'd like to get him out of that shack if I can. Merritt was supposed to drive up on that ramp and honk twice. Now, we got the sedan here, so what's to stop one of us from driving it up on the ramp and honking twice, and when they get halfway to the car, throw the lights on and cover them? Okay. Okay. Klein? Yeah? Come here. You still want to take that car down on the ramp? Yeah, sure. Well, go ahead. When you get down there, honk twice. All right, Matt. Alert the men. Right. Quine will have to drive the sedan down to the Lincoln Street entrance to get out on the ramp. Take him about five minutes. I hope those guys in the shack are patient. I hope those guys are in the shack. There's Quine. You did that in a hurry. Give me that microphone. Here. Here they come. I count three. Where's the other one? It's about halfway, Ben. Let them get a little further away from the shank. Okay. Lights! They don't know which way to go. Stand where you are. You're surrounded. They're running. That's three, but where's the other one? Play those lights around the yard. Put one on the shack. There. There he goes. He climbed into that culvert. Hold your fire. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah. That's the river overflow. Yeah, careful, man. We'll be sitting ducks for it. I'm going in. I'm coming, too. Oh, come on. Stay out of the light. Keep against that wall. Okay, Ben, okay. Yeah. Come on. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, there he goes. Light up ahead at the end of the culvert. Yeah, there he is. He's hit, but he's still going. Watch yourself. There he is. Yeah. He's lying by the edge of the water. Yeah. Roll him over. He's dead. It's Leon Holstetter, all right? Yeah. <clears throat> What's the matter? Hmm? What'd you do to your knee? Oh, I skinned it. Well, you better put something on it when we get to the car. A thing like that can be dangerous.
the lineup, where before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? <laughs> you people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call up a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identification, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call it back. The Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Grubb, is written by Blake Edwards, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Robert Griffin, Raymond Burr, Earl Lee, High Everback, and Ed Begley. The Lineup is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs>